everyone, welcome back to another six hours in the H&R 24 hours of spa powered by Mulner Motorsport. We're here at the historic Spa Franco Champ. Half the race already done and dusted as we race through the night time. A cool night in Belgium. My name is Arjuna Kenki Party. I'm going to be joined for the next six hours by my race bot co-workers Lorenzo Bonder and Wei Han Chan. As always, we have TV cameras provided to us by Istvan Ballo and Track Cams 22. Additional car cameras provided to us by our very own Tyler Maxson. Live timing and scoring is available for this one. Racebot.tv slash endurance, but let's dive straight into the action then. Just under 12 hours to go. Halfway point has just been reached. And Lorenzo Bonder, three class affair for us here today. Three very interesting classes of battling. And so far, Field starting to get quite spread out, but I have a feeling that as the sun begins to rise, battle is going to start closing up, and the track, uh, the rather the action on track, going to start heating up. Absolutely, here Arjuna, because here's the thing. Unfortunately for the LMP2 class, everything kind of like dwindled down. We kind of had a battle between Phoenix and uh, also we have Progressive, and then Simsa, but Simsa got into an incident about five hours ago, roughly four or five hours ago. And then have to uh, relinquish that P1 to Phoenix Racing Esports screen. So now Phoenix with a quite of a lengthy lead, one lap ahead of three, uh, T3 Esports. But it's not everything is not decided in the in the GTE class. I think there, that's where more thing gets more interesting. HM Engineering has about 25 minutes, uh, 35 seconds of Bentley Gods, and that and that's where the battle is more heated because they've been trading places back and forth. Uh, during the pit cycles and the GT3, Chameleon Bomber is in a good spot right now. But again, there's still about four more hours into the night here at Spa Fong from Champ, so nothing is decided yet. Absolutely nothing decided yet, and it's been a fun and interesting one so far. A lot of incidents up and down that have separated out the field, but let's bring in to the race bot coming to us, Wei Han Chan and Wei Han. Spa Franco Champ, usually known for 24 hour races involving the GT3 class, but good to have a three class affair here. It means that traffic becomes that much more interesting as we see one of these LMP2 cars making their way through the GTE race leader. Seems like Wei Han is having some technical issues. We'll wait for him to jump back into the commentary booth. I'll pose this question to you then, Lorenzo, because like I say, GT3 at Spa, usually, sorry, 24 hour racing at Spa, usually a one class affair. It's good to have three classes here today. Yeah, it is really good, you know, because uh, normally uh, when we see these 24 hour Spa action, we basically see a, a single brand usually taking uh, the dominance over here on the trap, but now we're seeing uh, a kind of a multi-affair balance with the most of the cars being BMWs at force But that doesn't mean they are the uh, worst of the bunch. They are really really good cars But it is kind of mixed the way between the Z4s the AMG and also the Audis and they're quite very well balanced There's still no like stronger car uh, the uh, or what would say the OP cart here in the oh section. no but, uh, big drama oh, there HM Engineering off the road. What oh has happened God. there for the race leader, the number 159? Let's try and take a look at the race bot TV replay. But this is down at one of the bottom ends of the racetrack, coming up on the run up towards Blanchemont. This is coming out of Campus and Stavolo. So big, big drama for the GTE race leader. Race bot TV replay up on your screen right now. Yeah, we're gonna. I I just saw they actually touched the patch of grass right at the entry of uh, of the right hander just before the Cuff Pro Frere. I usually try to remember the names on Spa, but it's very unfortunate because that made the car spin the back wheel. You're gonna see the slight touch. The car just locked the brake, and the Ferrari on the outside had nothing to do with it, and just hits the right rear of the HM engineering car. I hope they did not have suspension damage, but th that wasn't a high speed crash, so there's less likely to be a suspension damage, but that will set them back about 20 seconds on Bentley Gods. And let's jump on board with that Ferrari, the 152 standards left. 
Leonard at the wheel down into this corner and Weihan just an unfortunate one third place on track getting caught up right behind your race leader and you know hopefully like uh, Lorenzo saying that 159 hasn't taken too much damage from that Almost certainly, and that's going to set him back uh, quite far behind, and he's going to have to regain all the lost pace uh, over the next few moments to come. And we're now riding on board one of the other guys. We're now back with uh, HM Engineering, uh, the, the HM Engineering guy. He's currently in the lead, the leader of the class, and we'll, we'll sit with him as he tries to catch the cars in front of him. Yeah, he's going to make his way back past some lapped cars that he'd already done the hard work on. There you can see the gap as well to the Ben Lee Gods. Now down to just 9 seconds. A big chunk of time being taken out there of the lead. There you can see 16 seconds. That is a big chunk of time lost for your race leader in class. And there you can see stint length for the 159. Currently sits at 26 laps. So diving down onto pit lane in just a matter of time. You take a look then at the 169. Also... Chevy Corvette C8R, they're just 20 laps into their stint. So a bit of fuel strategy being played here between the two teams. And one of these cars might have to ponder the prospect of a splash and dash come the morning hours. We'll see how that shakes out. They are, like we say, one lap ahead of third place, the 152 in class. So a lot of time still to go in this race. But right now, 159 and 169 are locked in a fierce battle. Take a look at a battle happening for the podium places in LMP2 because, well, just at the end of second stint of the broadcast, we saw Mike Aran get around the number eight car. Still 1.5 seconds in this one, Lorenzo. LMP2 is separated out quite a bit, and your race leader has a full lap on these drivers as well. But, but right now, Mike Aran trying to pull away, not able to get away from the number eight behind him, though. Yeah, and Mike is basically one of these uh, LMP drivers. We've seen him drive LMP one, if I recall correctly, on SCO and some other leagues, and even I think even Neo at one point. So he's highly competent on that car, and I've drove uh, roughly a few. I was going to say a few rounds, but a few weeks with him in ILMS, and he's a highly competent LM, LMS LMP two driver. So uh, it's going to be really interesting to see he try to break away. Maybe a different tire strategy here could be played out between. The, uh, the T3 and the Refizieth uh, Sim Racing LMP2 car. So even though you don't waste a lot of rubber here in Spa, it's not a, car, it's not a track that you're going to basically waste like 30% in just one stand. It's a track that if you don't mind, if you uh, go deeply into the braking zones, you kind of lock them up. It's going to be really complicated. And there are some braking zones here which can allow you to do that. But if you just take it carefully and uh, a handful, you handfully uh, handle your equipment properly, you're going to be in a good position. And I think that's what Mike usually does whenever he goes out into his tents. And Wei Han, I mean, we're racing in the middle of the night right now. 19 degrees is the track temperature. But you should also note that in the virtual Spa Franco Champs, where our competitors are making their way around the track right now, we're looking at a race set in the September month and at the end of September as well. So we're looking at a bit less daytime hours, more nighttime running. And when we're talking about tire strategy, I have to assume, especially in this LMP2 class, could potentially spread out your stints a little bit further then and maybe look even into triple and quad stinting your tires through the dead of night. Yeah, it just so happens that with uh, lower track temperatures on the on IA racing, it does afford your, your cars a little more grip, uh, or rather a little more tire longevity as you go through the different stints. And uh, that, that kind of allows you to stay out longer and, you know, in fact, be able to, to last longer on one set of tires. Of course, there, there is kind of like an optimal track temperature that, we've, that some of us have, have kind of found out on, on the track, which means that if the track is maybe a little colder than, let's say, 23, 22 Celsius, I think you might see, uh, you know, the grip levels, the longevity of the tires kind of plateau around there. So we're now on board with uh, Philip Bao as he makes his way through the traffic in the dead of night. You know, with, with without uh, the, the kind of floodlights that we might be used to seeing in some of the nighttime tracks, you know, it does get a little difficult to kind of find your way around, uh, especially when you're a faster class. Uh, trying to make it our way around the slower GT classes. And sometimes you can get just a bit discombobulated with all the lighting around you. Maybe lights flashing as uh, the faster class approaches behind you. The slower class is trying to pick out their braking zone. Maybe in the tricky camel straight braking zone down into the Econ chicane. But riding on board with the number 8 as he tries to close in the gap. But Orang slowly starts to pull away just a little bit. 
does appear to be a car stopped on track right now. That is the 137, and they are stopped, I do believe, in the bus stop chicane. What has happened to Austrian sim racers? Not diving down onto pit lane, so something seems to have happened, Lorenzo, but not exactly sure exactly what. Yeah, I'm trying to take a little bit of a look back here on the replay. Uh, all right, I, I just found the incident. He actually got touched by another car just as he enters the bus stop. Ooh, rough crash as he goes nose into the uh, wall barrier on the entry on the outside part of the uh, bus stop. And then uh, he comes back on track that will damage uh, the aerodynamics of that car a little bit. Might take a, a little bit of the top speed, I would say, five kilometers roughly. But uh, not looking good for the top five car in the class. Actually, fifth place in the GTE ca class currently. Yeah, and contact made with another Porsche 911. Not able to really pick out which car that is. Another issue, by the way, this time... Potentially for your race leader coming down onto the pit road. Let's see what's happening. And you see a puff of smoke and maybe just that. The number 66 getting it all wrong actually on the pit entry there. Not really how you want to approach that section there, Weihan. Because if you potentially there get that one wrong, you can get some damage to that car. Let's take another look on board from this camera angle. So this is him going quite fast down into the bus stop chicane and... Uh yeah, but I think it, it was a matter of, you know, not being able to eyeball the specific entry point well enough. So he gains some speed into the entry and, well, I, I think, uh, you, you know, other than uh, the, the offset in the, in the wrong entry into the pace, I think otherwise it was a fairly decent entry, not, not too bad. Of course, this is, you know, in fact, this is the endurance layout, meaning that you're using the full extent of both pits. So, you know, cars will spend a lot of time in there. And there was actually drama earlier on in this race as the number 66 six goes up on the jacks. Car ran out of fuel on pit lane and a pass was made for the overall race lead. That was Simsa Esports taking advantage of the opportunity as it unfolded in front of them. Would have probably got them a penalty in the real life if we're being totally honest. Yep. You can't really pass in the fast lane, Lorenzo. It, it, it's just one of those safety things that race control would have looked upon very, very poorly, I think. Yeah, race control would say uh, no. That is a no, no. You would have to give the position back as fast as possible. You know, there we kind of like, we kind of say that uh, everything goes in a racing uh, in a racing game. But uh, this this kind of maneuvers, especially in the pit lane, uh, we kind of say no. It's it's a no go because you're putting yourself at risk. You're putting other people at risk, especially in a convoluted area like it is in the pits. Especially Spa, where you have this basically one kilometer uh, run from the start all the way down to the finish. I'd say 1.2 roughly from the start to finish, all the all the run down from pit to pit, uh, pit entry to pit exit. So the number 66 also, is back out uh, on track. Sorry, quick, go, sorry, go ahead, Lorenzo. I was going to confirm uh, that that incident with the Austrians uh, Sim Racing's Rotkart was basically with the Prism Sim Racing Alpha. So P4 actually took them out in the GTE class uh, as he was just about trying to go for an overtake uh, that managed to make that Porsche of the uh, 137 uh, hit the barrier nose first uh, just as we saw a few minutes ago. Well we saw the race leader then down on pit lane just a few moments ago followed in now by second and third place on track the number 71 and the number 8 down to pit lane speed limit down on this downhill section of the pit lane as well heading into their pit boxes I'm gonna slot in on the right hand side prob probably go up on the jacks you see the number eight driving through t3 esports and mike Arang. but pit strategy here right now weihan it's i think interesting because we're still a long way to go from getting to the business end of the race as it were but we're seeing for the most part at least out front here in LMP2, all of the cars choosing that same strategy, and it doesn't appear as though any of them really trying anything different at this point. Yeah, well, I guess sometimes it's, it's worth uh, being a little bit more, um, I guess, conservative with their strategy. Sometimes more, more rubber is better than less rubber, in fact. And that was a pit maneuver, a pit overtake by Mike Girang, and he uh, goes to second. Of course, I think he, he did uh, go to his pit stall a split second, and so positions. Uh, this way were the same as when they had entered the pits. So this is Bao, he's in third and he's because he's got some GT traffic coming on behind him but they're, also, they're definitely not going to catch him. This is a top speed run down the Camel Street and then into the Lacombe chicane. 
So of course, this is where you know during during the during the, the more busy hours of the race, there'll be a lot of overtaking action here. But right now, you know, I think because this is a pit window, uh, many cars are kind of uh, more more sparsely spread out, so we we won't really see much overtaking taking place. Yeah, well, the gap actually between second and third place has ballooned up to now 4.2 seconds. The pit delta was about two and a half seconds, if I'm looking at that correctly, a bit shorter yep. time in the box for Mike Arang there, Lorenzo. And he's clearly then maybe not doing something different in the pit lane. I wonder if Arang, who spent a lot of that first uh, stint that we just saw before we jumped on the booth here, uh, spent it behind the number eight car. I wonder if he just had a little bit of fuel saving done didn't have to fill up as much and now trying to set sail and pull away from the number eight behind him. As now Lorenzo appears to be having some technical issues there. I've been there. talking over here with the mic muted. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. We're, we started early already uh, here, Arjuna. So, I was just going to say, I think what helped Arang here are two things. The, definitely fuel saving, that's number one. And number two is on this outlap, is also he got the traffic in better spots. So, when he got out of the pits, it was about two, maybe three seconds advantage from uh, Arang to Bauer. But at, uh, traffic alone just made him Bauer lose about two seconds easily. And now it is about two, 4.8 seconds, the difference between the number eight to the number 71 car. And number 71 going up through Radion right now. We must thank, by the way, H&R and Molna Motorsports for sponsoring this event and providing uninterrupted coverage in partnership with RaceBot TV. There is also prize money on offer in each of the classes. Drivers competing for 330 euros in prize money per class, and that means 150 euros to the winning team, 110 euros to P number two, and 70 euros to P number three. So leading the classes right now, Phoenix Racing Esport Green. We just saw them diving down onto pit road. HM Engineering have come down onto pit lane in the last few laps as well, and that's promoted the Bendley gods up into the race lead once again. In GT3, well, Familian Bomber have it pretty easy right now. They've got a two-lap buffer over the rest of the field, proving to be pretty simple for the 257, but a long way still to go. We shouldn't try and jinx anything up here in the commentary booth. The... Uh, Commentator's curse is a real thing, Weihan. Oh, it certainly was. You know, in fact, I, I was doing another race last night, and I, I think I, I cursed like seven or eight drivers. They just crashed like five seconds after I said something. <laughs> it was it was quite terrifying. Of course, uh, you, you know, I, I think the, the 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 style of racing right now is still relatively mellow. I guess um, this is a Bentley Gods. He is uh, leading the GTE field, and his gap ahead of the next fastest car in the GTE class, Jack Boyd, is well, he made it 45 seconds. Uh, could it be down to the fact that um, that, uh, that Bentley Goss has yet to uh, do their pit stop? Yes, yeah, so HM Engineering did come down the pit lane, that's what I was just mentioning. Jack G. Boyd has got behind the wheel of the 159, so taking over from his teammate who just made a mistake slightly earlier, and we just got onto the broadcast segment, in fact, so... One minute, three second total pit lane time. Sorry, pit uh, stop time for the number 159. We'll see if the 169 goes maybe slightly different on the strategy. Maybe comes uh, comes down, doesn't take tires. Maybe goes one extra stint on the tires. But uh, Lorenzo, you've noticed something. Jack uh, Jack Boy down in Australia racing with uh, one of the issues of online racing. Internet ping and, and unfortunately Australia yeah. is not necessarily known for its fantastic internet quality. Yeah, this is something that uh, it, it, the I, I like to call the the the, the marvelous perks of the uh, the wonderful sim racing world, uh, where you at one hour you're driving with with the driver with 33 ping in Anton Gulik, and then you go for a driver that has 366 ping from uh, from Jackpot. It, it's a similar thing when you saw J Josh Rogers just doing the Supercar Z series. He's driving from uh, Germany. And the majority of the servers are located in Australia for that uh, for that league alone. So it's one of those things that, that you you gonna have to mind your driving a bit more because the likelihood of net code, and we usually don't like to say that word, but it usually happens when you have this uh, ping difference. It, it's going to probably it's gonna happen eventually, and you have to be very careful where you're driving. It doesn't mean you have to drive slow, but it's just gonna have to drive more carefully than uh, than usual. 
Now, and I mean, uh, the connection between the European and Australian servers in particular, not known for being the most user-friendly, so we'll see how that goes for the Australian who's taken over the car. And a lot of pressure, I'm sure, weighing on his shoulders as he tries to reclaim the race lead. 1 minute 46 seconds is the gap, but Bentley God's on the 26th lap of their stint, so potentially coming down onto pit lane this time. Indeed, they are. Dahlstrom dives down onto the pit lane through that very tricky section. Down onto the pit lane speed limit as well. Down this very, very long pit lane as well. And and one of the things that I, I enjoy about this pit lane, Weihan, is that it mixes things up a little bit. When you use the shorter pit lane, sometimes means that the, the pitch strategy can be a little, more, little bit more uniform. But when the pit lane is so long here and you gain so much time by, by being able to do unique things and save some time on the lane, it just opens up a whole new world of strategy. Oh yeah, most certainly as as you know, as you can just see from from you know how how much time it takes uh, for 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 this exact car in fact uh, uh, to go down the, the down both pit lanes. So it does mean that you're you're spending a lot of time for uh, of your of that one lap in your pit lane, and that that kind of that kind of means that you know you you have to plan uh, your your pit entries more carefully in order to you know not make the wrong entry and potentially lose perhaps you know two minutes of your time as opposed to perhaps half a minute or just one minute on other tracks. So it does set you back if you don't if you do make a mistake in planning your pit strategies. But this is where it's going to be interesting. So this is Jack Boyd of HM Engineering, his second in class in the GTE class. Uh, and we'll see if he's able to in fact close up with um, the with uh, the first place GT car with Bentley Gods. So of course there's some time in between them. This is them closing it up, and as we have a look at the at the Bentley Gods in the pits right now, jacks are up, and that means that perhaps there's a tire change at this point. So this is going to be quite tight as they converge with each other. This is uh, Robin Sunquist. He's gone around the, the bus stop chicane, and it could be anyone's uh, race lead at this point in the GTE class. There's been an issue, by the way. Let's take a look at a race bot TV replay. Not sure exactly which team this is. It's for one of the GT3 entries. German Performance Sim Racing down in to the bus stop chicane. What's going to happen under braking for the 291? Is he going to lose the rear end on the entry? Indeed, he is. Going to park it up then on the middle of that corner, get out of the way, and fortunately, going to be all good. Let's jump back then to live pictures and see where that battle for the race leader cycled out because HM Engineering has just come out of uh, the. Eau Rouge and Radion Complex just as the Bentley Gods were coming out of pit lane. So they've managed to retake the race lead, but take a look at the graphic up on your screen, Lorenzo. Gap now down to 1.3 seconds, and as a result of making that mistake, the 159 car being put under some pressure now. Yeah, Robin Sundkiss over here just grabbing two seconds out of the uh, HM Engineering Corvette as they go down into... Brussels and they're setting up themselves for Jackie X corner, which is a very interesting thing. Lap timing kind of is the same, but in general, three seconds quicker. The the pit stop from the Bentley Gods uh, Corvette. It sounds like a little bit of Lamborghini. I was I was going to say pit stops just like they did in the uh, in the real life 24 version we just had like last week. Where uh, Lamborghini basically getting everybody by three or four seconds quicker per pit stop. So good job from the Bentley Gods team. Yeah, and the Bentley Gods have to get those tires up to temp and pressure as well. Interesting as well that the HM Engineering car is getting stuck behind some lap traffic right now. That gap coming down all the while. Now under one second, just six tenths is the gap. So they power up on the run towards Blanchemont. That's one of the Audi GT3 cars on the inside line. What's going to happen with the Bentley Gods? They're going to go around the outside here down into Blanchemont. I think that Audi helped them out, in fact. And the gap all the way down now to two tenths of a second. 159 and 169 prepared to do battle. But the 169 just going to tuck into line for now. As we head through the bus stop chicane, going to slot himself in. I wonder here, Weihan, if you're the Bentley Gods, you now have this big buffer in terms of the pit strategy. You're now six laps ahead of the 159. Maybe an opportunity to do a little bit of fuel saving here and just try and pull yourself along using the draft of the 159. Yeah, that's probably going to be what a Bentley Gods might be able to do as they come upon this straight section. It's going to be Eau Rouge and then the Camel Street route to them. But you, right, right now they've got... 
bit of thing that makes you know we've got a faster car coming up uh, against your rear. It does make that's kind of shake things up a little bit, and that has unfortunately extended the gap between a uh, Boyd and Sunfist by a second or so, and now they're one point two seconds apart. So a bit of work. Dallas Raceley, uh, by the way. Oh right, so a bit of work that they, they have to do to, to, to kind of close uh, that up. And yes, this is of course uh, your race leader, overall race leader, Kevin Volk in the Phoenix Racing Esports screen. So let's take a look then at this RaceBot TV replay down from turn number one, the run all the way from La Source up the hill for Eau Rouge and Radion. He's gonna get himself in between these two cars here. You see the lights flashing. And the 169 car, as we jump on the rear end, you can see just compromised on the entry there, Lorenzo. And I don't think he's too happy right now, as you now see as well. The number 66 car has to go all the way to the right-hand side of the track, uh, crossing over into the pit exit. And that's another dangerous move there for your race leader, who's already got a full lapse advantage. There's no need to take that kind of risk this stage of the race. Absolutely not. And uh, now the problem is... You nearly compromised Rob Sinkin's line, and uh, one, and I, th I would say even Sinkin's kind of, you know, oh, we got an incident at just at the exit of Kuf Pro Frere with the number eight car. So Rings Fizier nearly taking one of the Z fours uh, out of the you know, Kuf Pro Frere. Let's take a look then at another Racebot TV replay. So clearly something is starting to happen out on track, and more and more action taking place. We'll see what happens here so you said the number eight car right lorenzo yes yeah, so we're over here on the piff path they're just about to get into stavolo kid things got a little bit of hectic over here because we can see some because trying to go for a move they just do stavolo going to kuf pro frere and you can kind of see bauer just dixie uh, going for that inside line and touching the z4 on the way out yeah, that's, a, that's an aggressive passing opportunity there for the number eight. We'll try and take another look at that, maybe from an aerial view, to maybe get a better angle on that one as the number eight car tried to send it to the inside of that corner. Here you can see the Bentley Gods making their way through. Compromise pretty heavily there. They're now 2.5 seconds behind the 159 car, and you can see the number eight car all over the grass. That really was never on there. And Wei Han, uh, we're talking about risk here. That number eight car trying to hold on to the back of Mike Arang in front of him, now four seconds behind. I wonder if just uh, Philip Bauer thought that he was able to get the move done, but a little bit too optimistic there. And in the dead of night, we talk about attrition being a big factor. I think the number eight car needs a, a stern warning from his team manager. Yeah, also, Perhaps down to the fact that you know when, 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 especially from the point of view from the GT3 car, you know sometimes when you have a faster, much faster LMP2 car coming up against you, sometimes it's a bit difficult to see it coming. So you know, usually you you would traditionally expect one car to make its way past you, but right now you know the the, the second car just you know wasn't what uh, the GT3 car kind of expected. So you know certainly some action might have to be taken. But uh, Bauer still continues on, he's still, he's still in third in class and he's making his way past more lap traffic and he's doing so quite fine. And remember, there is life race control, so maybe race, uh, race Stewart's going to take a look at that one and just about to tick over the 30 minute portion of this third quarter of the race. Let's take a look then at your top eight in each of the classes and let's start with LMP2 and it is still the number 66 who crosses the start finish line once again, completes another lap moves himself on to lap 351 and he leads by a whole lap from the number 71 and t3 esports the number eight car trying to chase down the number 71 a good battle there for second and third but it is ws racing esports magenta two laps down the number 64 machine and we've got a whole host of cars three laps down angry bull racing mula motorsports sim racing pro simsa esports the number six car on a fight back after a number of incidents and then the Durenor Motorsports Club EV, the number 77, rounds out the top eight. Lorenzo, you want to take the GTE class? Of course I will. Let's go. So HM Engineering still has a lead with Bentley Goss now following it right about two seconds behind. We have Online Scene Racing.de in third, Prism Scene Racing Alpha in fourth. Austrian Scene Racers Rot is in fifth with the Race Union in sixth place. Seventh goes to Ring Fizier, the Scene Racing GTE. And then rounding out the top weight is the Mutina Motorsports Scene Racing Blue for your top eight in the GTE class, Arjuna. Wait, Han, why don't you take the GT3s? 
So long the GT3 chart side of affairs, it is. Family and Bomber in uh, leading the GT3 class and followed by Absolute Motorsport easily designed in second and that is in fact a three lap gap so i think the the familiar bubble guys are in quite safe position at this point in time ring fizz and sim racing gt3 pro in third in class and german performance sim racing in fourth following that we have in fifth repairings by art uh, art Hall motorsport sim racing elbrecht sim racing in sixth uh, muller motorsport sim racing black in seventh and team racejitter.de in eighth so these are these are uh, these cars are all uh, within a range of four to six laps behind uh, the GT3 class leader. So, of course, this is a uh, you know we've still got 12 hours of endurance racing to go. So, the drivers do have plenty of opportunity to close whatever gaps that they have. Absolutely, still a long, long way to go, and a lot of night hours still to run. Let's take a look then at some replays that happened while we were running you through the order. I think this is an issue between two LMP2 cars. Let's take a look then. The number 68 Phoenix Racing Esport Yellow. Sister car having a much better run at it, but down into the bus stop she came deep under braking as my oh word, what has happened there? Dirk Jansen right into the back of Stefan Rossman, who was running in sixth place in the number 21 Molna Motorsport Sim Racing Pro Car. Let's take a look at this replay on board with the 68 Lorenzo, but I think he just totally missed his braking spot there. Unfortunately, he's taken out the car in sixth place. Yeah, looking for the move on the inside. He thought he was actually going to be able to make that move in the first place. Just managed to outbreak himself now looking into the gyro cam over here. As we see Dirk Gunson go into the outside part of the lane. He looks at inside par. Just sees, no, no, it's not going to be enough. I'm going to touch the individual. Tries to get away with it. Just goes to the outside part of the lane. And unfortunately for him... There is one LMP2 car right ahead of him, does the touch, he goes into the wall, the, the Phoenix car, and there will be some damage on the front end, which, believe it or not, that front end of the LMP2 nowadays, if you even have a big crash, it is a sturdy front, but unfortunately, we're seeing that car now in the pits. And I wonder if, for Dirk Anson, just an issue trying to slow the car down, you saw him stuck in fifth gear when he struck the number 21 from behind and number 68 now down on pit lane let's take a look at the number 21 last time around 206 289 compromised a little bit by traffic and now the 23 car makes its way back unlaps himself that's prism sim racing beta the number 23 ninth place currently in three laps behind the number 21 car the 21 car still has a Nice healthy gap behind them there. You can see up on your screen. 30 seconds to Dorano Motorsports Club. And the number 77. Gap in GTE, by the way, has closed all the way up. Bentley Gods putting in a real shift here, Weihan. And, I mean, two battles between the Chevy Corvettes here. And usually in the iRacing service, uh, at least typically in other broadcasts that we have here on RaceBot TV and the iRacing Esports Network, the BMW has... M8 GTE has been one of the strongest cars that we've ever had, I think, in multi-class racing. But recently, lost about 9 horsepower. And it's good to see these Chevy Corvettes getting a little bit more popular here. They've become the class, uh, the, the car of choice in many races now. And Bentley Gods and HM Engineering about to do duel in two Chevy Corvette C8Rs. Most certainly. And I think something that many of us appreciate with these new C C8R GTE cars is that, you know, it being a, not, not just, so, you know, the fact that it's a mid-engine car, but also one that's been kind of balanced very finely, you know, it, it provides for, for really very much a balanced and you know, very safe driving experience for a lot of us. And, you know, I, I find that, you know, previously it was perhaps the BMW M8 that was relatively well balanced. Now it's probably more like the Corvette that is that's kind of hit a sweet spot and that could perhaps describe why it's uh, faced an increase in popularity and driver share you know over the start of this season and yes uh, very definitely uh, it is Jack Boyd and Robin Sunquist uh, still fighting it out up on the pointy end of the GTE field as they race uh, through the, uh, the uh, through uh, under the stars and in fact I think coming under a bit of pressure from uh, an LMP2 car behind them so you know, of course, at this point, you know, when you're fighting for the race lead within your class and you've got a faster class that's coming behind you, uh, the challenge is to understand how to manage that pressure from the overtaking car and not ruin your pace. I think that LMP2 car actually got a slowdown coming over the top of Radion as well. Had to slow up on the camel straight. Not often 
You see one of these Dallara LMP2 cars going slower than their GTE counterparts, but able to make his way through now. Gap back up to 1.7 seconds as a result of that traffic. Who's now going to have to wait behind the number 159, just in front of the 169. That lap car being quite nice, I would think, to your race leader coming out of Stavolo and uh, giving him plenty of space on the run up towards Blanchemont now. But let's take a look at another battle that's starting to develop, actually, in GT3. This is a car class where the race leader is several laps up on the rest of your field, but battle for the third and final podium position is well and truly on. Ring Fizitz, sim racing the number 288, Christopher Jansen having to fend from German Performance Sim Racing, and I think Lorenzo, if I'm remembering correctly, that's the car that we saw having an issue just a few moments ago, the 291. Yeah, I think that is the car we saw a little bit of an issue not long ago, and we're seeing that Audi now marking the BMW. He <laughs> actually puts a little bit of a pressure just before uh, Blanchimon, and uh, here he goes, Ven Bachtoviaka, as he looks for a move. His he dives down, kind of avoids the move, cancels the move in between the braking zone, just applies that pressure on the driver off Christopher Janssen, but a good battle over here for uh, for P3 in the GT3 category. And the 291 trying to take some alternate track limits. If you watch the real-life Spa 24, you might recognize the line the 291 oh. was trying to take there. All the way wide there, Lorenzo, but continue to watch this battle as it continues to progress up on our screen right now. And just also trying to think of... You know, this is an interesting one in many ways. I talked about we're used to seeing 24-hour racing at Spa being a, a single-class affair, but you know, you know Wei Han, if I'm going to ask you this, if you had to, as we actually see the 291 darting to the outside, he's going to use the draft from the LMP2 car in front. He's going to get in front as they head down into the braking zone of Le Comp, the 291, up into that third and final podium position. It's another LMP2 car comes along and helps him out just a little bit more. The gap now between those two cars out to about 1.6 seconds. But to get back to the question I want to ask you, Weihan, if you had to build a combo like this, where you had to take one type of race format and then you threw whatever cars you wanted to throw at, at it, you could pick any type of combination. Um, you know, personally, uh, I grew up in Singapore where you live now myself, uh, yourself rather. I personally think it would be very fun to have a multi-class race around the streets of Singapore. Uh, what other fantasy races could you have that would be a lot of fun? Well, um, you know, to, to, to be fair, you know, I think uh, racing around the streets of Singapore is probably the last thing in my mind. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think I would much prefer racing in like, like all of these classic race tracks. You know, it, it's just kind of uh, friendlier for racing, uh, especially for long hours, you know, as opposed to street circuits where you know, the walls are just beside you. And you know, perhaps after the two hour mark, you find the walls suddenly you know, drawing closer to you. Maybe the track becomes more narrow. Um, uh, it's just uh, you know, high probability of crashing. Um, of course, I, I think what would be really nice is you know the radicals in iRacing or the iRacing service, those are some excellent cars to drive. And uh, doing those cars along tracks like, you know, let's say for instance Spa here or, you know, maybe the North Shore, you know, those cars I think would provide for some interesting racing action if you were to, if you, you know, if you were to have, want, want to uh, have a, a style of racing event that's kind of eccentric yet fun. Well, the 291 dives down onto pit lane, going to give the position back to the number 288 and Christopher Jansen. I, I think Radicals at Norch Life away, huh? that's a little bit of a boring answer. You can do that on the iRacing service regularly if you compete in that Radicals championship. Lorenzo, I'll pose this question to you. You, you like to have some fun here on RaceBot TV in these uh, night hours. We've had some fun talking about, uh, you know, uh, Star Wars and, and, and fantasy racetracks like that. Yeah. What are you going to say here? All right, first and foremost, before I answer your question, let me ask you a question because now you, now you got me very <laughs> fuzzled <laughs> over here, Arjuna. You said multi-class at Singapore, which yes. is probably uh, you're looking towards death race in first place. So what kind of multi-class are you trying to elaborate in, in a track? That. So, okay, you obviously can't have your LMP1 cars because boosting around there is just going to be utterly ridiculous. So let's say, let's do um, LMP2 and GTE. We'll do it like um, like IMSA does when they visit the streets of Detroit and the Belle Isle circuit there. They, they drop one of the classes. Uh, of course, GTLM is often in Lamont anyway, which helps facilitate that. But 
You know, I think it would be a fun thing. I love watching multi-class racing in general, and, and when you go to the tight confines of a street circuit, or you think of Long Beach with IMSA as well, there's often some fantastic racing to be had. But I have to put a provision on this, Lorenzo and Weihan. You have to run this race with the old Singapore Sling chicane. Oh, no! Yes. No, 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 no. Yes, you must. You're a madman. You must. You're a madman. You're a madman. I am, but okay. He, I'm a madman. You have no regards for life. I'm a bad man. Do you have a bit more regard for human life? What are you going to say here? Oh my god. Okay. If you want me to have no regards for life, I'll give you hyper. All right. It's it will come soon. Give but give me hyper cars, LMP ones, and LMP twos at Anna Pergusa. Oh my word. Oh yes. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> If you got, if you really want to, if you really want me to have no regards for life, give me those three classes in a multi-class race at Ana Pergusa, and that's it. But if you want me to have like a dream one with, using iRacing stuff or real life stuff, you, I tell you I what, make one. it easier, Lorenzo. Pick anything. It doesn't have to be an iRacing. Pick anything. Anything. All right. So, uh, I would say G DTM. Or not DTM 2020 and Super GT. Um, at Portimo. Interesting. Not as interesting. It's a it's a car that fits the track. It's a track that we saw in F1. Please, F1, you're not listening. I know you're not, but bring Portimo back to 2021. It's a track that is made for these cars. I tell you what, we got a better please. we got a better plea here. I racing, if you're watching, please bring Portimo out to the i racing service. That too, <laughs> please, please. It's like it, it's so fantastic. It's like a combination of so many different tracks. You think of Zandvoort and the elevation changes there, but then you've got these off-camera corners and, and all sorts of things. It's such a fantastic track. It produced some great racing. And, you know, Weihan, I don't know if you watched that race, but the racing between Carlos Sainz and Kimi Raikkonen is some of the closest racing we've seen in F1 for a while. I, I mean, Portimao Gasly is a great and, track. Um, Gasly and Stroll, if I recall correctly. And that too, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I, I, I think I, I missed that round of, uh, <laughs> of the race. Unfortunately, they did, did not catch uh, those racing action. But... Look, uh, I, I'm just going to, you know, something just came up in my mind, and I'm just going to continue with the, the earlier question you had on, like, an imaginary, you know, uh, Go for kind it. of race. Um, radicals, same radicals, but on Macau Gear Street Circuit. Ooh. You know, you've never seen prototypes okay. there. You've seen Formula cars there. You've seen GT cars there. You've seen touring cars, even um, motorbikes racing on Macau Gear Circuit. But, you know, you don't really see prototypes there so you know i think if you if, if you do do it there it's going to be really interesting all right i have one over here from the irish esport network chat here on youtube so jacob uh, jacob 84 just said multi-race we can have first have a sprint race with the bmw m1 pro cars and after that the group c monsters i really want to know the track he's talking about but i put one over here because i did a combo of this on other sims bathurst Ooh, yes, and thank you for everyone who is talking to us in the iRacing Esports Network chat. We are watching. If you have more questions for us, do pop them over. Not much happening on track right now. The gap in GTE is starting to close in just a little bit. It had closed in, rather, I should say. Now back up to 2.5 seconds. Traffic rearing its head once again, but Bentley Gods will be reassured that the traffic giveth and the traffic taketh equally as they make their way around the... GT3 race leader. So the GT3 race leader basically out for a lovely Sunday afternoon drive at this point. Three laps to the good. Just got to hold on to that race lead as it were. But continue watching now. Let's ride on board with the 169 for a few laps here. But we're talking about fantasy cars. Um, fantasy tracks rather. We're talking about wanting to bring Portimao to the iRacing service. Lorenzo, you say DTM. I want to bring DTM to the iRacing service. And I know that DTM is changing. A lot of changes. Unfortunately, a lot of changes coming. Uh, you know, based on the GT3 spec, and we talk about the iRacing curse. I mean, what what better time to bring them into the service than right now? Yeah, it's you know this is a funny thing um, because we are getting the DTM of the future in in the feeder series of DTM. If you look there, the feeder series, 
you can kind of look into the DTM on 2021 because they're running cars that are kind of like built up in the DT, DTM GT3 fashion. They were going to run towards that category in 2021. But I really wanted to bring like, for example, give me the best sports car on earth, which is supercar in my opinion. Super, uh, super GT, uh, sorry, the Japanese Super GT. For me, that is the best, and I mean, by a long shot, racing series i you can see on youtube on tv or anything of the nature good tracks good cars they're fast to blitz they're even faster than the lmp2s so give me those cars and i'll be a happy man for the rest of my life yeah you, you know what i am honestly very very disappointed that i spent the majority of my childhood growing up in asia and i didn't watch a single super gt race and you know maybe the fact oh. that it wasn't on tv that much didn't help but you know such a shame way hand you know the gt500 cars they look like regular sports cars but then you see them take off and, and the way they corner it's just like a prototype and you know jensen button who made the the trip over to japan to race for a year won the super gt championship i think talked very highly of that series and you know lorenzo's talking highly of uh, the cars as well uh, that might be a fun one to have on the iRacing service yeah well uh, it's kind of like a uh, wolf in sheepskin you know you have a gt car but it's actually like a prototype but with a gt lid on, on the whole thing it's very nice uh, to see look um you know i i think uh, you know, many years ago, I think Super GT went to Malaysia. In fact, it went to Sepang for some time, but um, you yeah. know, I think uh, I, I've never got the opportunity to visit there. But you know, when, when it raced there, I think it was quite fabulous as well for the Southeast Asian crowd uh, to visit. But yeah, definitely, I think if, if it's on iRacing, I think a lot of us would really, really appreciate it. Yeah, so uh, so really quickly, uh, you said about Justin Button coming to the... Uh into the into the CPU GT, he drove the uh, Ray Brig um, NSX, and that was a really and that was a fun thing because the, the NSX, when he actually drove on that season, was the best car. The NSX struggled quite a lot during the season. You can see he won the race in the Okayama, then he kind of struggled, had a few good results because they have the ballast of uh, success, which kind of levels all the cars. Uh, in, in a sense, they give different weights to uh, depending how you're doing well in the, in the class specifically. But you could see the NSX couldn't drive anything. Like the tires were getting wasted rather quickly in comparison to the uh, GTR and the uh, Lexus RCF because it isn't the Toyota Supra that we have on 2020. We have an issue over here on the replay with the Ring Fizier uh, GT3M car just as he kind of misses out the bus stop managed to make himself back rather safely but the front end of that car is dented yeah look at that car they are 87 laps down from your race leader so what does that put them in class let me just try and do some quick math in my head or you know there we go makes it easier when i can just click a button 49 laps down from your race leader right now but my word, they're doing a fantastic job here to just continue pounding around the track. Continue, uh, true endurance racing spirit. Yeah. Never give up, but despite, the, despite that fact, they're proving to be uh, a bit of a roadblock on the track, if you will forgive me saying that. The lap time really not there for that car, given all of that damage. You see the lap time there, in fact. Not even a valid lap time the last time around, and they're a few seconds off the pace as things stand. But Lorenzo... Finish your train of thought. We were seeing an issue there for this 289 car, but you were talking about Jensen Button and his trip to Super GT. Yeah, and he said the car was very complicated to drive. You know, it is very different from what actually drove the F1. And I kind of asked Jan Modernboro uh, about this because Jan is a very avid driver on iRacing. You, you're probably going to catch him in the in the in these hours nowadays in in this night time for the u.s time zones and japanese time zones where it's actually early in there asian or oceanic whatever you prefer so i asked him about this you know how the car uh, how does it feel about the driving the gtr how is it a hard handling car how much power is it? how much work goes into the car he says it's quite of a big work you know it's a fun car to drive but it, it demands a whole lot of work it's a different piece from uh, him driving the GT3 car. Usually drives around uh, Mount Panorama in the 12 hours of Bathurst. So it's a really good uh, approach from these drivers to talk good about these cars. Unfortunately, they're going to be like 
soon to be stink cars because it will be the only series who will run these uh, highly costly cars but unfortunately uh, you know I'd love to see them but it's soon to be extinct and uh, and that's the way of racing you know it's constantly evolving the GT3s are constantly evolving they're they're going to be more cost effective in the future they've been looking towards this as well so it's, it's some of these aspects of racing we like to see, but at the same time, we don't like to see that as well. Well, Super GT and, um, well, the Class 1 regulations in general would be an interesting addition to the iRacing service. Pit stop for the overall race leader, Phoenix Racing Esport Green. Kevin Volk down on the pit lane now and 22 seconds stationary in the box. You see car slightly further behind him going to make his way out of pit lane that is the number 64 ws racing esports magenta fifth place on track but for kevin volk 29 seconds stationary no tires there way hand so clearly going for the double stop here and as he makes his way back up into racing speed he's gonna have to be careful to rejoin safely no worries there uh there's an interesting crash once, uh, I forget which year in the spa 24 hour race uh, but way hand that that pit lane merge between that uh, you know, cars charging up the hill through Eau Rouge and Radion versus cars trying to get up to racing speed can sometimes be a little bit tricky. Well, I think that's the reason why, you know, white line is painted through the middle of the pit exit there. Uh, so that the cars oncoming should supposedly be able to see the you know, cars exiting the pits. And you know, given that it's, it's a long stretch after so I, I don't think, you know, it's that difficult to avoid cars that kind of come out of the pits. No, just, uh, it, I think it helps to be a little bit more mindful. But, of course, uh, Kevin Volk made a very good exit there. He got the right spot out and he found himself uh, just, you know, uh, coming out very safely. So, he is, in fact, the, the drivers of uh, second and third place in the LMP2 class. They are now in the pits. And, oh, what's this? This is a replay of uh, Dirk Jansen. He's gone around on the exit of that corner and you know, that's kind of unfortunate for him. Yeah, I noticed that as we were watching the race leader go through that corner, that one, there was a slow car through that corner. This is coming through Bruce Sells down into the no-name corner, and fortunately for the number 68, not getting in the way of his teammate. Number 66 going to continue without any, any too many issues there, but uh, that's just a clumsy one, if anything, for Dirk Jansen behind the wheel currently. Yeah. It is the middle of the night, maybe some mental fatigue getting to him, and we've had some people in our YouTube chat talking about being done with their stint for now, taking a little bit of a breather and jumping back in the car for the last stint of the race. That will give them a nice little rest opportunity to go have a few hours of sleep. It is heading into the nighttime in Europe, so a lot of these drivers who are registered for this one will be wanting to use that opportunity to get some rest. But down onto pit lane for some other cars, you can see there Ring Physic, Sim Racing and T3 Esports both down onto the lane once again. This time around though, T3 Esports with the driver change and Marcus Brioch going to get behind the wheel, Lorenzo. But the gap between these two cars had pulled up to about uh, eight seconds or so, I think it was. But once the number eight gets down on off the jacks, there they go. Brioche is going to have to stay in pit lane for a few seconds longer. The number eight car is going to try and build up a little bit of an advantage now as they try to work on those older tires. Yeah, here they go. It's kind of a long pit stop. 52, 53 seconds. You don't usually take that uh, overly long is about 40 54 55 seconds a normal pit stop so maybe a uh, broich actually putting in a little bit more fuel than usual because the ring was actually giving head to to philip bauer in the previous thing so basically wasting all that fuel so maybe the refueling getting a little bit longer than usual for the p207 217 car the number 71 so it's going to be interesting because the gap right now is 18, 19 seconds between uh, Broich and uh, Bauer. So it all comes down to how Broich actually is going to take care of that car and how fast he's going to go. Absolutely. Meanwhile, while we've been focusing on some other battles over the last few minutes or so, let's take a look back then at the gap between your... First two drivers in the GTE class, HM Engineering, have managed to pull up the gap just a little bit. Almost five seconds as things stand. Robin Sunkist, you can see there the delta as he starts to fall off just a little bit. I wonder if this is just a little bit of mental fatigue. Sunkist is now on another stint, whereas we saw uh, Boyd get into the car that last time around. Boyd is going to be down on pit lane in about six laps time or so. Number 169 expected in about 12 laps or so, I would just have to assume. Reminder, live timing and scoring is available 
racebot.tv forward slash endurance. Head over there to follow your oh, favorite Spin. drivers. As Broy. Really fun. Yeah, I'm sorry, Arjuna, but he just managed to spin out of the car uh, just before uh, Kuf Pro Fair, in between Stavala and Kuf Pro Fair. He had just gotten into the into the car, and unfortunately, Marcus has managed to lose it on the outlap. Cold tires may be playing a factor there. There's been another issue as well for Sven Hartmann coming down onto pit lane. Let's take one more look at this replay, though, for Marcus Brioche, and just loses the rear end of the car. Not even on the gravel there, Weihan. Just a clumsy mistake, and tires not up to temperature and pressure, and it's on the driver to be especially careful on the outlap. Yeah, I'm also given given the fact that you know this this LMP2 car is relatively light, it is very easy to get that rear end of yours out spinning. And you know, that was pretty much a matter of along, going along the exit. This car, you know, the rear end is quite happy. So, you know, I, I think it was just a matter of him not, not being on top of the car at that very point. Of course he's He's gone on a recovery drive and he's uh, currently set in third and he's making his way up uh, Il Rouge and Radio. Indeed, up the hill he goes. Let's take a look at that second replay then for Sven Hartman. Here it comes, Racebot TV replay. This is coming down in through the bus stop for the Ferrari, the 219 on the inside of the corner and just goes a little bit deep in. Once again, getting the pit entry maybe a little bit wrong. Not exactly sure if that's what he intended there, Lorenzo, but uh, you lose a little bit of time taking that way, but fortunately, you don't get any damage, and that's always the most important thing when you're diving down onto pit lane. Yeah, and we've seen this also in the real life 24. You know, you kind of miss out of one part of the turn, and you come into a funny way into the pit lane. As long as you come out safely, and you get in, say, come out safely after your mistake and go into safely in the pit lane. That's all that matters. While trundling down at the pedestrian 70 kilometer an hour pit limit, the 219 on the button. Back up to racing speed up the hill. You're going to merge in with some traffic there. You'll see the headlights as they come up the hill. The LMP2 car getting very wide and he's going to have to swerve back Whoa. to the inside of the track. That's the danger that I was talking about. It is real, and it happens. Even top-level GT drivers have had issues there. I think it was Kevin Estra who got involved in that big crash that I'm trying to think of at the Spa race. I think it was in 2015, and I think that's Phoenix Racing Esport diving down the inside as well, getting very aggressive with the car that's just come out of pit lane. But sometimes, as we then take a look on board with Kevin Volk, who it was indeed the race leader, uh, I don't really understand this. We've seen on a number of occasions the number 66 taking a lot of risk in traffic, and... Again, 11 hours to go. We're about to take over one more hour. They have a one-lap lead, but the way they're driving, you'd think they just have a two-second lead over the car behind. Yeah, I would think so. Um, of course, so Kevin Volk is in quite a, a reasonably comfortable position at this time. So, you know, I, I think you know, he, he can't afford to take things a little easier. Uh, over the next few moments, if uh, you know, if if it's not if there's no imminent threat of a car that's gonna overtake you, but yeah, I, I think along that pit exit, also given that uh, this spa circuit is not exactly the widest of places, it's quite narrow. You know, you kind of feel it when you're in the car. You you can't really tell you know, when when you're on TV cameras, but in the car itself, you can feel just how narrow this place is. And sometimes it's not so easy to to imagine how you're able to kind of squeeze through uh, three cars. Um, at various points so now he's going to come upon some more lap traffic and you know I'm just kind of uh, taking in all, all these uh, you know the sights of all these lights on the cars in, 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 in the night you know I think it's really nice especially with those LEDs on, on, on the GT cars and on the roof of uh, that LMP2 it is nice when you have these little details that the iRacing service has modeled the one thing that I do love that they've added recently is the ambient trackside noises. When you when you don't have the car noises, you just hear the the crowd rumble as a, as a pass happens or a crash happens indeed as well. It's just a nice little touch that gets added to the sim. And Lorenzo, you've gone and done some digging. I'm right. That that big 24 hour of Spa crash coming out of pit exit, Kevin Estra and the year 2015, both of them I was right on, but the more interesting thing is, as I'm sure you've gone and taken a look at the replay there, can you imagine that Estre got the penalty there? The car coming out of pit lane, you can do nothing except stick, you know, to the right-hand side of that white line, got a penalty for leaving the pit lane. 
it's if that was on my racing you know you, you can get that believe it or not if you actually went a little bit more outside the lane if you put two wheels outside the uh, the white walls uh, the white lines out of the pit lane you can actually get a a living out of the panel uh, living out of the pits and safely uh, you can get that penalty but on the on the Astro crash uh, with the Ferrari I think that was from AF Corsa no blame whatsoever the problem is it is a blind left hander so as soon as you go into all rouge basically on the left hand side you have i would say roughly a second or a second and a half to make decision if you leave space whoever is getting out of the pits or not and unfortunately that's what happened for estra and whoever was in the ferrari and the crash happened and I was gonna, and I really want to bring out something uh, about the spot 24, but I'll leave that for later in the race because we might have something brewing between Bentley guys and HM Engineering right here. I'm not sure exactly what's brewing because if anything, right now the Bentley guys are on a little bit of a simmer. You see the Delta there. The last oh. few laps they've been losing a lot of time, hand over fist indeed, and we're just about to take our first race spot fan immersion of this third quarter of the 24-hour race. Uninterrupted coverage is brought to you by RaceBot TV in conjunction with the series organizers. But there you can see, Wei Han, that gap at one point when we saw uh, Sunkis come out of the pit lane was just uh, just under half a second at times. And you see there, now up to seven seconds. I wonder if that 169 just maybe losing a little bit more performance throughout the course of the stint on their tires, maybe just wearing them that little bit more. Boyd is able to get some very consistent runs even through traffic right now. Yeah, I know. You, you know, with, with this track, the tire burn is real, um, and I, th I think that that could have been affected. You know, wearing down these Michelin tires that these GT cars use. Um, yeah, I, I think it's probably down to the end. You know, as we observe the trend, so it's just progressively increasing this gap. But of course, you know, the the Bentley God guys still have uh, you know twelve more hours, eleven more hours to. to to in fact make whatever gains they can so you know it is they've still got plenty of opportunities to do what they have to do plenty of time indeed so we've just ticked over another hour then 10 hours 56 minutes still to go the h and 24 hour race powered by molna motorsports it's time for race bot fan immersion then and lorenzo i'm gonna let you pick which car we want to go on board with here do you want to do some lmp2 action uh, whiz through some traffic do you want to stick on this GTE battle for the race lead? I'm going to actually go a little bit more um, bold over here because we might have a battle for uh, the top five in the GTE category, though, because we're seeing Austrian uh, sim racing's Roth from Norbert Windholz. Just getting out of, he just got out of the pit. That's his outlap. And uh, Fonia Bodan, just right ahead of him, is also on the outlap. And uh, they're not far behind, two seconds from one another. Gap pretty close then between 5th and 6th place on track. Let's take a race bot TV fan immersion. We'll be right back. But for now, enjoy the onboard sounds of the Porsche 911 RSR in a few laps around the Spa Francochamps circuit.
So a few laps on board then with the Porsche 911 RSR of Austrian Sim Racers and the 137 as they try to reel in Race Union 187 out in front. But lost a little bit of time there. They had some issues with traffic going three wide at times. Not what you want to see as you try and chase down cars in front of you. But let's jump then to some battles. They're happening out on track. It does appear as though there was a battle just for a moment. Not sure if that's a battle actually, Lorenzo. If this is just a battle of the lapped cars in many ways. The one we're seeing right now, I think it is, and as we're seeing uh, Muna, the Motorsports and Racing Pro, I just looked at them really quickly coming out as they're coming out of the Piff Path heading into Stavolo. Apparently, something happened with the uh, intervals between Angry Bull and now Muna, but right now it is fixed at nearly two minutes, the fifth place and the sixth place, the LMPs. So sixth place in LMP actually uh, about two minutes behind the car in front. That's what's popping up on my timing screen and just flashing every once in a while trying to get my attention there from all the motorsports. But let's run down then once again the top eight in each class and let's flip things around here. And Weihan, why don't you take the LMP2 class? Most certainly. So your overall race leader at this very point is Phoenix Racing Esport Green. And uh, we've got a uh, Ring Freeze yes, Sim Racing LMP to one lap behind. He's in second place. That is currently driven by Philip Bauer. T3 Esports driven by Marcus Brioch in third. And we've got a uh, WS Racing Esports Magenta in fourth. And he is uh, three laps behind. We've also got uh, Angry Bull Racing in fifth. Uh, Milner Motorsports Sim Racing Pro in sixth. Simsa Esports LMP2 in seventh. And uh, Durana Motorsport Club EV in eighth. So that's LMP2. Lorenzo, you got GTE again. So here he goes. The Bentley Gods is still in the lead with more than a minute behind ahead of the HM Engineering. Online Sim Racing Daddy is still retaining third. Prism Sim Racing Alpha is in fourth. Race Union now taking the top five uh, spot in the P5. P6 goes to Austrian Sim Racing Zorot. And then P7 goes to Ring Fizier Sim Racing GTE. And rounding out the top eight is the Muna Motorsport Sim Racing Blue here, Arjuna. Now we must point out HM Engineering have just come down the pit lane a few laps ago. So we wait to see the number 169 down onto the lane as well. But third and final class, last but not least, it is the GT3 class and it's Familian Bomber currently leading in their BMW Z4. They've got a three lap advantage over second and third. So right now the 257, like we say, on a Sunday drive, just trying to hold on to the three laps they have on the rest of your field. The number 299 Absolute Motorsports car in a fight with Ring Fizet Sim Racing GT3 Pro. They are on the same lap, but they're separated by about 30 seconds. Uh, sorry, about 60 seconds. So a bit of a, a, a hurdle for the 288 and Christopher Janssen to overcome. Then you've got fourth place, German Performance Sim Racing, the 291 car. They're four laps down, along with Reparix by Artel Motorsports Sim Racing, the 200. Team Racegitter.de, the 235. They're the only car five laps down. And Albrecht Motorsport, the 247. And Molna Motorsports Sim Racing Black, six laps down and separated by about 80 seconds on track. So not much battling happening then in any of the classes as it were. 10 hours, 43 minutes to go. We're about to tick over to 10 hours, 42 minutes. As we're taking a look then at the GT3 race leader as they make their way through the infield here at the Spa-Francorchamps circuit. Heading down now through into Campus Corner on the run towards Stavolo and Blanchemont now. And the BMW Z4 here, Lorenzo, it's an interesting choice. You've got the Audi R8 LMS, the BMW Z4. The Z4 has not always been a, uh, a strong car on the iRacing service, but recently, especially in a straight line, it's been a rocket ship. And the Audi R8, which has often been at the forefront of iRacing competition at the top level, is, is struggling a little bit more. And there is an Audi in second place now, but a, a field that's more skewed towards the BMW than the Audi. Yeah, and it's one of those interesting things. If I recall correctly, lastly, when we broadcasted the Spa 24, the strongest car was the Audi, and then followed by a little bit of a margin of... I'm not saying Mercedes, but if I recall correctly, it was either McLarens or BMWs. And then we had a Mercedes here and there in the field. 
But the, I think the latest BOP kind of brought the ZM4 back into the fold for some of the tracks, especially these high speed ones, because it counts with the good acceleration ratio. And then the top speed, that's why it kind of skyrockets himself in comparison to the Audi and maybe the Mercedes itself, because they're more power cars. And they would, people would say they're more into the long run than the short run, as the BMW would kind of go as the favorite. But it's good to see this variety of cars in the BMW uh, Z4 being the strongest car of the bunch here in this race. And while new cars seem to be getting added to the GTE class, the GT3 class has been lacking a little bit in recent editions, and indeed most of the cars starting to show a little bit of age, as many of them have now had Evo counterparts released in the real world, a, a bit more aggressive in terms of the look and feel, I think, overall of the cars. You think of the likes of the Mercedes with that new aggressive front grille and, and all the, the new aerodynamic designs that are being pushed. We've got some interesting new additions to the class as well, brand new models. The likes of the Bentley Continental GT3. You've got the Acura NSX GT3 car as well. Uh, there's a lot of new fun ones. The the brand new did Aston. really well in the Spa 24, by the way. Did very well in the Spa 24. The Aston Martin GT3 car, which is quickly becoming one of my favorite looking GT3 cars. Weihan, I, I mean, we don't have a shortage of GT3 cars in the iRacing service, but as we start looking towards potentially getting some new additions in, I mean... There's so many. This is a class that is, you know, worldwide being growing at such an exponential rate, I feel like. Uh, just pick one. And, and that's going to be the hard thing, I think. Picking one of the numerous GT3 cars that we don't have in the iRacing service. Porsche 911 GT3 R. That was easy. <laughs> yeah, that's the one car that I kind of had my eyes on for, for some time. Because I think given that iRacing does have a quite quite a number of uh, Porsche cars, I think that's you know it, it feels like a missing piece to a puzzle of uh, the, the Porsche scheme of things on, on iRacing. So you know that, that just kind of came to mind. <laughs> it feels like forever ago that they released that initial announcement for the partnership between iRacing and Porsche, and there was a, uh, a GT3 car featured in that video. And uh, ever since then, people oh. have been speculating as to when the yeah. eventual release date of that car is going to be. By the way. Third place in the GT3 class down on pit lane. Ring for Zit, Sim Racing, the 288. Christopher Janssen has just stopped in his box. Doesn't appear to be having a driver change right now. So Janssen going to stay in the car as we continue watching the leader in that class. Lorenzo, I'm going to ask you this one. And, and take your time here because Weihan really, really was quick with that one. And, and, and I know the Porsche is an obvious choice. But I mean, there's so many. I just thought about the, the Nissan GTR as well, which I know is a, a personal favorite of the one and only Jimmy Broadbent. All right. Uh, you you want to ask me which car should come? I'll give you a, a quick answer. Honda NSX GT3 Evo. Ooh, I like the sound of that. Uh, just because I love that V six it's not a it's a v8 v6 sound that has in that car the car is very nimble it did so well in the spot 24 it just got like up and up and up and up i'll be very honest i stopped watching the spot 24 when dennis lynn crashed because i was shooting for dennis lynn basically the entire race i know dennis lynn i raced with him often and i know his personality and his same racing team that he races all races for and he's a very fast sim racer, don't get me wrong, he's a very fast sim racer. One of the fastest uh, guys I probably know in terms of being real racer. Um, but for me, Honda NSX, Bentley Continental, and then last but not least, give me the Lexus. I only asked for one, but I'll take all three. That sounds pretty good to me indeed. We're watching now the 113 Prism Sim Racing Alpha. Something happened. To Danilo Hopfen. Let's take a look at a RaceBot TV replay then. And this is down at the end of the Camel Straight, in through the Lacombe Chicane, and through the right, through the left, setting up for Malmedy. Loses the rear end of the car, and lucky not to get collected from behind there. Let's take another look at this replay then on board with the 113. You see that blue light, which helps with night visibility, one of those innovations in endurance racing. But the headlights from behind as well, helping illuminate the way. Gets on the curb on the left and... Oh, it's just on that transition as the car's weight shifts over. It maybe even touches the curb a little bit there for the 113. 
Uh, I'll have way uh, go deeply into this, but that's what we call the famous Mount Midi curse. Because every car, there, there will be at least one car in every spa race that will catch that curb on Mount Midi and spin out. There is always one. There is always one. Well, it kind of looked like a tank slapper to me, you know, of course, like with that contact with that curb a little bit, it kind of did set the car off uh, with the weight shifting the other direction. But, you know, I think when you're changing direction from left to right, there is an element of destabilization. And sometimes if it, if it goes over, that, that does kind of make your car go wrong. But you know, he's on a recovery drive now and he's uh, driving quite well in fourth at this point. And he is on his way, uh, rather. Let's have a look at how far behind he is from Oh no, my life timing is crashing, uh, but he is quite a fair fair gap behind the third place GT3 car. Of course, he, th th there are some LMP2 cars uh, right between the fourth and third place GT3 cars. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's up to him to kind of close that gap at this point. Gap is uh, 26 seconds to the 152 online simracing.de Ferrari 488. It's a lot of work to do then for Danilo Hopman. Um, I see a question in our YouTube chat, by the way, asking about the prize pool. And yes, thanks to our wonderful partners, H&R and Mulder Motorsport, who are putting on this 24-hour race, uninterrupted coverage brought to you in partnership with RaceBot TV. There is a prize pool in each of the classes, and that is 330 euros in each class. So a total then of just under 1,000 euros. The winning team in each class is going to receive 150 euros to be distributed amongst their drivers. Second place... 110 euros third place 70 euros so there is cash prizes on offer here as well as this broadcast i think a lot of the teams have been enjoying we love having the interaction in our youtube chat as well so come and say hi to us ask us a question we've still got about uh, four hours and 30 minutes left in this section of the broadcast so myself our junior kanki party joined by lorenzo bonder and uh weihan chan out of pit lane by the way Number 169, who has just come down pit lane. You see the gap between those two leaders in the GTE class showing as 2.3 seconds. And despite the fact that Sunkiss had lost quite a lot of time towards the middle portion of that uh, first stint that we had just seen here in this third portion of the broadcast, that gap to HM Engineering is really holding fairly steady now. Lorenzo, not exactly sure what's happening out. Yeah, I'm just going to take a quick look over here on the gap advantage, on the lap advantage, or the lap relative between Robert Sundquist and Jack Boyd. With Jack doing four, two fourteens, two thirteens uh, in average per lap. And uh, Robin Sundquist actually kind of turned up the heat in the last two laps, basically lapping uh, nearly a full second quicker on lap 351 in comparison to Jack Boyd. Actually, not a, not a second, two seconds faster than Jack Boyd on the previous lap, and that's why they brought the gap down to 2.1 seconds. But I think that's going to increase with that Audi just right ahead of Sunquist. I wonder if uh, Sunquist just putting in some hot laps on low fuel, whereas Boyd had just... He's already done seven laps since he came down pit lane, so full tank of fuel, double stinting the tires, maybe some slightly uh, less flashy pace from the Australian, if you will, not trying to push the limits of the grip as much, the 169. Now 2.7 seconds back from the race leader in class. There was another issue, by the way, that I'm seeing on my timing screen, as we see Sunquist sending it down the inside of one of the BMWs in that GT3 class. That's the fifth place running car, the Repairx by Auto Motorsports 200. There was an issue for Valkyrie E-Racing Green, the 142. Let's take a look at a RaceBot TV replay. And this is coming down in through Bruxelles and just getting it wide through the marbles. Takes a trip through the gravel straight Ooh. into the tire barrier. Way on, that's going to be some damage to the left rear on that car. Yeah, if there are any corners that you don't want to make such a mistake at Spa, it's definitely going to be Brussels corner because it's off camber. It's so easy to, you know, miss judge your corner entry and just go in with a little too much speed and touch the outside the runoff and that would be enough to send you barreling into the tire barriers. That is the case unfortunately for Manuel Bastion and you know unfortunately unfortunately for him he kind of fell victim to that and right now I think he's going to have a bit of a hard time with uh, the damage that he sustained on his left side. 
I just wonder if uh, he's trying... It's often approached as a double apex right-hand corner there, and I wonder if he was trying to send it as much momentum as he could into the first apex of Juna. the corner. Sorry, go ahead, Lorenzo. I was going to ask, can we see that replay just from the uh, cockpit camera or anything? Again, because it, it, the car looks like he's in third gear in between the turn. So it, it's not natural for the car to be in third gear during entry and exit. Then he kind of, oh yeah, he downshifted quickly. He just brought that car way too quickly. I thought he would rely way too much on the trail braking. All right, here we go as we goes into Brussels. Brussels can be a corner if you don't know how to properly brake and try to trail brake the car a little bit. All right, he goes into second. All right, the car basically lost control. He out braked himself in there, and that's what brought the car all the way down to the outside. So it was just my quick perspective playing mind games over here. Oh, we see the uh, very action-y slow motion shot as the 142 makes contact with the tire barrier once again. Jump back to the live pictures as they run in 11th place in class right now. They're about 45 seconds behind the GT3 race leader as things stand. So not being the smoothest event for Valkyrie E-Racing Green, they are still in front of it, must be said. JMS Racing. So it's good to see a lot of teams out here, despite having some... Issues earlier on in the race, persevering, pushing on. That's what endurance racing is ultimately all about. And good to see a good, strong complement of cars still out there. We started with 40 cars out there on track, taking the green flag. Down to, I believe it's 37 out there still circulating. So only three retirements. That's, that's pretty good when we think of these iRacing special events uh, and these longer endurance races especially. A lot of action and a lot of attrition through these night hours, especially in the winter where the, the night hours take even longer to go through. And Let's take a look then once again at the battle out in front of this class because I'm not sure exactly what's happening for Bentley Gods. They seem to be getting closer every once in a while, but there you can see gap up on your screen once again, Wei, ha Wei Chan. You see there, last lap, they lost 1.8 seconds, did Sunquist. Gap between HM Engineering and Bentley Gods continues to trend in the wrong direction for the 169. Well, I think um, before before I break, you know, the gap was at around seven seconds ish. So, you know, I I think you know Robinson Chris is doing quite a decent job in kind of mitigating all that uh, that pace difference. But yeah, of course, I, I think it's kind of extending once again. So yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I don't I, I think you know that, that there's plenty of opportunity more and uh, very much so. I think the focus for uh, the Bentley Gods guys would most definitely be. On you know, trying to keep the car on all fours and as much as possible go within attacking range with uh, the HM engineering guys. So overall race leader has just come down the pit lane once again for Phoenix Racing Esport Green, Kevin Vault for the 66. 34 seconds was the pit stop time. Just over 90 seconds in total pit lane delta. Appears as though the 169 has had some rough luck with traffic. The number eight from position number two overall also down onto pit lane. There was another issue for the second place running GT3 car, let's take a look at this RaceBot TV replay. And for Alessandro Van Avossi, I totally butchered that name as I read that very, very quickly. I apologize, Alessandro. But you'll see here going through Pujan just on the braking on the curves. Loses the car as it pitches down under braking. And for the second place running car, very, very fortunate to only lose a few sp uh, seconds there on track. Fortunate also not to get collected by that LMP2 car as he came through the corner. A very tricky section for you to lose the car on Puhan. The only way you can actually lose that car is if you come way in too hot and the traction control out of the car doesn't help you any little bit. As we're looking over here, it just goes over the bore and just under the bore. It goes into the corner entry. Yeah, it's a fu that's a funny one. Uh, he could have clipped the grass during the braking. That might have helped a little bit for Vanozzi. Let's look into the into the chopper camera. Here we go. No, just lost the braking out of the car as I think the suspension travel just traveled way too wildly and uh, bounced off the car a little bit of bottoming out and the setup didn't work out for uh, Alessandro Banozzi in this perspective. Yeah, that was a that was a weird one there. Not not even getting close to the grass on the outside of that corner, losing it on the curbing itself. Uh, an interesting proposition, the Audi R8 LMS is known for its uh, tail-happy tendencies at times. 
yeah. in the iRacing service. That was once upon a time, Weihan, when I forget how many years ago this was. I think it might have been the 2018 Spa 24 hour race, but I mean, we're talking about a car that had such an advantage here. The Audi was so fast that it, was, it wasn't it was even a question of what car the top teams were going to pick. I mean, everyone was in the Audi, and I remember watching the Spa 24-hour broadcast and seeing a number of them yeah. losing the rear end of the car. I mean, it, it's a quick car. Let's not make any bones about it, but even in the real world, it's got a reputation for not being the most amateur-friendly as compared to something like the Ferrari 488 GT3 car, which has been picked up by a number of amateur and pro-am teams because it makes that life that much easier for the amateur driver. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, with, with the periodic iRacing BOP that, that does get rolled out every now and then, you know, that does kind of change the tables a little bit. But yeah, certainly, I think my, my experience, you know, I, I don't own this car, in fact, but my, I think, you know, with, with testing and my experience with this Audi is that uh, yeah it, it does feel that it's, it's a car that you need a lot of time to get on top of but once you do you know, going fast becomes not an issue another issue happening by the way I'm seeing for the number 40 Motul Racing Esports I see what happened to them on another RaceBot TV replay it's just coming out of Bruxelles through the no name corner down in towards Pujon I, I think this might be another issue through Bruxelles corner as we jump onto the onboard of the number 40 braking hard and once again are they just going to get too deep into the corner and this time they don't actually go off into the gravel but they're going to park themselves right on the apex there and you see a Ooh. number of cars having to scramble around the outside of that corner as the 40 tries to now find a safe opportunity to rejoin and he's lost a whole heap of time as he makes a five point turn getting it back onto the racing surface. Yeah, mid apex where you basically want that part of the turn whenever you're in Brussels, you really want to hug that impa inside part of the mid apex and when you're trying to get out and get a the fast exit to the outside part of the turn and set yourself to Jackie X. But again, it's one of those things. If you carry too much speed and you try to trail break the car mid turn, it's not going to work. And you can see there's one LMP two and then a Corvette basically touching themselves touching bumpers one another, the Corvette touching the diffuser a little bit, nearly a massive accident just because that car being spun around mid-apex. Yeah, and let's jump on board then with third place overall T3 Esports. As they head down in through the double apex right-hander, you'll see the car in front just slow down, and you'll see that contact actually forces the 71 just slightly deeper into the corner. Let's take another look, and we'll jump on the rear shot as... The LMP2 car clears the Corvette, who tries to just carry the momentum like he's entitled to do, but stand, you know, so close were those two cars. No time for the Corvette to react in that default beautiful Corvette racing yellow, and unfortunately, slight contact there, but, I mean, Lorenzo, let's talk about the damage model for this car. It's a, it's a bit of a tank, and I, I think that number 71 yeah. car isn't going to struggle too much now as a result of that contact. It's a funny thing. If you touch on the back of the LMP2 car, there is a good chance, and I mean a really good chance, as we're seeing a battle between uh, Mirna Motorsports and Racing Pro and the Simsa Esports on their climbing their way back up as they are going in outside of Jackie X, setting themselves into Puhan. But unfortunately, Simsa getting the, the tail end of that traffic and losing right about one second but again, managing to get that back eventually. It's one of those things. If you hit the car, if you hit the P217 nose first, you have to get a really hard hit for you actually get real damage. If it is the back end, if you hit the back end, even the slightest hit can already affect your downforce performance. And the rear end, you can lose like 5, 10 kilometers easily with just hitting the tail end. Well, we saw Mulder Motorsports having an issue just a few moments ago, that number 21 car, and now Roberto Edward at the wheel for Simsa Esports. The Simsa team continues to grow. It, it, it seems like just yesterday they had about five members on their team, and now uh, more and more recruits being added to the squad. They've got two cars entered in this one right now. Simsa Esports LMP2 running in sixth place. You've got the GT3 entry currently 10th place in that class. They're about nine laps down from the race leader. Unfortunately, it's been a rough day for Simsa Esports, who are also competing in other competitions today on the iRacing Esports Network. But good to see Simsa Esports and the entire outfit having a good run of things here as 
Stefan Rossman down on the pit lane now going to let Edward take over sixth place. Then the gap now to the cars in front, just over 70 seconds. So the, the recovery drive from Simsa continues. They were once four laps down from the race leader, now just three. But a long way to go. The best that they can really hope for, I think, at this point, Weihan, is being three laps down and second and third being one lap down. I mean, I think the hope would be to get up to fourth place where, uh, you know, everyone from fourth on down is at least three laps or more behind the race leader. That might be the most that Simsa Esports can really hope for. But again, I talked about the spirit of endurance racing. Simsa Esports pushing all the way to the very end. Absolutely, of course, Simsa are a fantastic team uh, in, in the sim racing space. You know, I think they've been growing such exponentially over the last, you know, over the past couple of seasons. In fact, you've seen so many great drivers being part of uh, Simsa's team. And um, yeah, so, so of course, uh, for, for, for Edward, who's in the car right now, as you just said, of course, his, uh, his goal is probably to get within um, perhaps a couple of, uh, try, try to gain a couple of lost laps, maybe one lost lap uh, over the next couple of hours. That could be realistic as he makes his way through some lap traffic. Uh, you, you know, looking at how the, the LMP2 makes its way through the GTE classes, uh, the traffic, you know, I think sometimes we could perhaps you know, draw a comparison to perhaps iRacing back in 2012, 2013, where you used to have the old LMP2 with the Corvette GT1 cars. You know, those cars shared that same top speed, so it was not exactly possible for those prototypes to do blue flag maneuvers on straight lines, uh, on, on, on straights. But of course, it's a little bit different nowadays with the GTEs being you know, slower than, than the prototypes. Well, Simpson now down through La Source, the run to Eau Rouge and Radion, but... I think, Lorenzo, you just brought up an interesting point in our um, little discussion chat that we have for just communicating amongst ourselves. Simsa has added a lot of talent to their lineup. They have a lot of real-world talent as well. Gustas uh, Grinsberger is the... Uh, I think I got his last name wrong there. Is the, is the one that we were discussing just uh, before we got on air here. Um, but at the same time, they've lost a lot of their... A few of their drivers, I should say. Especially two very important ones. Alex Trainer, Fraser Williamson, who were part of the Simsa effort in Sports Car Open last year. They had a whole host of uh, bad luck that uh, I'm sure Fraser and Alex will hope never to repeat again, but those two have now moved over to Mavano, taking their LMP2 talent to that Italian squad, but you know, Simsa, they're still competing in many LMP2 series. The yeah. aforementioned Sports Car Open again, which had a second round from uh, the four hours of Monza today um, on the iRacing Esports Network, but, but for Simsa, I mean, it, it's kind of this interesting balance where they've lost those sim racing stars if you will but now they've got the likes of Gustas and Remez Azam for example another one of these real life drivers getting more into sim racing as it were yeah it's an interesting comparison you lose to uh, you lose Alex and uh, Frazier I'm, I'm not going to go into details because I kind of know the history between Frazier I, we t I talked to Frazier quite a lot uh, uh, on Discord and whenever we got a good opportunity to talk even Alex uh, as well and they go to Mavano, and then Mavano actually wins this round. They won round two today, so even with Fraser and Tommaso, and I think even Alex uh, helping them out in the back on the background for the LMP2 class. Um, and you try to get repositions, of course. We're not taking away Gustav Greenberg, uh, Greenbergers and also uh, the speed uh, out of Timo Toika, and then also Romez Zam. They're very fast drivers, but. I would say these new additions, they're not up to the speed of what Alex and Frazier usually put in. They don't have also the knowledge, I would say, of Alex and, 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 and uh, Frazier with the LMP2 car and the famili familiarity they have back in the day they have with the HPD, now with the P217. So, of course, I'm not going to say that they're not going to come back. Sims is a great team. They have... Uh, a great, uh, great staff. So they will come back eventually, but it will take them some time to bounce back. I'll be very honest. Well, we'll see how the rebuilding process goes then for the Simsa team. Just under 20 minutes to go till the end of another hour. You know, I've already done a lot of broadcasting from Spa today. I did a three-hour stint as a producer on the uh, 
Deutsche Sim Racing Championship, GC3 action around Spa Francorchamps, some fantastic battling. Who would have thought two wide around Blanchemont would work out three laps in a row? Well, René Kirchhofer apparently did in his BMW Z4, managed, managed to make the outside of Blanchemont. Uh, his preferred move to try and make passes happen down into the bus stop chicane. It's been a little bit more of a strategy battle here, though, in the last hour and 45 minutes since we took over from Peter Mackay and Jonathan Burke. Delighted to have you here on the iRacing Esports Network and Race Spot TV for our uninterrupted coverage of the H&R Spa 24-hour race powered by Mulner Motorsports. We're watching second place Ring Fizet Sim Racing in their uh, one of their entries in this race. They've got a number of entries. Uh, another one down in GT3 that is currently running third place in that class as well. So currently on for a fairly impressive run. Two podium positions, nothing to sniff at. They, they might be hoping to try and poke their heads a little bit higher, but... Right now, the leaders in both of those classes have laps advantage over the rest of the field. Stefan Rossman, we just talked about him coming down the pit lane. What has happened to him? This is, I believe, coming down into Brussels' corner. Don't tell me. We've had another issue at Malmody. Let's take a look at a RaceBot TV replay coming through the Lecom chicane. Let's jump on board with the number 21 machine as he heads into the corner and, well, learns out. Seems like a, a bit of deja vu here. Yeah. It's, it, you know, it's funny. Uh, I call this the Mamadikwa curse. We had this curse on uh, IVRA. <laughs> you probably know this, Arjuna, you were with me, uh, of the bus stop curse, where cars were basically spinning left and right, and also the La Source curse, where we saw leaders spinning left and right with the cold tires, but Malmedy is like the infamous one in the, in the iRacing community. There's always a driver, no, it doesn't matter how you take that uh, curb specifically, if you take that curb, it's it's a 50-50 chance of your car making it towards the inside part of the turn your, your, or your car spinning. Well, car spinning seems to be the, the trend of the day through that corner. As we watch Rossman making his way through the bus stop chicane in the 21 car. Good to see some good liveries on these Delara P217s. I'm quite liking this number 21 Mulder yep, Motorsport yep. Sim Racing Pro. And, and, and Wei Han, I mean, I think it's, it, it's always fun looking at sim racing liveries because the unfortunate thing about motorsports in the real world is that you have sponsors agreements and, you know, uh, all types of things that sometimes get in the way of artistic design. We've had a few art cars over the years, but I think sim racing teams often have the luxury of being able to do unique things on their cars and really developing a, a unique identity uh, around uh, around your branding. I mean, talking not just in, in sim racing, but other esports as well. There, there are esports organizations that are building their brands around, you know, apparel as well. So it's great to see a lot of these sim racing teams uh, starting to try and develop a, a more unique and, and individual visual identity. Yeah, I think the advantage of doing a, you know, perhaps this graphic branding artwork on uh, the vir in the virtual space is that you know you're not confined to paying you know a lot of money for 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 for, for, for graphic design in real life and also liveries that you you know you, it requires effort to, to be performed. That the great thing about in sim is that you know you can you can always change liveries every now and then and. At the same time, you know, as whenever you have good exposure, you know, you've got you 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 can make use of that to you know get sponsors on board. That you know, pretty much, what what you know what began as an ability to customize your car became a f an ability to even you know monetize and build corporate branding from that. And you know, I, I think it's you know such uh, such uh, features in sim racing has even you know, spurred uh, cottage industries of you know designers and even people who are buying, who are specifically into providing these uh, painting services. And you know, it's it's the, the scale of you know doing uh, something as, as simple as paint schemes all the way up to you know specific team branding strategies. So it's kind of grown so much. Now let's give a shout out to some of the uh, painters in the iRacing community. You've got the likes of I liveries does a lot of work for some of the top teams. Then you've got Harpoon Design, you've got Pixel Dust, you've got um, Sim Racing Designs, you've got Max Eru, just uh, my team, no bias, might be the best painter. No bias, uh, I quite like his work, but 
Lorenzo, have you spotted something out on track, or, or are you just thinking about some of the best liveries that we seem to have? Because you've gone a little bit quiet for a few moments. Nah, it's two things I'm not going to say about my real life stuff. I was going to actually post over here on our discussion chat, so you guys can actually be happy, but I'm not going to I'm not gonna go deeply into that stuff. But let me talk about liveries, because I love talking about liveries. Uh, we, I'll say that, uh, you know, you, you want to try to build up the brand of the... Uh, you're trying to build up a brand you're trying to make good liveries and you normally you usually have one of these uh makers uh, livery makers for the team dedicated or a guy that knows how to make liveries still make setups and everything else you have you try to build these uh teams with uh, uh, to be quite complete but sometimes we see uh livery makers like, like i liveries who did the vco liveries the nation's cup liveries and also does the red line in the williams one if i recall correctly as we're looking, uh, thinking about it between Amuna and also uh, Ring Fizia, uh, some racing GTE, as they just gone out of the bus stop. But it's, I'll, I'll say, there are some really good liveries over here. I'll soon pick a favorite before the our part of the broadcast is over. Well, we were watching a battle. Then the number one twenty three deep into last source, losing a little bit of time. The gap now two point five seconds. 123 for Mulder Motorsports also has to dive down onto pit lane in a few laps time. 24 laps on the stint for Christoph Konocker and uh, Lorenzo is busy in the background uh, getting some ducks in, in a row if you will. Uh, but right now let's take a look then at we were talking about Simsa Esports and some of the changes to that organization over the recent past. Well. New driver into the number six, Gustas Grinbergas. We were just talking about him, Lorenzo, and yeah. I'm, I'm going to ask you this because I'm seriously amazed that you didn't know that he was a real-life ELMS driver as well. Yeah, so, all right, for those who are not aware, I when we came into the broadcast, I was looking, yeah, all right, I saw Gustas Grinbergas' name in there, and I, and I was like... Did you guys and I asked both? Uh, actually, Arjuna was here. Weihan was not in here yet. And I asked, Yo, Arjuna, do you know that uh, Gustas is a Neil MS driver? Yeah, he did. Uh, I kind of, I know. And I was like, Oh, really? Because I did not know that. I only knew because I found out watching the Porsche documentary they're making on Mar oh, Michael Fassbender. And I looked it up on Wikipedia and I saw his name and I was like, Okay. I know Simsa has real life connections with Aramas, but I didn't remember Gustas was one of these drivers as well. So apologies, Gustas, don't, 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 don't kill me, please. I think you're underselling Gustas because I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, and it's been a long day, and I hope that I'm not misremembering. I think Gustas is actually one of the youngest drivers to ever win an ACO-sanctioned race in the Asian Le Mans series. Competed in hmm. that with Rick Ware Racing. I'm gonna have to do an some digging maybe in the next race spot fan immersion we're coming up to the top of another hour which does mean a short break for us in the commentary booth we'll get back to you on that one but uh, Weihan I'm not sure if you've been following along with this documentary that Porsche have been making as uh, the world famous actor Michael Fassbender makes his transition into becoming a, a gentleman race car driver much in the same vein as Patrick Dempsey did back in the day and in, indeed Fassbender is now competing in uh, the endurance uh, sorry European Le Mans series for Proton Dempsey Racing so so a little bit of a Hollywood connection there if you will but it's been a great insight the first season was all about Fassbender and his journey into club level racing in the Porsche 911 Cup car which we see you in the iRacing eSports service being uh, driven around often by our World Championship competitors. But the second season, focusing on that ELMS campaign that he's now on, uh, undertaking with the Proton Dempsey squad, it's a very fascinating insight into how a, 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 a person at the top of his profession in many ways, uh, you know, Fassbender being such a star actor, uh, you know, think of the, the series and the, the names that, Fassbender has had the opportunity to, to represent and work under and work with and to see him working as a regular member of the team you know as a very down to earth he knows that he's the I don't like to use the word weak link uh, but gentlemen race car drivers are often the weak link of their team you want to be the quickest driver in the bronze category you're not trying to beat the professionals in your class and seeing how Fassbender has been learning from Richard Leitz the, the world renowned Porsche works driver 
It's been a very interesting watch, and I, I enjoy watching those Porsche I'm documentaries. Well. And I can't wait to uh, the next episode, uh, his first race in the ELMS calendar. We're going to, going to get to see a little bit more insight uh, into that. November 6th, I do believe, is the release date for that next episode. Well, I, d I definitely have to have to find out more about the documentary because, unfortunately, I've not been following it. But yeah, I, I think you know very much. Oh. It's, it's pretty much down to oh, yeah. Boys oh. and girls, uh, Muna just got overtaken by Simsai, and we have an incident out of the Piff Path, boys. What has happened there? I was just taking a look. Then for Stefan. Rossman has been off the track there. Let's take a look then at the race bot replay. Lorenzo, which cars were involved here? If I recall correctly, that might have been the Molto and also uh, the uh, Stefan Rossman as well. They just got out of the pit path. There was some blinking of the lights between uh, Rossman and uh, Nick Deisler. And unfortunately, just as they come into the pit path, uh, I think Rossman got shunted by Deisler and then Deisler missing his APA, his missing his turn during the fifth path well, let's... and going out of the turn right before Stavala. Yeah, let's spool this back then just a little bit. Coming down through No Name Corner, we'll see what happened here. You see the lights flashing actually from the car behind. That's Motul Esports and we must point out at this point, they're five laps down from the car they're trying to race, nine laps down from the race leader. So as they work their way down into Ooh, uh, it oh, it seems like Motor Racing just deep under braking missed it, forces Rossman wide, and Rossman gets lucky in many ways, I think, Lorenzo. When you see the damage that Motor Racing has done, they've lost even more time going off into the tire barrier. Rossman might be feeling a little bit lucky that that's all the damage to his race that he's really had to deal with. Yeah, it got lucky. I would say Rossman got really lucky because. First and foremost, Deisler overly committed to the inside. You see the blinking of the lights. Kind of like aggressive blinking as they go down into Puho. Now we got over here the the from the bonnet cam or the the front hood of the cam of Deisler as he comes into Piff Path way aggressive on the overbake. He kind of shuts him off on the outside and then into mid corner. He doesn't have enough grip or speed to make it out of the turn. He knows into the outside part of the barrier into the tire barrier but uh i know you're trying to save time and you want to try to get yourself some laps but you gotta remember yourself rossman and ginsburg as were actually fighting for position exactly and while we were taking a look at these replays i do think there was another issue for another car uh the 11.9 simsport 219 so let's take a look at a second Racebot TV replay then, not going back to live pictures just yet. And this is in the Ferrari 488 on the run down in towards the final section of corners. The bus stop chicane, what's going to happen here? Just, that is an odd one. Doesn't appear to have been breaking on the grass there, Weihan, but losing the, the rear of the car and sliding to the outside of the corner rather than the inside, which is what we typically see. You know, just uh, observing that once again, yeah, look, uh, he's going on the entry, and I think there might have been a, a slight touch of the grass, but I think uh, most of it might have down, be, been down to the fact that, you know, perhaps the rear wheels had been locked, and, it, you know, I understand that, you know, the entry into that, sh that grass stop chicken is kind of banked a little bit to the right, so that might explain why, you know, as he locked up, he did swing towards the left. Of course, he's on a recovery drive now, and he's in 10th in, in, in class at this point, and... Yeah, I think it's doing good so far. Two laps back from stage one racing in the 179. So, some work to do there. And I've just noticed as well, I wonder if the 11.9 Simsport team had to serve a penalty earlier on in the race for registering with the, an incorrect car number. Because, well, 0 to 100 appears, sorry, 0 to 99 appears to be the reign in the realm of the LMP2 cars. 100 to 199, the realm of GTE. But... 200 to 299 being GT3, 219 for 11.9 Sim Sport. No wonder I was getting a little bit confused there, Lorenzo. And it, you know, it's one thing that's unique, I think, to virtual racing that you don't see in the real world. You, you don't often show up to the, the racetrack with the wrong number applied to your car, but here in the iRacing service, you have to make sure you register not only with the correct team ID, which, which then provides the, the correct team yeah. name, but also the team number, which is something you have to manually set. Can you imagine the fury if uh, a team showed up to a race weekend with the wrong car number plastered onto the side of their car? It's not something that you could really imagine ever happening. Uh, we saw that on SEO and EO. 
multiple times. I, I meant in the real. <laughs> I meant in the real world. In the real. All right. Sorry. In the real world. Ah, sorry. 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 <laughs> Commentator just gone b berserk for a little bit. Uh, I would say it's. I've seen it once. I think here in Brazil. I think I've seen it once. I can't recall. I think in one of those local races, a local state races where one of the cars had a wrong number and the organization had another number and they got it confused and they applied the penalty like a time penalty five seconds or something like that uh, to, towards the end of the race but it does happen it's infuriating i don't know on whose side but trust me it does happen from time to time well interesting to hear it's not something you hear about at the uh international levels i think of motorsport but battle raging on now between 12th and 13th in the lmp2 class cars nine laps down from the overall race leader one second separates phoenix racing esport yellow and motul racing esports we sure just saw the motul racing team with that issue uh down in through the the fania chicane they're now chasing down the 68 in front of them but just a minute away from ticking over one more hour gone by. Just over 10 hours of racing still to go. And we are well and truly in the pitch black of night. Local time in the race session is just past 2 a.m. in the morning, I do believe. So we're still looking at a good four or five hours until sunrise and indeed the first rays of sunshine start emerging from between the trees. I wonder if we're even going to see the sunshine before we hand it over to the commentary crew for the third and final portion of this broadcast. It's going to be David Haynes and Thomas Davis taking you to the checkered flag with Hugo Luis in the production room controlling all the action. Right now though we've got a three man commentary booth. Myself, Arjuna Kankipati joined by Lorenzo Bonder and Wei Han Chan tick over the hour mark. It's time for some race bot fan immersion and Weihan, I'm going to let you have the choice this time around. Do we want to stick here on the battle that we're watching on your screen or is there someone else that piques your interest? Yeah, I think this battle looks good. Let, let's ride with them. Let's perhaps ride with uh, with the, the LMP2 of um, uh, this exact one on the screen. And the the, the multi-racing esports uh, LMP2 car, I think they're, they're putting up a great show for all of us. They've just come out of last source on the run down through Eau Rouge and Radion. Let's go on board then for a few laps of RaceBot TV fan immersion. As we look to see a change for position in just a few moments' time.
So another few laps on board then with the number 40 Motul Racing Esports Dallara P217 LMP2 car. Spa Franco Chance at night is a glorious sight to behold. And we still have 37 out of our 40 starters pounding around the track, putting in the laps under the pitch black night sky. Nine hours and 50 minutes still to go then in the 24 hours of Spa. The H&R, H&R 24 hours of Spa powered by Molno Motorsports indeed. So take a look then at the rundown across our various categories and let's mix things up once again. This time, Lorenzo Bonder, why don't you take the LMP2 class. Absolutely. So here we go with P1 still being Phoenix Racing Green Esport. Esport Green. Phoenix Racing Esports Green. I got the names over here, believe it or not. It's still having right about a lap of advantage against Rizfizia Racing LMP2. T3 Esports is in third with Angry Bull in fourth place. Uh, WS Racing Esports Magenta in Fifth place with Simsa is in sixth. Muna Motorsports Race Team Racing Pro is in seventh. And rounding out the top way is Judena, Judena Motorsports Club EV number 77 for your top eight in the LMP2 class. So that's LMP2. Let's move on to our second of the three classes, and that is the GTE class. And that's currently led by the Corvette Chevy C8R for Bendley Gods, the 169. But that's because HM Engineering, their Corvette, Number 159 have just come down onto pit lane. Driver change underway as well. Mark W. McCormack getting behind the wheel, taking over from the Australian Jack Boyd. What will McCormack be able to do? He's against the driver in Sunkist, who's been in that car for a long, long time, but mental fatigue clearly for Sunkist not proving to be a problem. The rest of your field in this class, two laps down from the race leader. Online simracing.de are in a fierce battle with Prism Sim Racing Alpha for the third and final podium position. Race Union and Austrian Sim Racers both three laps down. And then Ring Frisette Sim Racing, the number 188, and Mulder Motorsports rounding out the top eight. Weihan, why don't you take the last class, last but not least, the GT3s? So in the GT3 charge of affairs, we have a familiar bomber is still in the race lead, just as they have for quite a long time within this uh, quarter of uh, the endurance race. And three laps back uh, and onwards will be the rest of the GT3 field. That is second place. Absolute Mo Motorsport Acelift Design. They are in second, uh, three laps behind. Ring feels that Sim Racing GT3 Pro. They are four laps behind the leader. They're in third. They've also got a German Performance Sim Racing in fourth position. We've got the rest of the guys, Team RaceJitter.de in fifth. I think they've climbed a couple of positions from before. And we've also got Milner Motorsport Sim Racing Black, Albrecht Motorsports in seventh, and Wolf Motorsport Sim Racing Lupus in eighth position. These guys are seven laps behind the race leader, the class leader. Well, there you can see the class leader getting stuck behind. I think that's ninth place for Parix by Alto Motorsport Sim Racing, the number 200 car. And I don't think the Familian Bombers are going to be too happy about that one, but they're going to sneak through on the inside then through Blanchemont. That ninth place car proving to be a bit of a roadblock, it must be said, compared to the pace that the number 257 continues to do. They are, they are the class of your field, it must be said. 219, 247 the last time around. We'll see what the lap time is as they cross the stripe once again. This time around with a little bit of traffic, a 221.910. But Lorenzo, I mean, this GT3 class is being utterly dominated by the 257. Fabio Busch currently driving. And I mean, right now, at, at least uh, on average in clean air, he's about one second a lap quicker. So you look at that three lap gap back to second place. It's been done out on track as a result of some very impressive pace from the 257. Yeah, everybody's actually putting really good pace. You know, Robin Stoller was actually putting a good pace. Patrick Henn as well. And then the Basuch brothers are putting massive pace. You know, Basuch, both both Fabio and uh, and Michael are not slouch for top-level competition. They have seen them run in some GT3 leagues and also some endurance leagues as well. And they are very competent drivers with any GT3 car they touch. So... It's, it's good to see this team uh, being very good and driving fast and putting out a massive 
massive gap on the other GT3 cars. Well, let's talk about some of the gaps then throughout the field as we approach the nine hour mark in this race. Time really flies in this one and we've already been on the broadcast for already two hours and 15 minutes our six hour segment really starting to fly by you see the gap then between t3 esports mike orang just got back behind the wheel of the 71 and he's got a 40 second delta now to andreas almansberger in the number eight and this was a battle that when we first joined the commentary booth was much much closer unfortunately here weihan that number 71 has lost out a little bit of time they've they're on a slightly different strategy at the same time as well, but I, I don't know what's happening here for the number 71. Unfortunately, uh, they were proving to, you know, be charging through the field and, and, and starting to really close in a little bit on the race leader. But right now, they're slowly struggling back here in third. Yeah, it would seem like quite a change from what we observed uh, just uh, some time ago. And, you know, I, I think it, it is kind of exacerbated by all the traffic that uh, Mike Erang is kind of facing with uh, many, many GTE cars, uh, GT cars as well as some uh, lap uh, LMP2 cars in front. But, you know, I think he, he could use these lap traffic to his advantage. He can make use of some slipstream to just kind of close up with that 40 second long gap uh, behind a ring visit sim racing LMP2 cars in second position so yeah it's quite quite a sizable gap that you know he he has to take a lot quite a lot of time to cover up but i'm sure he's well on his way on doing so and we're here at the legendary spa franco champ circuit we're using that longer pit lane the endurance pit lane which makes its way all the way from the entry just coming out of the bus stop chicane down into where it remerges with the track on the exit of the Radion corner over the top of the hill. So a lot of time lost in pit lane if you have to come in for potentially a splash and dash at the end as we see one of the LMP2 cars peeling off into pit lane. That's Robert Theme for uh, the 99 Fit for Racing. Haven't had the opportunity to talk too much about them just yet. But like we were talking about in the top eight rundown across the standings, Lorenzo, I mean, the gaps are really quite big across all of the classes at this point in time. We're waiting for HM Engineering to potentially re-leapfrog the Bentley gods as Robin Sunkiss going to have to bring that car down pit lane, probably going to hand it over to one of his teammates, I would have to assume, because Sunkiss has been there in that car for a, a long while, I think, right now. And we talk about mental fatigue and, and not being able to see too much in the nighttime hours here in the iRacing service, I, I have to think that uh, at some point that 169 car is going to make that driver change. Yeah, I think it has to be now. You know, you you just gave your driver basically 55 to one hour of full stint, and driving in the nighttime, especially in Spa, can be a little bit taxing on the individual because you don't have much natural uh, artificial lightning. You just have to rely on your instincts and the headlights ahead of you so it's quite complicated for you to put that uh good performance it isn't like Le Mans Le Mans doesn't have that uh, all sort of official lightning you just have it on the start finish line but it is a more relaxing drive over here you're basically deviating cars and uh and uh allowing LMP2 uh, to overtake and overlap you time after time so it is more natural to see drivers doing double stints maybe one who's actually more accustomed with the car in uh, these kind of uh, conditions to go for a go for a triple stint but i think that is the perfect time to bring robinson piss in for the bentley guys and allow another driver to take over and you see the gap there up on your screen one minute 38 between first and second is uh one of the gt3 cars is going to hang out onto the inside HM Engineering going a bit deep under braking, given that the GT3 car was giving up the place for them. But the gap 1 minute 38 seconds, uh, assuming that the 169 car is coming down for a full service, judging by the pit lane time for Mike, uh, Mark McCormack, sorry, not Mike McCormack, Mac McCormack, Mark McCormack, eventually he'll get there. But you see the pit lane time there on the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. One minute is the total time for the pit stop. Total time on pit lane, though, just over two minutes. So, I mean, oh, as, as I was about to say that HM Engineering Whoa, is going to retake the race lead, they just gone and taken out a GT3 car down into the Lacombe chicane. I'm not sure who that GT3 car is, but 
My word, HM Engineering having a big disaster down through the comms and that chicane. I don't know what to make of it, you know. It is a Z4. I'm just trying to take a look on who was it properly. It was As... the ninth place car, the 200, repair it by Artel Motorsport, Patrick Smith at the wheel there but let's take a look at the onboard then and let's wow. let's watch this one they just forget to break uh at this point Weihan. you see there passing the curb on the left trying to slow down I, I actually wonder though if potentially the 200 is slowing down a little bit too much more let's try and take another look at that one then so this is another view we are further back uh now we're gonna go have a view from up top so we do look closely, this is the Corvette, he, yeah, I, I think he might have just missed the specific breaking point and unfortunately plowed into the rear end of the BMW, but I, I, I think it, it could also be due to the fact that, you know, it's it's probably at this point, you know, it's more down to attrition and maybe the, maybe the, the you know, he's probably missed, misjudged the, perhaps the presence of the, the Z, BMW Z4 in front, so I think that, that just kind of uh, messed things up a little bit for, for his braking. And of course, it's, it's definitely taken this uh, Z4 by surprise. You know, you're just breaking into a corner and woof, suddenly there's a mysterious force pushing you out wide and, you know, that... Well, I, I'm just going to interrupt you there. I, I, I don't actually think it's the Corvette's fault. We take another look then from the rear end. You just see how much... The Z4 slows in the braking zone. I'm not exactly sure if he's at racing speed coming down into the braking zone there, Lorenzo. I mean, he's going very, very slowly. Let's take another look at the replay then down into the corner. But you see the, the apex speed from the, the BMW just not there. And he's almost crawling at times. Yeah, I think this is something that I would say full lack of knowledge of entrance racer for the driver Patrick Schmidt. Uh, just he, I, I, his intentions. I would say his intentions are good. You know, you wanna, you wanna let the driver go by and, uh, and and just remain on your on your on your racing line. My apologies, but there is that thing. Number one rule of endurance racing and multi class racing: predictability. You wanna be predictable, and he just threw a massive, uh, braking zone wherever. For some one reason, you want to let the other car go by, and eventually you get damaged in the process. You throw that predictability away. You're not maintaining your line, and unfortunately for the HM Engineering, they're not to blame. The crash was inevitable at that point, and uh, none to Mark Corm Mac Cormac, uh, to blame out there. Yeah, you just got as stuck with his name as I did a few moments ago. Let's see then. What the lap time is going to be for the two, uh, the 159. 2 minutes 15, 755 last time around. Lost 2 seconds compared to the class leader out front waiting for them to dive down onto pit lane. That is an odd incident and I... Uh, I'm not even sure if it was a, a lack of awareness there. I just wonder if potentially maybe an issue, a technical issue. It's not often you see cars going down into second gear or going into that corner. The, the very quick right-left chicane where you try and just hustle the car around it try and carry as much momentum as you can the 159 then likely to have some kind of damage to the front clip of that car potentially just going to hinder them down this long run that they're about to begin all the way from la source through eau rouge and radion then up the hill to the lacombe chicane and that gap now out to one minute 41 seconds they are going to pr probably end up coming out in front uh, rather, the Bentley gods are going to end up still coming out behind HM Engineering. But drama for the second place runner then. And unfortunately there, I think the number 200 has had to retire as a result of that incident. They're still down on the pit lane getting a lengthy repair done to the front of their BMW Z4. But I mean, Weihan, they hit straight into the tire barriers. Front first, front engine car. Uh, I think that BMW is going to require some lengthy repairs and they were already about five laps down or six laps down from the race leader. They're now going to drop even further. Yeah, it would appear so. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm just having a look at them in the pits and you know, I think he's going to be in there for quite a long time. But of course, um, you know, the, the recovery drive that Mark McCormack is on, he's, uh, I think he's approaching some other... Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's approaching uh, this uh, GT3 lap car and does, does so very well. There, 
it's through Blanche Mode and you know it's not always easy to kind of sandwich your car through there. So they make it past uh, that G3 car nicely and of course this is now the battle that's ensuing between um, I guess the front two cars in GT. I do apologize, my, my life timing has been acting up and sometimes it's a little bit hard to observe the timing gaps. So second place, 1 minute 41 and a half seconds as we wait for the 169 to come down onto pit lane. Robin Sunkist has been in that car for a while now. He's working lap uh, 378, I do believe. He's been in there then since lap 326. So a nice lengthy stint for Sunkist. He did, he did a similar length stint earlier on in the race. I have a feeling he's going to be handing over to one of his teammates next time around. I'm looking at the schedule though, Lorenzo, and, and they seem to be playing it fairly flexible. They don't have to, you know, a set routine where they have three drivers in that car. They aren't going one, two, three, one, two, three. They seem to be a bit more flexible. I wonder if it's going to be Andreas Dahlstorm who gets into that car or their third driver uh, whose name I'm not, uh, I think that's Trevor uh, Pastrami there. Yeah, Trevor, Trevor Pastrami. I, here's the thing. This is one of these names that, uh, first and foremost, it makes me hungry. I know. Let me just say that. that. That's why I was stumbling there, <sighs> Lorenzo, because I'm like, I was reading that right. Is that actually Pastrami, or am I just dreaming right now? Yeah, and secondly, you know, there's a driver where I think everybody knows, and even you are Judah as well, it has a, a name kind of similar to this, but his first name is not Trevor, it's Travis. And his second name is not Pastrami, it's Pastrana. So it's a little bit confusing. It can get, it can get on your head easily. Well, it, it can get a little confusing. Good to see Travis Pastrana, by the way, competing in various iRacing All-Star events as part of that World Championship Series. There's a big issue, by the way, for fourth place. John Allen in the WS Racing Esports Magenta Machine down into the bus stop chicane has to wait to be able to rejoin the racing surface. Here we go. Take another look at the onboard then. Down into the bus stop chicane. He makes his way around the outside of the Simsa Esport GT3 car. Just carries way too much speed into the corner. Overcooks it. And there you'll see they're pointing the wrong direction. And has to wait as a number of cars make their way by. Fortunately didn't lose a position there. But just lost a little bit more time to the cars in front of them. Gave up a bit of ground to the cars behind him as well. Let's take a look then at the Bentley God. Still, you can see here on the replay, going down pit lane, they've been in the box then for about 31 seconds. And indeed, Trevor Pastrami has gotten behind the wheel of the 169. So he's going to be taking over for at least the next two stints, we would assume. There you can see the 159 HM Engineering making its way around the bus stop chicane. Should still be good to the tune of about... I would say probably 15 to 20 seconds, but McCormack Definitely. clearly feeling a little bit of pressure now. He's got that damage to the car that he's going to have to going to have to deal with as a result of that incident. And you know, Weihan, the, the, the it, it is a mid-engine car now, and it definitely drives a lot more like a Ferrari as Bentley gods drop off the jacks, finally get up to pit lanes, uh, get off the pit lane speed limiter. They're going to drop, I think, about 20 seconds behind now as they've got to merge behind some lap traffic as well. But, you know, a mid-engine car, I, it's not going to take too much damage, I think, from that impact that we saw. But nevertheless, McCormack is going to have the car not feeling exactly as he would expect. And it's now on him to get it to the next pit stop to potentially start getting some of that damage taken care of. So I think the question now is for, for how long would he be able to kind of uh, hold on to his advantage ahead of Trevor Pastrami. You know, because uh, we, we, as, as you just said, with this damage, the car will be a little slow. And right now, coming under a little bit of pressure from an overtaking LMP2 car, which he does so uh, does allow uh, through so very nicely. And yeah, I think uh, once he makes his next pit stop and does uh, the repair, I, I doubt I doubt the repairs will be too long. I think it, will, it, it could probably be just a matter of a, a sub one minute error repair. Um, and yeah, this is him making his way through a GT3 class. But yes, definitely, I think after once that is done, he should be back to uh, tip, uh, good condition, good enough to to to, ra to race at top speed once again. But because you know the thing with i racing repairs is that sometimes it kind of it kind of repairs your car car to kind of nearly there but not exactly pristine 
and he'll be hoping to uh, have a little bit of a better run than than uh, than that. He'll be hoping that m the majority of that damage can be taken care of. Then just a few minutes to go until we tick over the half hour mark. Then, as we look to close another hour of racing action here from the legendary Spa Franco Champs circuit, 24 hours of racing action across three classes brought to you by H&R in association with Mulner Motorsports. Uninterrupted coverage presented by RaceBot TV. My name is Arjuna Kankipati. I'm joined by Lorenzo Bonder and Wei Han Chan. We thank you for joining us here on the iRacing Esports Network for the third quarter of this broadcast. Still nine hours and a half to go. We'll be passing you off to the very capable voices of David Haynes and Thomas Davis in just over three hours' time. Sun will have begun to start rising by that point. Still yet to be seen if we're going to see some proper sunlight racing before we hand it over. But nevertheless, McCormack now with a 6.4 second buffer over Pastrami. And that's definitely going to make me hungry over the next couple of hours as Pastrami works on what will likely be at the very least a double stint in the Chevy Corvette C8R. That seems to be the name of the game in GTE. No drivers really risking the triple stinting strategy. We must also point out that these cars are slightly offset in the pit cycle. They're about seven laps separated, so Pastrami seven laps better on fuel, and that's seven long laps around this spa franco Champ circuit, Weihan, that, you know, seven laps less fuel can be a significant chunk of pit lane time. And, you know, if we're talking about Potentially a third, maybe just under a third of a full tank of fuel there. Even if you are able to cut out a pit stop there, you're not just cutting out the, you know, 20 seconds in pit lane, getting the, in the pit box rather, getting the, the service done. You're cutting out the just over 60 seconds that it's going to take you to traverse all the way from the pit entry coming out of the bus stop chicane to rejoining the racing surface out of Eau and Radion. It's a very long pit lane here and... I have to wonder if the Bentley gods are maybe just working on the strategy here at this point, focusing a bit more on that as compared to trying to get the gap down to the 159 in front of them. Yeah, of course, with uh, so many pit stop opportunities in, in, of course, in an endurance racing format like this, you know, sometimes drivers can manipulate uh, the pit stops, as you've uh, just mentioned, in order because you know, I think uh, you know one second in a pit stop is equal to you know much much more time out racing on track. So I'm 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 very much certain that these drivers do kind of have that in mind. So uh, battle is still ensuing, uh, or rather the. Uh, the gap between uh, the Bentley Gods and HM Engineering guys uh, are now hovering just under six seconds. So this is quite a you know a healthy gap for the HM Engineering guys. Um, but of course, it, it 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 does leave us to see if this gap will be reduced uh, due to the slight aero damage that the HM guys have uh, faced earlier on. So this is uh, the. He's, he's coming under some some more lap traffic so you know sometimes you know i i think you know what what some what uh sometimes this, this, what advantage this can bring is that you know sometimes you can have some gt3 cars behind you to kind of build a little additional uh kind of a buffer against uh, the cars behind of you as mccormack dives down the inside through no name corner that gt3 car not happy about that i think that's the 285 mulner motorsports sim racing black and i understand why a late send down the inside from mccormack through the corner but traffic giveth and traffic taketh as i always like to say you never know exactly how the traffic is going to play out you you always want it to play out in your favor but it never seems to go like that when you're sitting in the cockpit everyone else seems to have the better luck of the run but it's important for the teammates to coach you through the traffic just walk you through what you're going to encounter as you continue to work your way through lap traffic here. So 36 cars still on the track. Unfortunately, the number 200 repair X by Artel Motorsport BMW that we saw having that big issue has been down on pit lane for almost 15 minutes taking damage repair at this time. They're, they're not in danger of losing a position right now. They're in 10th place in class, but at some point, we talk about the spirit of endurance racing. Well, the 289 team, the Ring Frisette Sim Racing GT3M. Let's take a look at them for a second. 
Because they're down, um, if I do some more quick math, or I press the button, that will tell us the gap. They're 51 laps behind your leader, and you can see the damage to that car, Lorenzo. Nevertheless, they continue to pound around the laps, and in about 36 laps or so, if the 200 can't get back out on track, the 289 is going to move up into the top 10. So, Spirit of Endurance Racing, well and truly alive here. It's great to see so many cars yeah. with damage continuing to pound around and put the laps in. Uh, ultimately, you know, sim racing sometimes falls into the trap where a lot of these teams, once they go a few laps down, you know, no safety cars helping to get them back onto the lead lap. They quit. They, they get out of the race. But here you see the 289 yeah. making room, letting all of his competitors continue to race hard on the track. He's just there pounding around and getting some laps under his belt. Yeah, it, it's one of these events, you know, you might not aim for a, for a win. You know, you're just trying to get a result whatever it is of course you if you think you're competitive of course you're going for the win unfortunately we had instances like there's a red bull racing uh, in this number ring for i think in 2018 because they had an incident just before the car so i think uh holtzman and uh and Rume holtzman and the rest of the team decided to retire the car and give away the i think the win for uh for the vrs crew uh that eventually got the win in the g in the gt3 cup class but the, the interesting thing here is this is one of the events where you don't have a lot of pressure. You want to just put the drivers in and have a lot of fun. Of course, there is a price pool involved. But most importantly, you're trying to build a report to the team if it is a new team or you're trying to develop drivers. For example, Patrick Schmidt, I was saying he got into that incident with the HM Engineering. That is due to lack of experience driving the GT3 class and you try to build that you're trying to make 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 the guy makes mistakes everyone makes mistakes i make mistakes constantly every single week and i lost i rating because of this but eventually you build up and you get more mindful of those mistakes that you're making and you're going to be last prone to make that mistakes in a future event so that's there's always upside to these kind of things well, talking of upside schmidt back out on track pounding away trying to get more experience underneath him I do have to worry just a little bit, though. We saw him slow very deep into the braking in the Lacombe chicane. That's what caused the incident that gave him this damage. You can see now continuing to be a little bit tentative around the track. He's got a number of lapped cars working right behind him. That, I think, is the overall race leader, I do think. Uh, that might be one of the... F no, that's not the race leader, I think. That might... There's the race leader. So that must be the other Phoenix Racing Esport car. But let's take a... A little bit of a look then at Phoenix Racing Esport Green because, well, gap behind them. One lap there you can see there. They, they've got a very comfortable buffer to the rest of their competitors here. And we've seen them taking a number of risks. But nevertheless, Christopher, Christoph Montz currently behind the wheel for the number 66 crew. Pounding away down through Puhan as he works towards a Porsche 911. I think that's the Austrian Sim Racers car. Currently runs in sixth place in that class but if you're the number 66 car Weihan, i mean nine hours 20 minutes to go you lead by just over a lap at this point it's getting close to eventually becoming a two lap buffer if the trend continues i mean it must be a very difficult situation to manage because you want to continue pushing on continue finding the the, the kind of performance that you're showing on track but at the same time you don't want to make that mistake that's going to compromise your race. And we have seen them taking some risks. And uh, the risk versus reward balance, well, I have a feeling that's something that whoever's spotting for each of these drivers is reminding them constantly, we're leading this race. We've got a one-lap lead. Let's not throw this one away. Yeah, well, I, I, th I think, first of all, it, it is, I think, um, uh, in, in, in terms of you know, the things that he's facing, you know, he is in a position that is rather comfortable for him. But... You know, like you said, what's exactly in his mind is, you know, it could go uh, a few ways, but I think the most uh, sensible thing uh, that drivers in this position would do at this point is to, you know, perhaps fo focus on, you know, perhaps go 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 to kind of like a, a hot lap mode, so to speak, and maybe become a little bit more mindful of uh, the lap traffic in front, because, you know, sometimes th those uh, lap traffic is, is, you know, kind of where some incidents do take place. So, you know, I think... Um, you know, because he's got less things to worry about now, I think he, I think it, it's more sensible to just kind of focus on keeping <laughs> keeping the all fours on track and you know just en ensuring that the car continues being consistent 
uh, throughout uh, the, the, the laps. Unless you're Max Verstappen and Team Red Light. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't avoid <laughs> Well, Max Verstappen involved in some other racing this weekend as the Formula One paddock heads back to the Imola circuit. It's been a long time since we've seen F1 racing around that track. And my oh my, has it changed since the last time F1 visited. Track limits now a big topic of discussion when it comes to qualifying for that race. The race obviously going to take place tomorrow. Shortened schedule in the Formula 1 paddock as well. No Friday practice. So just Saturday and Sunday running out on track. Valtteri Bottas taking pole position in that one. Pipping his record-breaking teammate, Lewis Hamilton. And I know Lewis Hamilton is an endurance racer. Isn't an endurance racer, rather, guys. But, you know, you know, I would love to see someone like Lewis try and challenge himself and do a 24-hour race at some point because he is such a perfectionist. You see it in the way that he approaches every single race as part of the Mercedes-AMG Patronus team, but can you imagine taking that level of professionalism and perfection and that drive to try and be perfect? I mean, take that into a team environment where you've got three other drivers pushing as hard as you can and I don't know. I think Lewis Hamilton might might find it a little bit uncomfortable. I think it, certainly sharing the car with others is probably not something that he's that familiar with. But I think he would take to it like a duck to water and, and really be something that would be very different to the type of racing that he's done basically since he started racing as a very young child. It's, uh, man, it's an interesting thing because if we are to judge every single uh, driver in F1, none of them are actually uh, entrance racers. I think the only hey. true entrance racer will be Alonso. Hey, will be Alonso hey, hey, Hulkenberg. hey. I, I was saying, you, you forget the GOAT, Hulkenberg. The Hulkenberg. Own, the so own... I said Hulkenberg. I just said Hulkenberg. Oh, no, no, no. I, I jumped <laughs> on. You. I jumped on you a little bit too quickly. But it must be said, Hulkenberg, a Le Mans winning driver, and and yes, I think in some ways, some people look at him and say, "Oh, you won in the third Porsche. Oh, you only won because other people had issues." But I think a lot of people forget that third car that year at Le Mans had some incredible pace, and they won it on merit. And, and you know, you talk about Hulkenberg. Imagine. Imagine the interest. You see Alonso going and doing endurance racing. Imagine if we have more and more of this cross-pollination as more and more drivers do cross-functional racing. You looking at IndyCar as well, the number of F1 drivers who have expressed interest in switching over to that. You had um, Antonio Felix da Costa who did a test day with the uh, Rahal Letterman Lanigan crew as well. So yeah. it's just great to see. That I love thinking about what would happen when you mix this up a little bit more and you put drivers out of their comfort zone into a place where they can really show why we regard them as some of the best talents in the world. All right, let me just continue over here. For me, graded the Hulkenberg greatest feed was not winning the Le Mans 24, okay? That's for support. Are you going to say Winning Le Mans position? is great? No. For me, Hulkenberg's greatest feed is eating a schnitzel on... <laughs> Thursday and getting P8 in the Eiffel Grand Prix <laughs> like without any practice whatsoever and getting P8 and making Racing Point get P3 in the team standings. For me, that is the greatest achievement an F1 driver can have. Alright, jokes aside. Um, <laughs> well, no, Lorenzo, I'm going to interrupt you there because Weihan, okay. I'm going to ask your opinion on this. I mean, Let's. I, I think you're not you're not underselling it there, Lorenzo. You're, ask, you're talking about a driver who hasn't been in the cockpit of an F1 car for just going on about nine months, I think, if I'm doing the math in my head correctly, gets into the car on day's notice, minimal practice, has to get up to speed as quickly as possible, and then delivers in the way that he did. I mean, Weihan, we talk about this also in sim racing. There was a, a few cases in the sports car open race earlier today where they had to push back the deadline for adding and removing drivers to your lineup because a number of teams were experiencing difficulties due to um, you know all the lockdowns that are reoccurring um, in the recent uh, few days and unfortunately teams had to switch up that lineup and you know to come in on days notice and in the F1 world where the only practice you're going to get is potentially on a simulator and I don't even think Hulkenberg had the benefit of much simulator time uh, 
I, I don't think it can be understated how hard it is to get up to speed. Get it when you're not even in physical fitness. You're not mentally prepared to be in the cockpit. I mean, eighth place in a Formula One race to score points is just unbelievable. Well, I, I mean, you, you know, uh, it, it was just uh, something that all of us were so uh, amazed by, you know, just uh, seeing, seeing someone like Hulkenberg. But you know, I, I think, you know, I, I'm just more mindful of the fact that, you know, I think he should, you know, very much uh, continue driving in Formula 1. That's just something, just, just a thought. Um, but it's just unfortunate that, you know, he, he's he's kind of been all the, he's kind of been up there throughout his career, you know, just don't, don't, don't mind the fact that, you know, he's, he's probably missed out on podiums, but he's he's always been up there. So, you know, I think it, it, it kind of did, you know, it, yeah, it is surprising that he's done so well in just short notice, but I think we would kind of already expect that Hulkenberg would do pretty decently, uh, you know, given the circumstances. All right, now let me launch your question. If you have to... <laughs> All right, calm down. If you, if you have to... Oh, no, I'm looking uh, forward to this one, question. Lorenzo. If you have to launch a quad, of course. If you have to launch Hulkenberg into any of the free seats, because we don't have a lot of free seats right now at an F1 still. I think we might have the Haas team, we have uh, Red Bull, we have, uh, I think, AlphaTauri is the one seat left. And then you have the uh, Aston Martin. If you want to say equal chances for everybody, where do you think Hulkenberg would be suited best? I tell you what, I'm going to interrupt you for just a second. We'll get back to this discussion because it's okay, something... We've got three hours and 15 minutes and I'll discuss this one because there's lots of ways we can go with this. But decision has just come down from race control. Mark McCormack, HM Engineering, drive through penalty as a result of that contact that we saw. And this is going to drop them then at least 60 seconds behind Bendley Gods. This is... This is a disaster for HM Engineering. We can't understell this right now, Weihan. They've gone from being in with a chance of fighting for the win at the end of the race to now having to overcome a 60 plus p penalty, sorry, 60 second plus penalty that he's going to have to come down and serve in the next two laps. I'm just watching now as uh, race control is, is trying to get that assigned in the server as well to tell McCormack that he's got to come down and serve that. But 159 has had their race shaken up. Yeah, well, this is just unfortunate for for for, for the uh, of course, first of all, for, for drivers who were involved in the incident. But you know, this is just going to throw a spanner into the works of things for for the HM engineering guys because you know, they've been they've been fighting so hard all night long, and you know, this is probably going to be the next hurdle that these guys have to overcome you know, in order to remain in contention for a, a, at least a good result in this. So. You know, whether or not, so is he, is he going to go, you know, perhaps going to the pits and do his um, penalty this time by? Yes, he does yeah, so. Yeah. And yeah, this is just the unfortunate start to you know, his uh, penalty stint here. And there goes the Bentley Gods then. Trevor Pastrami retakes GTE race lead as Mark McCormack has to go at that pedestrian 60 kilometers an hour. When you're down on pit lane, it feels like he could literally walk faster than that car. But he's got to make his way all the way from the bus stop down pit lane to the exit, which where it rejoins right now. You'll see Bentley Gods coming over the top of Radion. There you see the white line, which marks the re-entry line for cars exiting the pit lane. A big shakeup there. And that is a very interesting call. I must be honest there, Lorenzo. I mean, I mean, you're just saying that in the chat as well. We talked about the Z4 slowing to almost a crawl under braking there, and unfortunately McCormack has, has been, you know, strung up on, on a charge where maybe he really didn't deserve the penalty. Maybe a little bit of a racing incident, uh, but unfortunately, I guess race control have viewed it from the perspective of you always have to pass the car safely, and, you know, McCormack at the end of the day, I guess, does initiate the contact. He does initiate the contact. Here's the thing. Uh, I'll say this more of a perspective of sim racing. I would be fuming right now. I probably would finish that stint and give it to somebody else. And that's probably what's going to happen to Mark McCormack. Because that, I would have I would have done that, to be very honest. As we're looking on the replay with the uh, ninth place in the GT3 category. As they come down into Puhan. 
another is in in as that's again the same in the that's again repair X. Uh, Patrick Schmidt just spinning out and then uh, taking himself away. But I think that is the incident right after the pit stop uh, yes. where he got the touch. No, that is. I am trying to go back right now and, and bring up a replay of the initial ah, okay. contact that we saw. You, uh, unfortunately, now it becomes a bit tough given the length of time that has passed. Yeah. But there you can see. But anyway. You, you can see that the penalty and the damage it's done to HM Engineering. Pit lane time. 59.7 seconds so just under a minute spent trundling down the pit lane and there you can see the gap now to the race leader Trevor Pastrami 42 seconds so unfortunately for HM Engineering penalties are penalties race controls decision is final and good to see McCormack down on the lane as soon as that penalty was handed down no complaints no uh, objections and, and good to see. We do have a few replays to take a look at though. We will take a look at them while we were discussing this drama that's unfolding at the front of the GTE battle. This is down into the final corner and this is a Corvette C8R going around the bus stop chicane and not losing it on the entry to the corner, losing it on the second part, taking a bit too much of that curb, losing the rear end. We'll take another look at a different incident that occurred. This is for Christoph Montz who is leading the race in the number 66 Phoenix Racing Esport Green down into the final corner as well. And forgets that he had to come down the pit lane that time around. A lot, a late change of direction to be able to get the car onto pit lane. And fortunate there that he didn't get stranded on this very, very long lap way on. Because that would have been a tow that would have given up the one lap advantage that the 66 has managed to build up. Well, that was quite interesting to look at, but you know, it's just great that he made his way into the pit. So, let's go have a look at the replay from his cockpit and see how exactly he attacked the corner. So, as you would take the corner in, but oh, oh, oh we, I got to pit it and turn in, and yep, he got it in very nicely. Nearly came into contact with the wall there, but just got in in the nick of time, and he's in for his scheduled stop. I have a meme for that. An F1 meme for that. I wish I could make a clip out of this and make an F1 meme out of this. Well, you are welcome because to make a meme out of it. I just don't think that Christoph Montz is going to appreciate that too much. <laughs> I'm sorry, because it is that stereotypical, you know, out, stay out, then you get called to go in with like one split second later. And this is one of the th interesting things about the pit entry of Spa, that you, it is kind of like a wide open into a very narrow part rally-esque uh pit entry that you can go as unsafely as possible because let's just say if, if you do that at any other track in i racing most likely you're gonna, you're gonna get a, a, a pit a pit entry unsafe penalty unsafe pit entry penalty in spa you can abuse it and get away with it basically oh, that's a very good point in fact you've seen I think that number 66 on a number of occasions do the very same thing, but things settling down once again then as we're through a pit stop phase of the race right now. A number of cars down on pit lane. Uh, second and third in LMP2 have just come out of the box. Mike Arang still behind the wheel for the number, to, number 71 as he comes across the start finish line once again. Let's try and take a look at the gap then between second and third place now up to a full 60 seconds and down in the pit lane the last time around they did the same thing just a bit more fuel being placed into the number 71's fuel tank as he makes his way down on the run from la source in towards eau rouge and radion but just over nine hours still to go let's get back to the topic at hand there lorenzo we were talking about hulkenberg and you know, his seat in yeah. F1. And this is something as well that someone in our YouTube chat was discussing as well. You know, there's a potential open seat and, and maybe the only seat still left open on the grid, uh, grid, in fact, is the one at the Red Bull Racing Team. And, you know, it, it's going to be an interesting call how the Red Bull Team want to manage this because you've got four drivers, all who still, I'm sure, want to be in F1. You've got Max Verstappen, Alex Albon, Pierre Gasly, Daniel Kvyat. You've got a few names on the outside looking in, the likes of Sergio Perez, Nico Hulkenberg, but then you've also got the Red Bull Academy, and it's not just some of the younger guys like we see on the iRacing Esports Network. We've got Jack Crawford 
Red Bull F4 driver making his way through those driver ranks. But the one that's been rumored with a linked move to uh, F1 potentially is Yuki Tsunoda. Currently drives in the F2 series. Would be good to see him make the step up into action as HM Engineering. What has happened to Mark McCormack coming out of Stavolo 2? He has spun the car and disaster. It goes from bad to worse for McCormack. And as he crawls his way back up to racing speed, let's take a look at the RaceBot TV replay. What is going to happen? It's potentially a, a lapped car that gets involved there. That's the 68 of... Oh no, don't tell me. The sister car of your race leader. And oh, that is just a messy, messy move there. I do not understand how that what that LMP2 was even trying to do. Let's take a look at this one in slow motion. You'll see the LMP2 clatter the curve, not even near the apex of the corner, runs all the way wide, off the track in fact, and forces McCormack into the tire barriers. That Corvette not looking too good anymore. Unfortunately though, it just goes from bad to worse, and the incidents continue to pile up for the 159. Not not a good sight at all, and you know it's just kind of yeah. yet another another item on on the list of things to forget for the HM engineering guys tonight, and, and that's pitting. just going to really set um, McCormack. He's 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 gone into the pits now, and we we're just having a look at how the contact occurred. So it was just a matter of the LMP2, you know, deviating from his inside line a little too early, and I guess the lack of awareness caused that contact to happen, and it was very much uh, for McCormack. A straight trajectory into the wall and then bouncing back out to the other side. But he was able to stop uh, the car from going to the inside wall in time, so that could have saved that saved him from additional damage. And you know, his recovery drive is now just uh, I think it, it bothers a lot. <laughs> quite quite depressing at this point. Yeah, I think he's, he took some significant damage from that, Lorenzo. Let's uh, jump on board quickly with the 68. Take a look as he tries yeah. to throw it down the inside. There you'll see the curb clap. Uh, a cut rather but you can see uh, he's got all four tires on the left side of that white line I mean race control was handed down the penalty for the 159 expecting a similar one to come down on the 160 on 68 yeah it's it's one of these tricky things you're gonna see as he goes down into Kuf Pro Frere the, the he clips the curve and the curve kind of kind of throws him away it, it, it just says no you're not going to clip that curve uh, fully and say that inside line makes the number 68 be bounced off into the mid part of the turn and it kind of hits the 159 out of the track and and the worst thing is it's not the first incident we've seen and absolutely the uh car from hm engineering has suspension damage because it is, it's going to be more than a minute. I'm probably going to say this is a five-minute pit stop easily. Well, let's keep an eye out then as HM Engineering and McCormack wait and take that repairs to their car. Massive shame for HM Engineering. An outfit that continues to go from strength to strength. Competing in a number of series on RaceSpot TV and the iRacing Esports Network. And McCormack has already been in his box for 90 seconds upwards. He's now gone a lap down, unfortunately, from the race leader. And this has ruined what really was proving to be the only battle that we'd had for a lead in class. As McCormack continues to just wait there, stricken on pit lane. Lorenzo, you've summed it up best. HM Engineering cannot get a break in this one. Yeah, it's 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 weird, you know. Uh, we've seen multiple times in team engineering in SEO, uh, Neo 24-hour series. Oh, luckily for Mark Cormac, he's just get out of the pits, and so it isn't a five-minute pit as I was fearing he probably would have, but probably went for the optionals as well. He's gonna be a lap down. He's already a lap down to the Bentley gods. Um, and again, would the inferior McCormack even more? But I, it's one of those things, you know, um, engines racing. And furthermore, we've seen HM Engineering always in these prime spots, you know, to get victories and in, in top five results. And something, and I mean, always something happens to them. Either get, they crash, they get crashed out by a faster car or they crash out with a slower car and their car is basically toast. So there's always something of bad luck happening to HM Engineering. Well, fortunately for them, I think, the third place car in class, Prism Sim Racing, just dived down onto the pit lane. So it still looks as though they're holding on to, I would think, 
probably a good two plus minute gap for the 159 crew. So as we click on, tick on towards the top of another hour, just over nine hours to go. And it is starting to get slightly brighter out there, Weihan. And I don't know if you guys can tell this now, but at least from my perspective and the coverage that the viewers are getting to see, uh, it does appear as though... Uh, sun's not rising by any stretch of the imagination, but definitely the amount of brightness in the air continues to pick up, and that's not just the uh, headlights as they illuminate the track around them. There is definite brightness starting to come towards spa Francorchamps. Yeah, I think I'm seeing a little bit of it, like, you know, those kind of um, amb ambient lighting. Yeah, I, but although, uh, you know, at, at this point in time, it is 3 in the morning, sim time. So, uh, I think a proper sunrise might not really happen until perhaps uh, around probably approximately two hours time. Uh, but that's certainly something very interesting to see. So, um, of course, uh, if you look at McCor uh, McCormack, at this point, he's, he's currently second in class and you know, unfortunately the damage that has been done to him, he is now uh, 3 minutes and 47 seconds behind uh, Trevor Pastrami and that is, you know, I think if it's, if it's not demoralizing that I don't know what it is. Yeah, I'm sure it's pretty demoralizing. I mean, the only upside, if you want to look at it that way, is the fact that they've got basically a full lap. I was right, just over two minutes is the gap then between second and third place in that GTE class. There is the car that's just come out of pit lane, the Prism Sim Racing Alpha Crew, and their Porsche 911 RSR chasing down the Ferrari of the 152 online simracing.de. Lorenzo, you were, you're saying, you're commentating on a race at Spa-Francorchamps just a few weeks ago. You were saying that while we are in the virtual September, which I think some people might think indicates a slightly later sunrise than you would in the summer months and that we usually see in the traditional spa 24 hours what are you expecting to see in terms of the sunrise in iRacing it's obviously a, a dynamic model and the iRacing team have yeah. spent a lot of time working on that model but what do you think we're going to get to see in terms of when the first hints of light start shining on the track well, last week, I did, well, this is funny, I didn't commentate the race last week. Last week, I think last week was the real life race, and were two weeks ago. So, interesting, interestingly, uh, the night is longer because it starts earlier than night time. So, it, it gets darker really quickly. You get about 12 hours uh, of night time. So, full light, it's around, well, you said 6, 7 a.m. It is accurate. But sunlight, you start to get that in about an hour and a half, roughly. So expect sunlight to start to appear in the track, not in full swing, right about 4.30 a.m. In, in the sim time. And then full sunrise since, uh, around 6 a.m. roughly, 6.15 roughly. All right, so we may see some sunlight before we hand it over to the final six hours of the broadcast. Just ticked over. One more hour done. So eight hours, 58 minutes left on the clock as cars continue to work their way around the track. We do have a few retirements, unfortunately. We got three of them out of the 40 that started the race. And fortunately, haven't seen any retirements since we jumped in to the broadcast three hours ago. Broadcast team right now, myself, Arjuna Kankipati, joined by Lorenzo Bonder and Wei Han Chan. Three more hours to go before we hand you over to the very capable voices of David Haynes and Thomas Davis when Hugo Luis will get back behind the production booth as well, continuing his monster stint on the broadcast. 18 hours Hugo will have done of racing action, including the one hour of qualifying. That will be 19 hours of total broadcast here. In the 24 hours of Spa, powered by h &R and Molno Motorsports. It's time then for another Race Spot TV fan immersion. And I'm just trying to take a look at the, f at the field here right now, guys. I have a feeling, actually before we go to Race Spot fan immersion, it appears as though there's been an issue. Who is that? That is Simsa Esports GT3 Scott Brazier. Seems to be stuck trying to rejoin the track on the inside of Malmedy. What's happened here? Lorenzo, I have a feeling this is going to be some deja vu. 
Yeah, here we go. As he comes into the lagoon, now right hand side, left hand side, he goes into the curb, and yeah, another one, number three. Three and three hours. It could be worse. We we've seen, uh, for example, you think of the race bot cone. That poor thing gets killed basically every lap when we go to Le Mans. Um, fortunately, these corners haven't had too much of an abuse as you see the Simsa car staying safe when it comes to the rejoin. You see some lap traffic working his way around. The sister Simsa car diving past T3 Esports on its fight back. Gustas Grinbergas on a charge right now. Two minutes one. Yeah. Nine four four. the last lap time for Gustas. That was six tenths of a second faster than the first place car and about two seconds faster than every other car in this class right now. So Simsa Esport. Yeah. GT3 car might be having a few issues, but the LMP2 well and truly on a charge. So I tell you what, RaceBot TV fan immersion. Let's jump on board then with the number six and Gustas Grinsbergas. Let's take a look then at a couple laps of Spa Francochamps on board with the European Le Mans driver. Well, before we do that, um, uh, uh, apparently the Simsa car is due for a pit stop, so we'll switch to another car and give you some race bot fan immersion. It's not really the funnest times trundling down the pit lane and getting up to racing speed once again. Let's jump on board then with T3 Esports Mike Arang, the car that Simsa was just trying to get around. A few laps on board then with T3 Esports in the number 71.
So another few laps on board. One of your teams in the H&R 24 hours of Spa, powered by Mulner Motorsports. That was a few laps on board with Mike Arang and the number 71 T3 Esports machine. While we were under fan immersion, by the way, another issue. Let's go ahead and take a look at a replay as a car came down onto pit lane. We've seen a number of issues as cars maybe forget <laughs> that they have to come down into their box and four, the number 179... Not forgetting like we saw the leading LMP2 car doing a while ago, Lorenzo, but still getting that a little bit wrong. The 170 car compromising a bit on the entry and, and losing a bit of time as they work their way down on the box. And luckily he didn't get spun, flipped around because if you clip that inside part of the, uh, the wall on the entry, it is quite infamous. It has become quite of a meme sometimes that the, the car just decides to flip out of nowhere because the car just decides to grind up the wall and then it flips over because you have no traction whatsoever on your car. But it does happen from time to time. As right now, we have the battle between OnlineSkinRacing.de and uh, Prism Skin Racing Alpha. Yeah, this is a battle that we were watching as Prism came out of pit lane. Of course, these two cars a step closer to the second step on the podium as a result of the issues for HM Engineering. While we were also in Racebot Fan Immersion, by, by the way, a pass for P8 overall. The Prism sister car was on a charge, and there you can see getting the position from, I believe, that's the number 77 who had an issue there. We'll take a look at a Racebot TV of exactly what happened for Richard uh, Finkseller, as you can see coming through the Lacombe chicane, getting onto the grass on the right-hand side, and fortunate there to not spear himself off into the tire barrier. He's going to collect it all up and get it back on track, but he loses a whole heap of time. About 12 seconds was the time lost, and that drops him down the order, down into ninth position as things stand. We'll take one more look at this replay, Weihan, but... Night is starting to become an issue, I think, for some of these drivers, and they'll be hoping for those first rays of sunshine that Lorenzo was mentioning just a few moments ago. Yeah, I think some, sometimes it's just difficult to get an idea of how how you know, how, how limited the, the, the visual is, especially when you're racing at night. You know, because from, from TV camera, you can see so many cars and all the headlights around, and most of the track does look well lit up, but when you're in the car itself, it is kind of different, you know, you, 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 you can't exactly see too far ahead. Now we're with uh, this, this is, uh, I would imagine, a Prism Sim Racing car who's made the overtaking move on that Ferrari and that's a very, very good move. Oh, Ooh. that's a bit of a, well, that was a bit jumpy there as, as he took uh, the, the, the chicane there. Yeah, and he's now, chicane. he's now set himself up for that Ferrari to potentially have a fight back, but 152 a little bit too far behind maybe just playing the smart game with eight hours and 43 minutes still to run so position change then for third place in the gte class let's take a look then the top eight standings as the lights flash from the two gte cars making their way around one of those slower gt3 machines but start by doing a top eight rundown and let's flip things around this time around lorenzo you're taking the gt3 class all right, okay. So, yes, yeah, still have Familian Bomber in the lead uh, with about four laps of advantage in comparison to Absolute Motorsport, Aslet Design, and Fiziak, the Sim Racing GT3 Poro is in third. German Sim Racing Performance is in fourth. Fifth place goes to Team RaceGitter.de. Albrecht Motorsports is in sixth. Muna Motorsports Sim Racing Black is in 7th, and then running out the top 8 is Wolf Motorsports Sim Racing Lupus. So that is GT3. I do wonder, by the way, it's been bugging me since we joined this broadcast stint. Is that meant to be Team Race Glitter, or is Race Gitter something that I don't understand? Nevertheless, that is the GT3 standing. Let's take a look at GTE, which has had a bunch of changes. Weihan, run us down the order. So of course we do have Bentley Gods uh, leading the GTE field and unfortunately for HM Engineering they have been dropped one position down, you know, they, we've seen them fighting so hard all night long. They're in second, one lap behind Bentley Gods. And from third onwards, we they are two laps behind. Uh, in third is Prism Sim Racing Alpha and in fourth is Online Sim Racing.de. 
Currently in fifth is Race Union and in sixth Austrian Sim Racers are uh, Rot. Sorry. Uh, in seventh is Ringfield Set Sim Racing GTE, and in eighth will be Milner Motorsport Sim Racing Group. So that's the GT standing shaken up by difficulties for the HM Engineering team and Mark McCormack. LMP2 then. And would you look at that? The gap has started to come down between first and second. No longer does the Phoenix Racing team have a full lapse buffer on the rest of your field. The number eight ring physiet sim racing LMP2 car. Andreas Almansberger at the wheel right now chasing down Christoph Montz and the 66. We've seen the 66 take a number of risky moves and they slowly starting to hurt that car more than it helps them, I would say. T3 Esports and Mike Arang running in third place, one lap down. They're about 75 seconds behind second place as things stand and they'll be hoping to close that gap to the two cars in front of them as well. WS Racing Esports Magenta, three laps down in fourth place with Angry Bull Racing just 23 seconds behind them. The fight back for Simsa Esports continues with Gustas Grinbergas pushing that car to the ragged edge as he extracts some phenomenal performance from the number six. Mulner Motorsport Sim Racing Pro, the number 21. And then Prism Sim Racing Beta, the end of the top eight. There's been an issue while we're running down the order once again. And before we get on to some of the topics that we were talking about before, some of the excitement <laughs> burst upon us with HM Engineering. First getting in contact, then getting a penalty. Then getting more contact with an LMP2 car, so lots of drama in GTE. But let's take a look then at this replay down into the bus stop chicane. And this is Fent Albrecht, the namesake of Albrecht Motorsports. And oh my. Oh, that, that's that's the three. In, that is way. Mike Arang. Yep, that is the third place car in your class. It was also for the 137 who was at the rear end of this train. Let's jump on board with him. I think he... Goes a little bit deep into the corner, potentially gets caught out here from the cars as they get checked up. And yep, he has to slam on the anchors for just a second. Fortunate to not take any any damage there, but Lorenzo, let's take another look at this replay. A bit of an interesting incident from the 71. Not really what you expect from the LMP2 car there. Yeah, he, he kind of expected Albrecht to go into the outside part of the lane, uh, into the, I would say, the normal line uh, for Albrecht, but I think Albrecht just decided to uh, give room for the normal line to be ran by the LMP2 and you can see kind of a wild run uh, back into the track losing a little bit of time and possibly damaging the floor out of that Z4 GT3 but you can see now over here on the cockpit view as he goes into the inside part of the lane you see the LMP2 and he tries to come back around confusing the LMP2 in the process it, it's it's interesting. I could I could see a, po a possible punishment being handed down to uh, T three, but again, we it's I would say it's a fifty fifty in my opinion. To be very honest, we'll see what happens there with race control taking a look. Interesting that Albrecht struggled to figure out how to get back onto the track. He saw the uh, hesitation as he completed the world's longest track rejoin. Another issue occurring while we were watching that replay. This is for Matthew Giddens in the Ferrari for 11.9 Simsport, and he's been clipped at the rear as he lost the rear end of the car at Pujan. And that is a big, big crash then for a Ferrari. And you can see as he's trying to get back on track, I wonder how much damage he's got from that one there, Weihan. Yeah, so just have a look at the replay. And it was... Um... Well, I, I I would imagine that the, the damage had been, you know, it, it would probably be more down to uh, the arrow damage. But this is him going around Puhon and... Oh, it would be very close to call because oh, you know, wow. there was a wall contact right after the car contact. So I think there's a chance he might have uh, messed his uh, right rear suspension up and it would be big grounds for a pit stop. So I'm trying to figure out right now which of the Chevy Corvettes was that. So Pete Snake, there we go. That is the Corvette that came up from behind. Let's take a look on board with him then. Because he came up on the scene of the accident. So here it comes, coming around the Bruxelles corner into No Name, the left-hander. On the run down in towards Pujon Corner. You can see the LMP2 car to the inside of the Ferrari. 
And for Snake, an innocent bystander as the Ferrari is going to lose the car on the entry, carrying too much speed and nowhere for him to go. And you can see he tried to avoid at the last second, Lorenzo, but again, not enough time. And unfortunately for Snake, that is an unfortunate incident that's... It's not been an easy day for the 142 by any stretch of the imagination, and that just continues mm. to add to the difficult day. Yeah, it's it's been a problematic day for that Valkyrie e-racing green car, especially for a car that uh, has Lorenzo, kind of a Lorenzo, sorry, I'm cutting you off. Oh, go ahead. What has happened to the overall race leader? This is coming out of Puhan down into the Fania Chicane. The number 66 car has had another issue. We talk about the risk versus reward. And with a two-minute lead, Christoph Mons has managed to spin that car once again. RaceBot TV replay becoming a regular occurrence here now in this H&R 24 hours of Spa race. Looking to the outside, don't tell me that's your GT3 leader as well. They've got in contact with each other. And that is disaster for two cast leaders as they manage to take each other out. I do not understand. Here's the thing. Uh, you can see as they go midway through Buhan, the Zep4 just gives a little bit of a room on the outside, but I th the Zep4 of Familian bomb pushes there, up a bit. Just decided to go into into the line. Yeah, he pushes he pushes the LMP2 off, which is not an not an usual thing to see. That is a bizarre incident. Let's take one more look at that if we can from a slightly better angle, maybe in slow motion as well. Weihan, this is disaster. I mean, you cannot afford to do things like this. I mean, this is just clumsy driving. I, I don't think you can place too much blame on the 66 in this occasion, trying to just go around the outside at Puhon, but there you can see cars having to scatter to miss your race leader, as your GT3 leader is also stricken on the inside of the track. What is going on here at Spa-Francorchamps? Yeah, you know, you can just see, you know, one, one, you know, one regular incident becoming such a costly one because, you know, of course, involving the race leaders, and you know, it has unfortunately led to, you know, perhaps both of them going into the pits, and this is going to throw things into a spiral of works for uh, the lead that these two drivers have. So it is a very, very costly one indeed, and you know, it's also caused the other guns to have to take evasive action. You know, some uh, going doing that one X off track to avoid that, so it was quite a, you know, quite, quite a nasty one. Yeah, so that is a... <laughs> We'll see what happens with that when race control. Race control proving to be busy in this portion of the race as we jump back to live pictures and the 66 down on pit lane. Is Christoph Montz going to get out of the car? Who's going to jump in? You can see this is a long... This is not going to help their cause as well. I, Never mind, not a driver change. So just maybe Montz getting out of the car for a second. Just 30 seconds on the pit lane there. So a regular stop for the number 66. But big drama as they've lost a whole chunk of time to the number 8 car continues to charge up towards the number 66. Lorenzo, this is major, major drama. Yeah, this is major drama, but luckily for them, uh, Race Fiat uh, just decided to come into the pit lane, so that time loss will be minimal for them, luckily. So, Mont back out on track. As he works his way down into Brussels' corner. Lorenzo, just a quick question for you quickly. I mean, risk versus reward. It's been something I've harped on over the last three hours. Yep. I mean, if you're that number 66 car, do you need to be looking to the outside of Puhan? Especially given that you're really trying to come from quite far behind, I think, in some ways. Yes, you could have made the move pass, but again, risk versus reward. When is it smart? It's smart. All right. Here, it's, there's two ways for you to play smart. All right. First and foremost is you to be patient and you build up this quite lengthy lead like you have right now one minute and 40 seconds they had to to ring feet so it with that you can play nice nice and easily and uh, be very patient you can afford to lose a second what is a second in comparison to a second place uh, if you have a minute gap to someone else the second smart play is if you're trying to battle for a position, you try to use the traffic towards your advantage. You know, to try to gain a second or or uh, or make or even more, depending on how hard you're fighting and and when on you're fighting in the race. If it is towards the end of the race, most specifically, if you if you play that the card smart and you play it cleanly, 
it's okay. That's the thing you want. But in that instance, that wasn't smart driving at all, in my opinion. Not at all. So, Christoph Mont's back out on track. He's already done a lap after coming down onto pit lane. Another driver down on pit lane, by the way. T3 Esports and Mike Garang from third place on track. As he trundles his way down in towards his box. We're riding on board with the number 66. Clean air in front. And this will be a welcome relief. For a team that has led the majority of this race. And has had a lot of success. Making some risky moves. Unfortunately there. Getting caught out by the lap traffic. And Mont won't be too happy with that. The gap too. Omensberger, the number 8 behind, by the way, is still holding steady about a minute and 50 seconds. So, not too much time lost for the number 66 car, and that is the important thing. While we're riding on board, by the way, Irang has passed over to Brio, so there's some interesting strategy here. And that T3 Esports car continues to lose time in pit lane, actually, and Weihan... I mean, they've done a driver change now, but once again, on a longer stop as compared to the cars in front. When we jumped into the broadcast booth, that T3 Esports car was pushing to take away second place from the number 8. They're about to drop to about uh, almost a full lap behind the number 8 car at this rate. So the dead of night is clearly not being as nice and friendly to the number 71 car right now. Yeah, very much so. I, uh, so I, I, yeah, I think it's very much of uh, a whole shuffle, you know. I, I think that the, the, the order of cars have uh, shuffled around for quite a fair bit. So, um, of course, they, they are down to third at this point, as, as you just mentioned. Marcus Brioche in the car at this point. And, you know, it. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, they, they, they need some more, uh, I think he, need, he requires a bit more time to, to kind of regain his pace. So, you know, we, we can also attribute it to tyres, though, because we, we did mention before that on this track, the tyre wear does kind of go a little crazier. So drivers who do decide to perhaps double stint, triple stint their tyres, it could lead to them uh, being slow in pace. We'll see how it plays out then in this next portion of the race just ticked over another half an hour time is starting to fly by once again it was a little bit of a uh, a little bit slower paced when we first jumped into the broadcast booth but action picking up as we head in towards the morning hours we're gonna approach golden hour very shortly as well when the first beams of sunlight hit the track the cold temperatures still hang over this long racetrack and some of the fastest lap times that you're going to see I'm going to get set in that golden hour period of the race. Let's jump back then, guys, to a discussion that we were having slightly earlier on. Uh, it feels like a while ago, given the amount of uh, chaos that we've seen, I think, in the last 30 minutes. We'll watch on screen, by the way, a battle between third and fourth place as online sim racing have lost touch just slightly of the Prism Sim Racing Porsche in front of them, but they continue to work to try and close the gap. But let's jump back to our, our conversation about what you would do effectively if you were Helmut Marko and in, in charge of the Red Bull drivers program. You've got two F1 teams, four seats up for grabs. I think one seat, I think, let's be real here. One seat gets reserved for, what's that guy's name? Uh, oh, uh, yes, Max Verstappen. Max Verstappen gets one of your Red Bull racing seats. So you've got a second drive up for grabs, potentially. Alex Albon currently has that contract. We'll see what happens to him. You've got the two Toro Rosso drivers, Pierre Gasly, obviously, not Toro Rosso, Alpha Tauri, as they are now this season. Pierre Gasly, obviously, confirmed in for next year's F1 season, but the question mark remains over Kvyat's place in the team and potentially about the addition of Sonoda to the F1 paddock, or if you've got the likes of maybe Perez or, or Hulkenberg stepping into that Red Bull seat. And Lorenzo, we'll get back to you because you've been chomping at the bit. This has been something that we've been trying to discuss for a while now. What would you do if you're Helmut Marco and you've got four seats in F1 to give to the four most talented drivers you can pick? What are you going to do? All right. Uh, I start then? Yes, go okay. for it. All right. All right. Let me start for Let me start then. If I am to pick drivers for next season i think uh the best seat available for hulkenberg might be haas at the moment because haas first and foremost 
they're getting away of Magnuson and Grosjean, so they're probably going to save about a billion dollars in car repairs over here. Shots sorry, fired Roman. by Lorenzo Bonder. Shots fired. Sorry, uh, sorry, people from RVG, don't, don't, don't kill me yet. Please. You're just gonna lose all but, your inside access to that team at this rate, Lorenzo. No, nah, I still have my, I still have my inside access of sorts. I know like three drivers, three or four drivers personally from their team. I'm kind of safe at that moment. Uh, but uh, here's the thing: uh, Haas probably they're gonna get a new engineer, like a new chef engineer, because their current one just. Didn't manage to get the braking problems worked out throughout this whole season, so I expect a come up of Haas the next season. That is a good chance, and then Hulkenberg probably would have the number one seat for that team. Problem for Alpha Tower, you have Gasly just on a tear. Like he got P4 disqualified, basically nearly setting himself for podium positions. And you still have a battle between Tsunoda and Sergio Sete Camara, which is a reserve driver. And he has a chance to actually make it in. And in Red Bull, I think the problem is you're probably going to get someone from um, AlphaTauri, uh, or one of the top drivers, and uh, maybe retain Albon for next season. You retain him, giving one more shot. And then just say, all right, Albon, this is your last chance. Otherwise, we might bring Gasly in or whoever, if it is Sonata or Kamara in. It's it's it, it's interesting. For me, best option has to be Haas because you would lose probably all prestige and even the possibility of getting good results in in uh, in the AlphaTauri because you're going to be relegated so bad, bad. But you would have a good car regardless. The problem is... You lose the Honda engine next season. You get Renault back, so it, it's it's an interesting it's an interesting scenario to be played out. It is, and you know, uh, I'm gonna quickly just jump in before I hand the baton over to you, Weihan. I think this is one of the most difficult calls that you have in all of racing because we can't forget Daniel Kvyat actually was often a stronger driver than Daniel Ricciardo in the season that he had with the Red Bull team and I think his confidence has been often shaken by some of the rumors and changes within that Red Bull team and, and not always ha helped his development. That's what I'm trying to say. And, you know, I, I think when you hear Pierre Gasly talk and, and the way he talks about his mindset having improved now that he's part of the AlphaTauri team once again, it's clear but the Red Bull team is obviously pushing for championships and as a result, uh, a very cutthroat environment, whereas the, the Alpha Tauri team is a, it's a scrappy squad trying to make the most of somewhat limited resources. I mean, it's the Red Bull team, so uh, as limited as resources can be given that you have two F1 teams, but seems to be a better place for a driver to develop. And both Gasly, well, Gasly has shone since coming back to Alpha Tauri. I wonder if Albon would end up having a similar path, and that maybe opens up the door for the likes of Perez and Hulkenberg to jump in to that Red Bull second seat, given that they have that more that much more experience compared to some of the competitors. Now, given that said, that means that you now have maybe four or five uh, drivers fighting over the two seats for at Alpha Tauri, and obviously one of them already being given to the. Uh, Pierre Gasly, as you see the GT3 in front, flashing the lights, indicating that the Ferrari should make its way on through down into Puhong Corner. But honestly, I think it's going to be a shame if Yuki Tsunoda does not end up in F1 next year. I mean, what a talented driver he is proving to be. And, uh, you know, Red Bulls Academies, I think he might be their top prospect right now. But they've got some other names as well. Igor Fraga, who competes on a certain other simulator and has been increasingly stepping into the real world. Delighted to see the success that Fraga has been mm -hmm. having, especially in New Zealand as well. But I think what I would say then is you got Verstappen and let's go with, let's go with Hulkenberg. Hulkenberg gets the sleet. And then if we're talking about the, the Alpha Tauri situation, ooh, this is tough. Do I go Albon or do I go Sonoda? I think I'm going to go Sonoda because I, I really think Alex Albon, it's a very talented driver, but I really want to see Sonoda up in the top level. What about you, Weihan? It's Lorenzo and I have pontificated enough. Now it's your turn. Well, look, I, I'm still really undecided, but I, I think it's 
question on, on, on their hands is probably, you know, uh, how, how uh, I think it's about balancing, you know, taking either direction, you know, do, do you want to work with, uh, I guess, do you want to make, make the most out of your, the, the existing drivers that you have, you know, understanding that, you know, perhaps the, the drivers out, 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 out on the grid now, they've already, you know, perhaps, <laughs> perhaps to IndyCar, yeah, that, that could be a possibility, but yeah, the, the current, um, the drivers, though, we've, we've kind of seen some of them shine in the past, like Albon and, um, Kvyat as well as uh, currently uh, that will be Pierre Gasly, but I think you know when, when you do give uh, drivers you know who, who haven't had the the, the, the chance of getting their feet wet in Formula One, you know, take take Sonoda for example. If you if you do give them an opportunity and you know I think that's when you can then see some new things happening. And you know for that reason, I, I would you know I would re uh, like you guys I would like to see uh, Sonoda up in the Formula One grid. You know most likely Alpha Tauri. Uh, with that said, also I think it would be a popular choice if people would also go for uh, if Red Bull would go for um, Nico Hulkenberg uh, in in place of one of their drivers because I think you know we 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 do kind of agree that you know despite Hulkenberg being all being experienced and all and you know not having unfortunately been been unable to make a podium, you know I think if if we do if we do see him back back in Formula One with uh, the newer cars nowadays, you know, I think we might just see something different. Yeah, I think it's all and also, if I may approach one more thing, do you guys see Hamilton renewing for next season? Well, I was because he hasn't renewed yet. And there's some some new rumors that popped up today about Hamilton. I'm not sure if you saw this, uh, Lorenzo, but you know, part oh. of the cost cap discussion that's going on in F1 is uh, potentially that you're going to limit the driver's salary to 40 million. I think it was pounds across two different drivers now. Lewis Hamilton makes yeah. almost that much just by himself. So it'll be interesting for him as he approaches the next phase of his contract negotiation. Does he try and front load that contract to try and make as much money as he can before that cost cap goes in and he goes down to a more reasonable salary, you know, still in the 20, 25 millions. That's a reasonable yeah. salary for, for uh, an F1 driver, I guess. But, you know, I, I don't think it's just Hamilton that's, that's interesting here. I think the more interesting seats, Lorenzo, is... Uh, we'll watch a shot down at the source of a number of cars making their way around a uh, turn number one. I think the more interesting discussion is uh, now that there are more and more seats in the mid-pack starting to get signed, sealed, and delivered, if you were. I mean, there's a big conversation that must be had about some of the developments at some of these other teams. You talk about uh, famous names. Uh, well, we're at Spa-Francorchamps, and the move that... I always think about when I come back to this track is Mika Hakkinen and Michael Schumacher, F1 Grand Prix at Spa, the year 2000, Mika Hakkinen and Michael Schumacher splitting a lapped car, choosing either direction down the Camel Straight, and Mika Hakkinen roaring into the race lead, using that traffic as a pick. And, well, the reason I bring that up, one famous Schumacher has had a lot of success here in the Belgian yeah. forests, and, well, it's sounding like a, another young... Schumacher, uh, this time Mick, uh, obviously son of Michael, is looking to potentially line up a move to be in the uh, Haas outfit for next year, which obviously uses the Ferrari engines and Mick being part of the Ferrari Young Drivers Academy. That might be a very interesting opportunity to see a driver who's very quickly been making the steps up through competition. He's not been spending, you know, multiple years in any series. He's going from strength to strength to strength and having some impressive performances now in uh, the top junior series and potentially getting a shot in F1 next year. He is going to be testing that Haas F1 car in the next few uh, races, I do believe. That'll be an opportunity to see what kind of strength Mick has uh, in his first run in F1 car. Yes, it's an interesting thing, I know, uh, to be very honest. I didn't mention the second seating because I can, can kind of clinch Mick being in Haas. Because they still have the technical partnership between uh, Ferrari and and uh, the Haas Engineering Group, Automotive Group, to be very honest. Uh, so there is a good chance of, I would say, 95% chance of seeing Mick in that Haas team. He just needs to get the certain license, if I recall correctly. But it is a talent that should be overlooked, uh, should be looked at properly. I, I did not see him being, being hired to Ferrari until 2024 until he has to prove himself first if he actually can keep up in F1 and I think he actually can keep up uh, he has just needs to put the results where now we're seeing this gap battle 
we were seeing this gap battle between Simsa and the WS uh, Racing Sports Magenta. But once again, Simsa with a masterful uh, stint because they managed to grab one spot up. But it's, it's an interesting scenario to be developed. I think there is a lot of young talents to be talked about. 2021 might not be the funnest, uh, the most fun season. We're still going to see the Mercedes dominance. I think one team that is going to be having a major surge is McLaren because they're going to have the Mercedes engine now moving forward. But 2022, man, I really want I, I really want 2022 to arrive because it is the unpredictable year. Like all contracts are due. All contracts are due in 2022. And a big rules shakeup as well. So big changes expected in the Formula One paddock in a few years time. Interesting to see some of the driver changes next year. Ferrari. Charles Leclerc, Leclerc and Carlos Sainz. How will they team up for the Scuderia? Then you've got the McLaren duo of Lando Norris and Daniel Ricciardo. Are they going to have some fun? Best duo. Best duo. And, you know, the McLaren content team, one of the best content teams out there as well, is uh, Gustav Grinsberger going to get out of the car, hand it over to his teammate, Big Timu Toika, as he's called in the Craig Setup Shop Discord. And uh, Simsa on a fight back. A lot of drama for them earlier on in this race. They're now in sixth position, though. And they were chasing down that fourth place car. We talked about that being the target for Simsa in the next eight hours and 15 minutes as they currently sit on the jacks waiting to get those tires replaced. Now you see up there getting brand new rubber on all four car corners of the race car. Feels like a very long stop when you're up on the jacks. You wait for fuel to go in first. Then you wait to go up on the jacks and get your tires it's much nicer in the cars which do both at the same time and there are cars that do that also just FYI we missed it um, about 15 laps or so ago the number 68 we saw Phoenix Racing Esport getting involved in an incident that well quite frankly was was their fault and as a result drive through penalty came down for them race control on top of things as per normal Phoenix Racing Esport then down in 12th position as we see Simsa Esports rejoining the track right behind some lap traffic. That's a GTE Ferrari. There's only two of them out on track right now, so it should be easy to pick out which one it is. And if I'm looking correctly, that is the 11... No, that's not the 11.9 Motorsports. That's the online simracing.de car that we've been following around for much of the last 15, 20 minutes. There you can see the gap, though, up to six seconds as they fall off just a little bit as the 9.11... Porsche 911 RSR out front just ekes away marginally on that gap. You can see there the lap time deltas and both drivers did take new tires the last time around. So I always like seeing this way, hon. It's, it's when you have these uh, class battles across the manufacturers. Too often in iRacing, you end up with these classes being one mate classes. I think of Petit Le Mans where basically everybody was in that BMW M8. It's so much nicer having the nice mix of cars, and it's great being able to see the Ferrari, Porsche, and uh, Chevy Corvette uh, C8R doing battle out on track, and seemingly pretty equal on terms of pace right now. Yeah, it would very much uh, seem so. And uh, of course, I think of what some series would do is that, you know, sometimes they would uh, mandate a re requirement for drivers to select one car and kind of stick to their make of cars throughout the season. And, you know, that would kind of uh, in introduce a, a, a kind of a, a diversity in, in, in the field. So in, in that sense, you would then be able to also see how each car performs across different tracks, as opposed to like a, a, a blanket model, a blanket make uh, in, in different races, um, like, like you just mentioned. Uh, of course, I think, uh, you, you know, what's even more jarring is that uh, with different seasons, you know, you would, you would also uh, come to this situation where, you know, There'll be some times of year due to BOP that you probably have a Ferrari that's the best, that's the most popular car. Then after that, you will have the BMW as the most popular car, and then perhaps right now Corvette being the more popular one. So I, I'm not sure if you know that's exactly the most uh, the, the healthiest way to go about uh, choosing cars, but I think that that, that does kind of go along with the, uh, the preferences of all the different drivers. Well, I mean, even in series with that rule, I mean. Sports Car Open, we talk about their second round, four hours of Monza today. I mean, I think they have two Chevy Corvettes in their GTE class. They have one Porsche yeah. 911 and one Ferrari 488. So despite the fact that yeah. that 
M8 has lost about 9 horsepower in the last uh, iRacing BOP update. Uh, still, that class dominated by the BMW and uh, good to see, in this series at least, some shake-up. There's been an incident for one of the um, GTE cars. This is JMS Racing getting wide onto the gravel as they tried to make their way around a GT3 car. That's a bizarre incident for Dominic Baum, just losing the car on the outside of the the Fania chicane and he almost rejoins unsafely as one of the Mulner Motorsports BMWs rejoins on track. Let's take a look on the onboard then. Slightly further back, we'll jump on board um, with Dominic Baum. Some technical issues there, but here you can see around the outside, just too much momentum carried into the corner, gets onto the grass and nice little 180 that he's got to recover from there, Lorenzo. Yeah, it's a very, it's a very weird incident. You know, you're trying to give as much room as you can possibly give to GT3, but the problem was, you can see mid apex as he was trying to overtake uh, the Simsa GT3 car. I think he got a little bit spooked by how close he got into the Simsa GT3. He tried to give a little bit of the room. He tried to go off into the track, but you're switching, uh, you're switching sides rather quickly, and that switch, you don't have a lot of room. So you can get away with it and you can see it we just saw him just run out, run out of track eventually and someone in our youtube chat talking about what's the changes in torque uh, for the bmw m8 well i mean sometimes torque is a, a big deal torque is more about getting the power down off the corner though and the major impact of the nine horsepower being stripped from the bmw's engine nine ponies less if you will is, is more the top end grunt Especially down the straights, and that's proving, or proved rather, to be a key, a key point at the four hours of Monza, that sports car open race, where the Chevy Corvettes went from being nowhere in that first round of Sebring. They, they were pushing all the way to the limit and barely scraped by into the top ten. This time around, yep. first and second in qualifying, and it's good to see, at the very least, another mark proving strong. There you can see, by the way, that number 182 down the inside. Of 11.9 Sim Sport car. They, if you can believe it, by the way, are many, many laps down. We talked about this on a number of occasions. 21 laps down from their class leader, but once again, pounding around the track and in the true spirit of endurance racing, refusing to give up. It's, to, it's great to see it, Weihan. I've say, said it on so many occasions, but uh, I mean, you know, it's great to see that people are taking this event, the 24 hours of spa powered by H&R and Mulner Motorsport, they're taking it seriously. And they want to get all the way to the end. Yeah, I think you know, you know, the the joy of uh, the, the the joy of doing endurance events like these is that you know, I think it's more down to perhaps the, the whole atmosphere of endurance racing that kind of comes when you have you know when when you have a huge server and also you know many hours of racing. So I think you know, because uh, in essence, right, endurance racing is al already on its own. It's not about pushing your car to its limit. Rather, it's about how well you manage the whole race of attrition. That's why you know you, you don't really see cars pushing. And so, in, in in a similar vein, you know, it's also about uh, how long you can last with your car, and also how long you're willing to kind of keep your car going. Rather than you know, in, instead of pushing your car hard for this one short moment, how how long can you like kind of keep a consistent momentum going throughout the many many hours? And you know, that's exactly what everyone's doing here. You know, we don't have many retirements. We have. You know, very, very few retirements. Everyone's racing very well, and that's exactly what endurance racing should be about. Racebot TV replay up on your screen. Something's happened to Florian Bowden. Behind the wheel of the 187 Race Union Porsche 911. Gets a little bit wide coming out of the Fania chicane, and fortunately able to gather that one up in time. Let's jump on board then with the onboard look. At this one, grabs a little bit too much curbing on the inside, and that's what spits him out into the gravel on the outside hard on the anchors, locks up the tires, which is going to heat up those tires that he's going to have to then cool off as he makes his way down on the run to Blanchemont Corner, but the 187 losing it by itself. We've seen uh, the night is starting, guys, to increase the number of incidents. The first couple of hours were a little bit more pedestrian. I don't think that's the right word because they were pushing hard, but they were being a little bit more under control. But recently, it feels like the number of incidents has really started to spike up here. And, you know, in sim time now, 
just gone past, I think, four in the morning. So we're still at least an hour away from the sunlight starting to poke, away, poke its way over the trees. I think we're going to see a few more of these before we get to the end of the night. A few more drivers starting to get a little bit fatigued and making some costly mistakes. Yeah, it's it's one of those interesting things. The thing of uh, we have to judge the race as a whole. The first two hours were very convoluted, you know, where they are somewhat chaotic. Cars trying to find left and right, and uh, we saw a few uh, that were cars that could have made into uh, very good spots into the race and still battle for maybe top five, maybe top three in each category, kind of being uh, shunted off uh, a little bit back, for example. Simpson GT3. Do you really think the Simpson GT3? Of course, I'm not going to take away from the other cars, but just judging by their lineup alone of Lewis Goodway, Scott Brazier, and and uh, Michael Davies and Book Car Myring, you guys really think the Simpson would not be fighting for the lead in GT3? A good example. Um, and then we got uh, some uh, more convoluted hours just before the halfway mark into the night already, maybe the first two hours. But now it. it we got about six hours of calmness. Now we just grew up a little bit again. A little bit of calm, at least for now. Usually indicates storm is just about to come. Though five minutes for the end of another hour here from Spa Franco Champs, the H and R twenty four hours of Spa, powered by Mulna Motorsport, with uninterrupted coverage provided by RaceBot TV. You're watching live. On the iRacing Esports Network as Race Union heads down onto the pit lane after a 23 lap stint. So they're, they're only getting 23 laps on their stint as compared to upwards of 26 for some of their competitors. So that's what some of the differences in fuel tank capacities and fuel usage can do. But they're going to trundle down the pit lane, the long pit lane that we're using here. This uh, endurance layout of the track where the start start zone is also after turn number one you still finish on the regular start finish line let's look at by the way some battles that are not really developing but at the very least uh proving to still be points of interest you got this battle then for the race lead that number 66 car since having a number of issues has managed to rebuild the lead out to one minute and 50 seconds but take a look at the delta there they're trading lap times back and forth as the traffic Get in the way and Wei Han, I mean, if you're in the number 66, you've had a number of close calls and as we approach the top of another hour, you see the cars behind slowly reeling you in at this point. You've got to start getting a little bit worried and maybe this is where you just calm down a little bit again. We saw them making that risky move around the outside of the GT3 leader. At this point, potentially, it's just... This is where team managers become so useful. This is where sim racing's professionalism becomes so important. It's about making sure the driver is in the right mental state as well as he sees the charge from behind and doesn't try to react to what he's seeing out on track. Yeah, surely it's absolutely important that, you know, the drivers, you know, they, they, I think what's more important for, for them at this point is, uh, for, for Christoph right now is, you know, he do, do also consider that, you know, he's also still making his way through lap traffic. So maybe that could be something he could focus on, you know, on making his way over those uh, lap GT3 and GTE cars. And kind of count on them as a bit of buffer that he can, uh, you know, build against the cars behind him. Uh, you know, whether or not that's 100% effective, I'm, I, don't, I don't think so. But, you know, at least that's, you know, something that, that I think they can put their mind towards, you know, as... Because, you no, know, I think right now, even though the, the cars behind him, uh, from Andreas onwards, are kind of reading him, him in by a little bit. You know, I think there's still a huge margin, quite a big margin. And, you know, it's very important to also sometimes take comfort in the margin that you have. Well, a good healthy margin then, almost pushing a full two minutes for the race leader. Someone has got into the HM Engineering car, by the way, and I'm very interested in this one. Because Cooper Murray has gotten behind the wheel of the Corvette for the 159 crew. And Lorenzo, please correct me if I'm wrong. I thought Cooper was part of the Altus Esports group. Good to see him at least competing here with HM Engineering. But I wonder if we've just found out that there's been a change of teams for uh, one of Australia's up-and-coming drivers. Isn't it Cooper Webster? from Altus. I think it, that's Cooper Webster if I recall correctly. Uh, I don't know. Uh, you're probably Let right. Let me confirm. Let me confirm. 
I'll get that information for you. You're probably right, let's be honest. Uh, Lorenzo likes to correct me, and he's usually right. Blame Arjuna. Yeah, there's a reason why that's a thing. But uh, nevertheless, Cooper Mari behind the wheel now. He's just taken over this car out on the outlap right now. And this is the car that has been through the wars in the, in the last hour or so. First contact with a slow GT3 car down into the Lacombe chicane. They got a drive-through penalty from that. Race control determining that was responsibility on the 159 for the incident. So a further 60 second time penalty as a result of that. And then just a lap after serving that penalty, they got punted by the number 68 car coming out of Stavolo 2. And, and Lorenzo, you confirmed Cooper Webster is the Altus driver. Cooper Murray is the uh, HM Engineering driver. However, 7,000 I rating. Nevertheless, a very strong driver. <laughs> Excited to see what type of pace he's got behind the car right now. Yeah, he's a very good driver. I, th I saw him uh, drive already in a few leagues for HM Engineering. He's always very competent, very fast. Highly uh, highly skillful with uh, strategies as well. I've seen him already play a few of the strategy games and it kind of worked out in his favor. And also for HM Engineering. So they have, they have a very skilled driver as he goes down into... Uh, Al Rouge Radion gets uh, himself away. Kind of clear. The BMW doesn't like the overtake, but uh, you know, this is one of the key things about here that you, you want to clear yourself out of the car, especially in a very tricky turn like Al Rouge and Radion. The BMW knew he was gonna gonna gonna, gonna get overtaken. Could have left off the gas a little bit and not blink his headlights. Well, I mean. Uh, something that I always enjoy when uh, we get the Radio Show Limited crew doing iRacing commentary is they always comment on the uh, etiquette of using the flashing lights <laughs> yeah. because, uh, well, there's a, uh, there's a few different ways that you can use the flashing lights. And just like in the real world, I mean, for many drivers, that's their only source of communication with the drivers around them. Yes, you've got a voice chat, but especially in bigger races, a lot of drivers have that public voice chat muted so you use the lights to indicate to the drivers around you am i going to go for the move do you want me to go for the move etc etc there's a lot of communication that can be done but they have the added benefit of not burning out the uh, bulbs in those headlights which uh you would have to replace in the real world fortunately in the virtual world that's not a mandatory or optional repair that the iRacing service gives you correction a... is it oh okay. Oh, okay, you're talking about the new damage model. We're not on the new damage model right now. Even without the new damage model, depending on circumstances, you can hit the car face first and lose the front end of the car and eventually the lights. It does happen. It happened to me on the P1. It happened to me on the LMP2 car. Oh, well, interesting. The LMP2 car, that tank. That seemingly is indestructible at times, but nevertheless, another hour has ticked over here then. At the h &R, 24 hours of spa, presented to you by Mulna Motorsport. Uninterrupted coverage presented by RaceBot TV. It is time for another RaceBot TV fan immersion, and this time, we're going to go on board with Simsa Esports. They're not diving down onto pit lane this time around, so a good opportunity then to ride with Timu Toika as he closes in on Angry Bull Racing in fifth position. The fight back from the number 16 continues. Let's ride on board then for another few laps of this legendary track.
So another few laps then around the legendary Spa-Francorchamps circuit on board that time with Simsa Esports and Timu Toika in the number six car as he tries to chase down WS Racing Esports Magenta in front of them. 30 seconds is the gap as Simsa tries to fight back from some earlier issues in the race. Seven hours and 50 minutes to go then. It's time for another top eight rundown. Before we do that though, let's take a look at a RaceBot TV replay of another car coming down onto pit lane and potentially getting things a little bit wrong. And this time around, it is Molda Motorsports, the 285 car. What's going to happen here is he gets it wrong. He just loses the rear end and lucky not to slide up into the tire barrier that time around. Let's take another look at that one on board with the number 285. But pit entry has proven to be a challenge for some drivers throughout today's race. Take a look at the steering wheel as the car heads left and then... A big lockup. That's what it was. So not uh, not losing the rear end, but fortunate not to slide off into the tire barriers as down onto the pit lane and pit speed limit four. Number 285 through the very long pit lane down the downhill now. But let's take a look then at the top eight rundown and let's start out front with the LMP2 category. And Weihan, why don't you take this one? We like mixing it up. Let's keep people in suspense. <laughs> right. So this is your LMP2 class standings. So in the race lead is Phoenix Racing Esports Green. They've been pretty much up there for the longest time that we can recall. Um, although the, the advantage ahead of a uh, ring visit sim racing LMP2, which is in P2, it has decreased by seven seconds over the last couple of moments. So now we, we, we do kind of see the gap there fluctuating between 140 and 150. So if the race leader, if uh, Phoenix Racing Esports Green is able to kind of maintain that, then he would probably be in good stead for the next few hours. T3 Esports in third, and he's uh, one lap behind. And we've also got WS Racing Esports Magenta in fourth, which is three laps behind. And so are the, the other cars of Simsa Esports LMP2, Angry Bull Racing, and Milner Motorsports Sim Racing Pro. These are 5th, 6th and 7th respectively. For Scott, Prism Sim Racing Beta in 8th, which is 6 laps behind. So that's the top 8 then in LMP2. We must point out, by the way, look at the gap between 
first and second. They just came down the pit lane a few laps ago while we were under RaceBot TV fan immersion. Number 66 car spending just over 61 seconds in the lane. The number 8, though, just 50 seconds. So, they did take tires, but it does appear as though some strategy being played as the number 8 tries to work themselves back in to this fight for the overall win. Lorenzo Bonder, why don't you take, then, the, G the GTE class? So, Bentley got still in first place with HM Engineering having their uh, mid stint struggles and then pit stops uh, not pit stops but uh, drive throughs is still in p2 prism scene racing alpha is in p3 online scene racing .de is in fourth fifth goes to austrian scene uh, austrian scene races rot in sixth it goes for rings fields uh sim racing gte mutina uh motorsport scene racing blues in seventh and then race union rounds out the top eight Race Union rounds out the top eight, but they are apparently, as far as I can tell, seem to be retired from this race, not out on track and circulating right now. So it appears as though we may have added to our lists of retirements. Actually, the few retirements that I'm watching now on my timing screen. Let's run down the, the GT3 class before we look at those retirements. And it is still the 257 Familian Bomber BMW Z4 that leads the way here. They've got a three-lap buffer over the rest of the field. There you can see how spread out they are. Three, four, five laps down our second through fourth. Absolute motorsports. The number 299, currently second. The third and final podium position, Ring Fiazette, Sim Racing GT3 Pro. Then you got the team RaceGitter.de, and yes, indeed, it is RaceGitter. That's not a typo. That is their team name. They're five laps down. On the same lap as them, the German Performance Sim Racing 291. Eight laps down are the other three cars in the top eight. Sims Esports GT3, Molna Motorsports, Sim Racing Black, and Albrecht Motorsports. It's actually, it does appear as though as we're running through those top eight standings, another issue, unfortunately, for the Sims Esports team. Let's take a look at a RaceBot TV replay, then down into the bus stop chicane once again. It's a familiar sight. If you've been watching along the last four hours and 15 minutes as we work towards the fourth and final quarter in today's action. Losing the rear end of the car. Under braking into the bus stop. Carrying a bit too much momentum. Fortunately, Brazier able to rejoin. Does rejoin in front of some traffic there. You can see the headlights behind them. But for Simsa Esports, it's been a difficult day in all three classes. And that difficult day continues then for the number 266. Yeah, it becomes a little bit difficult, and the, and the bigger problem is, looming large, just right behind them, there is the Muna Motorsports in racing Black and Albrecht Motorsports uh, fighting for battle for, for position, so Scott Brazier can afford to lose a lot of time, he needs to be clean, and he has to be very effective with his lines, otherwise it brings those two GT3 cars right behind them, those two BMWs, F4s into a three-way battle for P6. Absolutely. But there you can see the 247 that we're riding on board with right now. That's Albrecht Motorsport. Chasing down not only the BMW in front of them, but the BMW of Simsa Esports then. I am getting word, by the way, apparently, what happened with Race Union. We're back in the game. Uh, not sure what's happening there. Uh, Lorenzo, I'm not sure if you're able to get a, another view of what's happening to the Race Union car, but they're not on my timing screen. Seemingly falling down the order, and the same can be said right now for the number 200, Reparix by Artel Motorsport Sim Racing car. The two cars apparently seemingly down on pit lane and uh, not out there on track and circulating, increasing our retirement to five cars from this one, I do believe. Yeah, it's an odd thing because apparently they got a drive-through of sorts uh, and the lap 415 of 416 and then just right after they went down into the pit lane and stopped the car. The car is right there looming on the pit lane and I don't know what happened next. Well, unfortunately for Race Union then, not sure what happened, maybe not too happy with the penalty that came down from race control, but nevertheless, out of the 40 cars then that started this 24-hour race around Spa-Francorchamps, just 35 remain. Good to see many of these cars lapsed down, still pounding around 
on the track trying to make up positions as Albrecht Motorsport has to lift out of the throttle just breathe it out and let HM Engineering down the inside in through Eau Rouge and now going to try and get a good run as the Mueller, Mo Mueller Motorsports BMW doesn't have to check up as much and he's going to get a nice healthy dose of that draft down in to the Lacombe chicane gap just over half a second is a big puff of smoke potentially a lock up there from the number 285 is one of the Phoenix racing cars splits these two as they battle down in towards Brussels and they're not actually closing in now on Simsa Esports the last few laps Simsa has managed to once again pull out the gap so the battle for seventh and eighth continues to heat up but Simsa Esports in sixth trying to just pull away that little bit more and while not too much action happening on track, we're riding on board with the only battle that's really within about five seconds as things stand. We can talk about some other things. And if anyone in our YouTube chat wants to say hello, we are watching the chat. We're happy to engage with you guys. If you have any questions for us, still an hour and 40 minutes in this portion of the broadcast before we hand it over to the very capable voices of David Haynes and Thomas Davis with Hugo Luis in the production room controlling another six hours of racing action all the way till the checkered flag what are we racing for you might wonder well prize money on offer in each of our three classes 330 euros up for grabs in each class for a total of 990 euros in today's event 150 euros to the winning team in each class to be distributed amongst the drivers second place nets you 110 euros while third place nets you just 70 some prize money on offer seems like for the most part if we're being uh, completely honest those positions seemingly quite settled for the time being we're talking about gaps in the minutes and laps range rather than seconds and uh, as a result we'll focus on this battle for seventh and eighth as we uh, get some people in our YouTube chat hello glad to have you guys here and uh, there was one one imposter amongst the cars. Well, if there's one imposter here, I mean, it might be the, um... We only have one... Oh, no, we have two Ferraris, I guess. I was about to say, there's, there was a... There's a few lonely cars here. You've got a, a number of Chevys, you've got a number of Porsches, but the Ferraris are seemingly the odd man out in that GTE class. Just two of them in our 12 class... Cl uh, 12 car class. I'm getting those words confused. Yeah, unfortunately for the ferrari here's the thing it is a very fast car it is a fast car on the straight line but it lacks in every other in every other department it does have good it does have a good acceleration comparison to the to the corvette and also the, the porsche itself and it doesn't have the best handling in comparison to the porsche and the corvette itself it is a little bit more loose uh, especially your corner entry so you need to get yourself a good set out out of the car so you can extract the best performance out of it so if you want to say who's the most suspect the or the sus as people would like to say in in that specific game I would not mention its name it, it would be the uh, Ferrari I don't know Lorenzo you're a bit sus right now you don't want to say the name <laughs> of the of the game I, it's just a little bit sus right now I was on, I was I was inventing. <laughs> you were in admin the entire time, trying to swipe your card. That's what you were trying to do. Precisely. You jump on board for just a few moments' time, with the 247 continues to try and chase them down. You've seen a lot of traffic make its way through. There you see a GTE and a P2 going side by side as that LMP2 car goes around the outside down into Blanchemont, going. Obviously, the closing speed between those two cars very very high and makes his way around the track. We'll take a look, by the way, at um. Race spot TV replay. What has happened here down on the entry into pit lane? Something else. It, it seems to be a common spot and people getting the entry just uh, a little bit wrong. Let's jump on board then with Valky Valkyrie E Racing, the number 142, down through the bus stop chicane. And it seems like a lot of people just getting a little bit unsettled down into the pit entry there, not wanting to incur the wrath of the, the walls there. We'll jump on board once again and you know, Weihan, you want to, especially in an endurance race like this, you want to maximize uh, that pit lane. You don't want to compromise and, and lose some time here. But 
you know, clearly some drivers just feeling a little bit nervous as those walls close in around them. Well, it's just a pit in Spa. The walls are very narrow. Yeah, well, uh, I, I mean, you know, it, it, if you have two separate pit lanes that you have to, you know, kind of link together, you, you definitely have some narrow sections and um, some narrow sections that might catch you up. But, you know, pit, pit lane speed limit is there for a reason. 60 kilometers per hour, you're meant to drive at that speed and, you know, not <laughs> mess up at that speed. But yeah, um, yeah, Lorenzo was just saying that you know it, it does it does happen in real life. Um, wow, that, that's that's gonna be really scary, I imagine. Jump back to this battle as the GTE leader makes his way past the Bentley God's gonna slot himself in between the battle for seventh and eighth. Uh, the gap had just closed to about two tenths of a second for a moment's time, but once again opens back up down in towards the Fania chicane the corvette gonna look around the outside the, the bmw is gonna have to lift off the mulder motorsport bmw now loses a bunch of momentum and once again the battle closes on up gap be below a uh, two tenths of a second once again now the long run all the way up from campus corner to blanchemont and in towards the bus stop chicane they seem to be clear of traffic you can't see any lights in the background now so can 247 get a nice run up towards Blanchemont. It appears as though that Mulder Motorsports car has lost a lot of top end performance as you can see actually a GTE car down the inside. What's going to happen here side by side into Blanchemont? Never a smart idea. The GTE car has to back off for just a moment's notice. Down into the bus stop chicane going to hang out there. Not force the issue. Very smart driving potentially from the GTE car. But this opens the door potentially now for that gap to be opened up once again as there's going to be a Porsche 911 GT3, uh, not GT3 Cup car, I'm thinking about the Esports Super Cup qualifying now. The Porsche 911 RSR is going to make its way down the inside into turn number one as well. And that was the Valkyrie E-Racing green car who just made a move into La Source and then the Porsche. I think that was from, I was going to say Austrian Sim Racers, but I think that is the online... Now, that was a Prism Sim Racing Alpha making that move in manual check. Uh, as he just going to get clear out of the Corvette right now. But we're going to keep eyes on that battle because now the move might be set in stone for the BMW off the back. Good run down. The Camel straight to the inside. Looks the 247. Trying to get up into 7th place. Is he going to be able to do it under braking? The Mulner Motorsports car decides not to fight any further. And there you go. Up into 7th. Battle done and dusted for now. We'll see if this keeps happening. We'll take a look at some RaceBot TV replays once again then. Now that that pass has been settled. Take a look at an incident from an LMP2 car. The Motul Racing Esports number 40 that we've seen getting involved in a few issues. Going deep into the bus stop chicane. And, well, fortunately we've talked about this on a number of occasions as he hits the wall. Oh. He, he's not going to get a slowdown penalty from cutting that pit entry, but he is going to get some damage after hitting the wall. Let's take another look at this replay on board, but Wei Han, this is not what. We talked about pit entry being a dangerous proposition, and, well, what do you know? A car wants to go and prove us right. Well, uh, I, I think, you know, you could attribute that to, you know, the, the, the reduce, the diminished the visibility you get when you're driving an LMP2 car. You know, those two A-pillars, they do kind of block your view a fair bit. And it, it would probably be, be just a case of, you know, that pit entry, that, that, uh, that wall there. Not exactly. It'd be kind of being blocked from the driver's view. So that could have led to, uh, you know, that contact happening. But then again, yeah, it's, it's a very narrow um, pit entry. So... I think it's wiser if you if you're able to kind of plan your line in advance and take the outside line in. Well, I think the uh, bigger issue here is that he goes deep into the corner, really sends it deep into the braking zone, and then you know the angle here is always an issue. And Lorenzo, you were talking about the the real swept Spa 24 Hours, which took place just a weekend ago. This wasn't a, an uncommon sight to see some unusual lines being taken on the pit entry, uh, even in the real world. Yeah, if I recall correctly, I saw the Aka ASP Mercedes that was leading the race at one point doing that. I saw a few other uh, Porsches, Ferraris, uh, getting that wrong part, getting that wrong entry into the pit lane just because either it's traffic or they kind of overshot the braking zone. Even the real cars overshot the braking zone. It is quite tricky for you to get it right. So they. 
the race director overlooks that see if it is a clean entry you have a little bit of cones right before the entry as we are now seeing the track conditions right now 18 degrees ambient 19 degrees ambient with the 18 degrees on the track itself clouds are partially cloudy humidity is about 53 percent that might increase as uh, sunrise is about to come anytime soon wind speed is at seven kilometers right now to the southwest into this uh, lengthy track 6.9 6.93 kilometers here arjuna but it's a legendary track nevertheless what's the track that i had about 13 kilometers in length that's changed over the years taking a look at the conditions reminder again Live timing and scoring for today's event is available at racebot.tv slash endurance. Head over to our timing page to follow along with your favorite teams and drivers throughout this 24-hour race. You can see there the wind as well, not that strong, and often gusts of wind can be an issue for drivers. On the run, up through Rouge and Radion, down through the Camel Strait in towards the Lacom chicane, but... Fortunately, all good. We should also point out, by the way, that unfortunately there you'll see uh, the Albrecht Motorsport BMW Z4 down on pit lane. Unfortunately, the driver who had just gotten by the Molna Motorsport BMW had a, uh, a technical issue and as a result got removed from the server. And now Sven Holbrecht has gotten back behind the wheel, but down a considerable amount of time as a result of having to come back down onto pit lane due to that technical issue. And, and Weihan, that's one of the unique things about sim racing. You don't have to worry about your brakes failing. You don't have to worry indeed about your headlights burning out, as we mentioned a little bit ago. But you do have to worry about the wrath of the internet gods and Albrecht Motorsport, unfortunately, being smited down in the last few moments. Back out on track now, but they've lost a couple of positions. Yeah, it's just unfortunate that, you know, in the world of racing, there's always something to worry about, you know, when there's nothing to worry about, you know, someone will give you something to worry about, and, you know, that was very much, very much the case uh, for Sven Albrecht and his team. Um, of course, you know, the very same, the, you know, the, the very tool that we all use to enjoy uh, online racing is, can also cause us the most issues, that is the internet. Um, but of course, you know, we, we, are, we are also experiencing the benefits that come with it as we race multiplayer uh, here tonight. So this is a move uh, by the that Porsche. Um, that is, oh yeah, that, that, that's a GT class. Sometimes I, I do kind of imagine that that's a Porsche GT3 on iRacing, but that actually is Just dreaming about a day when you can yeah. break out that 911 GT3 R. By the way. Go ahead, Lorenzo. I was just going to say, uh, just to wrap it up, that's what we call the marvelous world of sim racing. Marvelous world indeed. And it's great to see as well the likes of H&R, Mulna Motorsport, and more and more organizations jumping in to both sim racing and iRacing as a result of all the chaos of the past few months. We had a lot of professional series being organized over the summer as professional race car drivers tried to get their racing fix while being stuck at home. Of course, who can forget some of the TV broadcasts that were done by iRacing, breaking all sorts of esports records. And now, here we are live on the iRacing esports network for the H&R 24 Hours of Spa. Lorenzo, 30 minutes to go till the top of another hour. 90 minutes before we hand it over to David Haynes and Thomas Davis. You have a point. I hope it's a fun one, though, because it's starting to get a little bit slow out on track once again. I think it's time for us to move on to a topic where we can entertain our audience once again. Yeah, so I really want to bring up a topic because we were mentioning, you know, these brands coming into iRacing and then Sim Racing General, H&R, which is a very... Uh, well-known brand for springs and uh, suspensions and even provides suspensions for racing teams uh, and then Muna, Muna Motorsport coming into the fray as well and helping out the growth of sim racing um, if you guys haven't realized for those who are not aware uh, the Washington Post actually did a post about the, the, the shaping up of the future for NASCAR and then iRacing itself. I don't know if you actually took a look at that, Arjuna, and uh, how 
the both brands i racing and then the nascar are helping themselves out or laying out the rules and giving out the uh not the branding but the commercials the promotion of the drivers and the uh inclusion of real world teams and also drivers promoting the event and promoting the teams and helping out the drivers sponsoring them and this inclusion of nascar and real and real world is helping out both the brands and uh, impulsing sim racing to, towards the future well i mean uh, not just that washington post article there's been a lot of interesting stories about how iRacing has been working with organizations the one that i'm thinking of isn't that article but it's one that was written by um i believe it was jeff gluck at the athletic and this was about the partnership oh, yeah. where um obviously we had a daytona road course race this year in nascar due to their own changes to the schedule and we had a slight change to the traditional layout where Instead of powering down all the way around ovals three and four to then dive into that first corner at, in speeds of what would have been in excess of probably 180, 190 miles an hour, you know, in those stock cars trying to slow it down would have been a risky proposition. So as a result, the uh, NASCAR officials went to the iRacing staff members and said, hey, we've got this idea and we want to test it out in the iRacing service. Can we do that? To which the iRacing staff members said, yes, absolutely, we can build this version of the track for you. Just give us a day and a half or so, and we'll get a version out for you guys to test. And they went through a series of iterations, and this process Mental. then got used for an even bigger project. It's not just for that one-off at Daytona. Um, I'm forgetting which of the short tracks it is, because I'm not a, a, a NASCAR fan, despite now being based in the U.S., but uh, one of the short tracks, either, I think it might be Bristol. This is how much I know about NASCAR, but either Bristol or, or Martinsville, one of those two. But it's gonna, no, you know what it is. Ah, what I'm thinking of is Auto Club, which is a big 1.5 yeah. mile track, which is now being shrunk to be a short track. And what NASCAR and iRacing did together was build a number of different models that could, that could be the, the version that gets used in the real world. They trusted it out, they got, feedback from various stakeholders testing it out and seeing what type of racing it produced and as a result of all of that testing that track is now being built in the real world when it existed in the virtual world first so great to see these types of partnerships and you know hopefully uh, uh, way Han, they continue in the future because this not just going to give us these great competitions it's just going to continue growing this sim racing community as we try and make this a more legitimate sport in many ways most certainly. So, you know, you, you can look at this growth from uh, various different standpoints. So, you know, if, if you look at it from the standpoint of a racing series, a sanctioning body, you know, uh, this sim racing platform is kind of a means to deliver effective competition uh, in a more convenient way. Because when, when, you kind of, when you kind of bring racing events online, you the, the areas that may happen may go wrong in real life that just won't happen in sim racing. You know, for example, you can't you, you know drivers are all kind of you know with, with regards to you know cheating and stuff like that. Everything is well uh, well organized within the virtual platform. You know, there, there are digital systems for all of that to take place. So that's one. And if you if you have and also uh, in another vein. Um, think of sim racing as being a, a marketable platform because the adoption by you know players like you and I, racing fans like you and I, this is like an additional marketing platform for these big brands uh, to kind of get uh, reach out to the general motorsports audience. And you know, uh, most importantly for, for for us, it's one way to enjoy motorsports uh, that is through sim racing. You know, what what would otherwise be impossible. You know, back in the days, now we do have uh, something that that's kind of uh, close to close to the real thing. But more importantly, it, it allow it, it allows us to you know kind of go shoulder to shoulder with you know uh, so many different elements in motorsport. And speaking of uh, getting you know taking sim racing to the next level, you know I I think you know there are certainly efforts underway to try to get sim racing to be recognized as a an e-sport because that's been done being done already in a few countries. And also, there are also efforts to kind of bring that into the Olympic level of uh, to, to try to get efforts that are going in that direction because that's certainly what some people would want to see. Sim racing at the Olympics. I like the sound of that, to be honest. You know, 
someone who's never made a dime off my sim racing career. In fact, I probably spent more more money uh, than I could ever have hoped to uh, imagine uh, when I first committed to sim racing. We'll see exactly how the future of sim racing progresses. There was a pass, by the way. As the Simsa Esports crew continue their impressive fight back, you're seeing the Angry Bull Racing Team going a little bit deep into the bus stop chicane. Just getting the braking zone a little bit wrong. Let's take a look at a RaceBot TV replay of the pass then for fifth place on track as Team Mutoika slots himself up into what is now fifth place. You can actually see the Angry Bull Racing a lap ago going very deep into the bus stop chicane. Not for the first time then, unfortunately for them. And Team Mutoika is going to inherit fifth place on track and now set to work on trying to chase down the number 64 car in front a lot of time to still make up so we jump back to live pictures look at the gap then between toika and the ws racing esports magenta 64 one minute 40 seconds is the gap so a long way to go and we'll see what toika is able to do then as we watch him make his way through malmody down in towards Bruxelles. Talking about sim racing as it continues to grow, I mean, uh, we mentioned Roman Grosjean a little bit ago. I mean, Roman Grosjean, he started his own sim racing team in partnership with AAA Esports, the, as you like to say, Lorenzo, the R8G uh, Esports team. I like to just say R8G because I I, I failed it, French for many years. Let me make a correction. It's not because I like to say, it's because Stefan Koch which is the manager actually corrected us on the stream. <laughs> so he said it. I, I, I asked him, so Stefan, how do you pronounce the team name? Is it R-A-G or Arhuichi? Because they, it's a French team. And they said, oh, uh, it's Arhuichi. So I, that's why I'm saying Arhuichi. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I, I did many years of French. I think I started probably what, when I was about eight or nine all the way up till 18. I don't speak any French, so forgive me. Uh, I'm still going to call R8G for now as we see Toika down the inside <laughs> of, I believe, that is the Moto, Moto. Racing Esports. Yep, down in through Blanchemont. Very aggressive pass from Toika, but some impressive pace in the car right now as he continues to make his way through. But back to what I was mentioning with the R8G team. Uh, you talk about them being a team of French, predominantly French drivers. They've just announced the formation of the R8G Junior team, capturing some of the top French talents under the age of 18. They've got a 14-year-old in there as well amongst the four recruits that they have picked up. But in what is already a, a very young sport, it's great to see organizations trying to develop programs to provide opportunities and mentorship for young drivers as they continue to develop skills through sim racing, not just trying to develop skills for sim racing, of course. We talked about, slightly earlier, I mentioned Jack Crawford, Red Bull F4 Junior driver. We've seen him compete in a number of series now on the iRacing Esports Network and RaceSpot TV as part of his sim racing team, the Fiercely Forward team. You also have a few other real-life drivers starting to commit more seriously into sim racing. You've got um, Phil Denez, who is a Road to Indy driver trying to make his way up the IndyCar ladder into that NTT IndyCar series. Yeah. He's joined Vendaval Sim Racing, trying to qualify his way into the Porsche Esports Super Cup. And guess what? He's joined by VRS Coanda's Ian Chan Guven, real-life Mobile One Porsche Super Cup driver, trying to then qualify into his esports counterpart of the uh, series that he competes with on a regular basis. So it's great to see some of these names starting to try and compete in increasingly high levels and hopefully we'll get to see a, a little bit more of a transition as sim racers get opportunities in real life cars obviously last few months has obviously put a damper on some of those plans yeah. there's a few series over the last year the um that have offered drives and test drives in various cars and We've got the likes of the world's fastest gamer, but that obviously appeals to drivers who also have some real life experience. A driver who's got an opportunity in some 911 Cup class racing in his native Europe is Lauren Heinrich, part of the Williams Esports crew, I do believe. Mm -hmm. And great to see more drivers making that transition rather than yeah. getting some of these real life drivers into sim racing. It's great to see the likes of Heinrich and also previous world's fastest gamer winner Rudy Van Buren getting a number of runouts as well in the Porsche Carrera Cup. So 
a, a, a number of cars and a number of drivers getting opportunities as a result of strong sim racing performances and long may that continue as we continue watching Toyka down into the Lacombe chicane. He is really on a charge right now, continually one of the fastest cars on track. Last time around, a full second quicker than anyone the else fastest. in this LMP2 class. So really pushing the pace now, Lorenzo. Yeah, the fastest car right now for for the entirety of the grid. He just did a 202067. The closest car who comes around that number is the Angry Bull with 202927. So nearly a full second down on the Simsa car and Timu just on a tear. He still has roughly about eight, eight or nine more laps into his stint. So showing that strength of the Simsa car and uh, just Timu things like people jokingly say in the Craig Discord as uh, Craig Setup Shop Discord as well, uh, doing uh, his own stuff. But I, I would like to bring some more guys into this uh, sim racing real world, right? For example, we have he's not known in I racing, for example, Tim Heinemann, a very well known driver in other sims, getting the uh, GT4 opportunities, he even won a GT4 Germany's uh, race, if I recall correctly. Uh, we have the Vendor Vend Linda uh, twins, you know, not twins, but I say brothers and team just uh, overshooting the bus stop, but uh, helping out the young drivers coming into the fray as well. Tim Jarshall, if I recall correctly, did some GT4 racing as well. So it is getting more real for, uh, to see the virtual drivers heading uh, slowly into the, uh, into the real world. Uh, racing in different brands and uh, categories. Well, second place on track down onto pit lane, by the way, Ring Fizet Sim Racing, which, by the way, got a comment in our YouTube chat, means Nurburgring Infected. And guys, I love that name. For those who are unaware, I, uh, one of my favorite, my favorite track in the world, the Norse Cypher. Uh, I made sure, I had the campaign to bring the IndyCar series there for a round, and well, unfortunately, there's a certain F3 driver who... Yes, and it's the best combination you can ever imagine. So much more fun than LMP1s around the Norse life, I must say. But unfortunately, there's a certain F3 driver who just happened to be racing that week and has unfortunately taken away my world record opportunity because I've got the second fastest lap now. Unfortunately, not the fastest one. So, like I say, I love the name. Down on pit lane now for Philip Barr, and uh, 14 seconds stationary already. Doesn't look like a driver change happening, but you know, from the Nurburgring Nordschleife to Spa Frankershop, not such a far drive. And while the modern configuration of this track maybe not as similar to the Nordschleife, I mean, wait, Weihan, we talk about this being a 30 kilometer track when it was first built. I mean, that type of racing is very similar to what we still get nowadays on the Nordschleife. Yeah, I would imagine it would be similar to um, Le Mans as well, you know, um, you know Spa, I, I would imagine back then it was, it was all about straight, you know, high speed, uh, straight line speed and also those scary, scary kinks, those kinks that take at 4th or 5th gear at high speed, but those kinks that, were, that, that if you go, do make a mistake, you would uh, probably find yourself uh, upside down as I think Jackie Stewart might have uh, back in the day. But yeah, I think, you know, it's just great to see that so many tracks, right? You know, you notice that some tracks, as they modernize, some tracks do keep their character, but some tracks like Hockenheim, unfortunately lose, uh, you know, their, their flair um, over the years uh, due, due to the, the whole modernization progress. And, you know, I think that, that you know, um, I think with, with regards to Spa right now, you, you still get a lot of high speed action, but you get even more, you know, of these high speed corners here and there. If I recall correctly, Spa just casually back in the day, like back in the 60s, just casually driving through a village. Yes, just casually, as many racing circuits did back in the day. We must point that out. Not unique to Spa Francorchamps, just one of the extra charms. I mean, Le Mans still nowadays cars through part of that French countryside town, but we're watching still number eight who has just come out of pit lane a minute 45 seconds behind. The number 66 Phoenix Racing that leads this 24 hours of spa presented by H&R and Mulner Motorsport. We must say as well, we, we're talking about spa and all the changes that have been made. It was recently announced as well, guys, that uh, another change coming to the 
circuit, the addition of some extra gravel traps as the circuit aims to get a motorcycle um, certification, trying to get a 24-hour motorcycle endurance race to the circuit. So uh, I believe it's an FIM grade C license, not the license required for MotoGP, but still good to see that the track is going to get expanded to include some more races. It's a a hub of endurance racing in many ways. It's got so many classic in, uh, endurance races, including some of the uh, Fun Cup events, the VNW Fun Cup, and, and things like that. We had our own uh, at iRacing member, Julian Shine, who got to compete in that recently. So uh, lots of interesting things always happening at the Spa Francochamps circuit. But you talk about modernizing tracks. One track that definitely hasn't been modernized and is all the better for it is the Nurburgring Nordschleife. And a great interview with Mercedes team boss Toto Wolf on the F1 podcast recently where he talked about his experience at that track. He had a huge crash for those who were unaware. There's a great video on YouTube of... Uh, after breaking the record. After breaking the record, we must point out, he broke a track lap record and on the very next lap went to try and get a slightly better lap down through the compression out of, I think it would be the third sector of the Nordschleife. Um, one of the fastest points on the track, yeah. you go downhill then rise up into Ardenau Forest and losing the one of his tires, very violent crash, so violent in fact that the old tape recorders that used for onboard cameras lost part of the uh, recording, but uh, some serious injuries sustained in that incident, but nevertheless, Toto, Toto's love for the circuit and admiration for the drivers that compete there continues to rain on. and. The most interesting comment that I heard, guys, was uh, his comment that he would never want to see an F1 race around the Nordschleife, mainly because think... the, the changes that you would have to do just make it a totally different track. And at that point, it's not the Nordschleife anymore, and then you've ruined it not only for F1, but for everyone else who wants to make their way around the track. Yeah, it, uh, if, if Wei Han wants to expand upon that, there is a very interesting topic. Not just him actually mentioned about this. Uh, uh, Nicky said that uh, he didn't want to see F1 driving much life. It would be too dangerous because of the aerodynamics and the, and the track being w way too fast for F1 cars to handle the modern day one cars. Even back in the day, the 70s, it, it was already hard to handle. But uh, there is one very interesting fact about the video, this this uh, Toto Wolf incident that is quite um, appalling, that the uh, you, you see he, him crashing. There's a there's a footage of like I think on the where it says who should be the right hand seat of him crashing and getting out of the car. He gets out of the car so so casually. Even if he actually he, he said if I recall correctly he had broken a rib, like two ribs or something like that. He had broken a rib or or something like that, and he just casually gets out of the car. I don't like, think he normally. Just casually broken a rib severe concussion uh i think yeah. some significant fracturing as well that took some time to recover from and he had he himself admits the only reason he was able to get up and out of the car was uh adrenaline and as soon as he got out of the yeah. car took his helmet and han's device off uh, collapsed to the ground and actually uh the stewards uh, had to go searching for him because he went flying over the barrier down at the compression. They didn't immediately realize a car was off the circuit and took uh, just a few moments for the events that had just unfolded to become clear to the marshals. But fortunately, Toto made a full recovery from that one. Uh, he's a very interesting character, I must say. Not just a very incredible businessman, clearly running uh, a number of businesses, but a very passionate racing fan. I think ultimately that's what's uh, helped propel him to the top of his chosen industry because I'm sure a man like that and uh, all of the resources and talents that he have could really do anything that he wants to and uh, great to have him in F1. Maybe in the future have him in some other forms of motorsports. Maybe even I would love to maybe see Toto Wolf as part of the FIA. We'll have to wait and see. Toto is still a young man yeah. with a long career ahead of him. But Weihan, let's talk, talk to you. We talk about modernizing circuits. Well, we talked about this when, uh, in the first hour when we started talking about fantasy races. And I talked about wanting the Singapore uh, street circuit with that old Singapore sling chicane. You know, there's been a, a number of occasions, I think, over the last 10 years where F1 has gone to tracks and often made minor adjustments like that 
as the cars have evolved and as they get increasingly quick to try and rein them in a little bit more. And that's why when we talked about, you know, the possibility of reverse races, which I think some fans very seriously took as a very serious consideration when all of the initial lockdowns first happened and we were trying to get to the minimum races for a World Championship Series. Reverse races would have been a very interesting possibility, but never really a realistic option given the safety implications. Well, um, you know, with regards to your first point on, uh, I guess, uh, making minor, so-called minor modifications to tracks, uh, you know, I think if, if you have a look at one 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 example that I just kind of uh, that I can help think of very clearly is that of Mexico itself, that racetrack. You know, you, you do notice that how, how the track has been profiled, you know, in order to support uh, the, the kind of changes made to it. So, you know, it used to be a flowing track, you know, similar to Suzuka, I guess, at certain places. It then kind of became a, you know, a corner that's got angular technical corners and, you know, that just kind of, I would imagine that, you know, that, that, that suited Formula 1, but, you know, tracks that are made to you know, be suited for Formula 1, you, you kind of find that when you race other cars that you just kind of lose, you know, what you would otherwise experience in more classic tracks like Spa and, uh, and, and such. So, you know, that's, I think, you know, you know, I, I think, you know, when, when, when you do consider how you, you change when, when I think when F1 changes tracks to when, when the FIA changes tracks to suit the F1 cars, they, I think um, more thought has to go into how they can still retain the character. Yeah, and going about that uh, Mexico stuff, uh, well, there's two reasons for them to change. Of course, it's to make the cars more safe and, and also due to the fact that the back in the day the cars were going basically 300 kilometers per hour into a i would if i recall correctly it was a 15 or 20 degree bank curve which was the final curve a very infamous curve and basically you cut that about in half because the modern day f1 cars would just take take that thing flat out and it would have been dangerous because just right outside the the just right outside the track, if I recall correctly, that is a baseball field. That's why they said, no, this is way too dangerous. Imagine if a car just goes off, it wouldn't, not even the uh, catch fences would be able to, even if it is the most safe catch fences would be able to catch that car. People might say that uh, making the car go into the inside part of the stadium might be a bad thing. And I'll say maybe it is because Toka Drome is a Toka Drome of sorts, but I would say for F1, it fits the style. It doesn't fit for F Formula E, in my opinion. But for F1, if you, I think that would fit perfectly for the 2022 cars. And I really am interested to see how that folds out. But post race, I would say the stadium probably has top five, the, one of the best atmospheres in F1 for post racing. Well, that track in Mexico, one of the more interesting tracks on the F1 calendar, and hopefully we'll get to go back there next year for the 2021 season. Sounds like a big calendar planned. We're watching the current leader in GTE splitting down the middle three wide. That is the uh, JMS Porsche on the outside that was also making its way around. Let's take a look at a RaceBot TV replay very quickly of an issue for a, um, a GT3 car coming through Puhan who gets on the curb just at the worst possible place and fortunately for that car, that's the 210, not going to spin into the tire barrier but facing the wrong way now has to do a 180 to get back onto the racing surface and that is a dramatic one. Let's take a look on the onboard if we can then because just getting on the curb a little too much gets spooked by the car trying to go down the inside and that is a nasty curve that you do not want to hit that portion of. It often spears you onto the right-hand side of the track. Fortunate there to be able to gather it up and keep it on the tarmac. Speaking of tarmac, I think that that runoff itself, I think that's going to be replaced with a gravel exit, you know, come the MotoGP modifications on Spa. I think that's just going to make things even more interesting. Take a look at an aerial look at this one. I think you're right in, as well. That outside of Puhong going to be now gravel that will make things much more interesting cars no longer going to have free reign we did see an incident there in the f1 race this year if you remember antonio giovanazzi 
in the closing stages of that race with a very odd incident when he was running quite well up the order for Wolf Motorsport Sim Racing. Lupus, though, back on track after losing a whole heap of time. It does appear there was another issue as well. So we'll take a look at a second RaceBot TV replay then. And what is this one? This is for German Performance Sim Racing. That is the number 40 Motul Esports, I think. That LMP2 car, and he just sends German Performance Sim Racing off the course down at Bruxelles. One more look at that one. That is some awful driving from the LMP2 car. Once again, Moto, uh, Moto Racing just getting involved into one of these uh, impatient incidents because we saw that I think a few uh, a couple hours ago, uh, that Moto car just trying to overtake GT3s in wrong places and uh, shutting them off as. We are now looking through the uh, cockpit perspective of Gustavo Xavier uh, as he goes out to Momadi and uh, tries to go for three wide into Brussels and we know that three wide with uh, cars like this doesn't work. Yeah, that is a low percentage move if you are going to use some uh, US sports terminology. Let's try and take another look at that one because I don't know what to say other than what is he doing? I mean, that is just unbelievable, unfortunately, for that car. You can see as well that was um, another LMP2 car that did check up in time as all the action happened in front of him. But there you can see the Simsa GT3 car trying to get to the inside of the corner as the 40 is just going to shove German performance sim racing out the way. Let's take another look then on the, the back angle from the 291 car. The car that ends up in the tire barrier because Weihan, I mean, again, uh, no defense for that. That is just aggressive driving when you do not need to be pushing the issue. Already so many laps down from the race leader. Well, um, you know... It's a fact that there's still like seven hours of racing to go, so I think drivers have plenty of opportunities to, to, to you know make overtaking maneuvers. So I think sometimes it's it's better to you know kind of delay your move by one corner or a few corners and find a better opportunity to do so because in endurance racing it's all about you know thinking on the long term instead of uh, thinking about the immediate term. So you know in that aspect, I think that's that's a mindset that most drivers who do endurance racing they ought to uh, keep in mind, and I think they are doing very, relatively well in that aspect here. So Motul Racing Esports, they are 15 laps down from your race leader, four laps behind the car in front of them. Like I say, absolutely no excuse there in my opinion. And German's performance sim racing, there you can see, just came out of the pit lane and had to spend a whole bunch of time after being sent, head no nose first rather, into the tire barriers on the exit of Bruxelles. A shame, as the 291 car now drops to fifth place. They were running up in that battle for that third and final podium position, and a big shame, I think, for the 291 crew, but again, Spirit of endurance racing well and truly on here in the h and 24 hours of Spa. Presented by Mulner Motorsports. The end of another hour then. As we wind towards the end of this third quarter in this race. So in 59 minutes we'll be handing you over the very capable voices of David Haynes and Thomas Davis for the last six hours of this one. So 59 minutes to go then. One more RaceBot TV fan immersion before we bid you adieu after six hours of racing coverage here. Part of RaceBot TV's uninterrupted coverage of the h 24 Hours of Spa live on the iRacing Esports Network. My name, Arjuna Kankipati, alongside Lorenzo Bonder and Wei Han Chan. As always, TV cameras provided to us by Istvan Ballo of Track Cams 22. Additional car cameras provided by our very own Tyler Maxson. Do remember, live timing and scoring available on racebot.tv slash endurance. Head over there to follow along with your favorite team and drivers throughout the next seven hours of this one. So one more Racebot TV fan immersion, guys. But I, I think we spent a lot of time in, in the LMP2 class under fan immersion. Um, I tell you what, Weihan, why don't you pick between GTE and GT3 
And then Lorenzo, you get to pick which class, uh, which car within the class that Weihan has picked. GT3, please. All right, yeah, GT3, I think so... Oh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I'll just, just say that you know, I think there's some exciting racing going on the GT3 cars as well. Um, certainly quite a lot of cars that I, I do see have uh, some aero damage, so that must be that quite a lot of intense action had taken place. So I think it's fitting that we do ride on board some of the GT3s. Uh, with that being said, I think we can keep on the German performance in racing since we got him riding him on focus. Uh, let's keep with Mike Kepner. Uh, and that German performance in racing, Arjuna? Sounds good to me. So the 291 back out on track after being sent into the tire barriers at Bruxelles after running very, very well for a number of hours. A lot of hard work to do. But one more race bot t uh, TV fan immersion then in this third segment of the broadcast. Watch on board for a few laps around the legendary Spa Franco Champs on board with the R Audi RS, uh, sorry, Audi uh, R8 LMS GT3 car.
So a few more laps on board then. For the 291 German Performance Sim Racing Audi R8 LMS. As cars continue to work their way through the nighttime hours here. In the h and 24 Hours of Spa, presented by Mulna Motorsports. Welcome back to the iRacing Esports Network and our uninterrupted coverage of this 24-hour race as we head towards the morning hours. Six hours and 49 minutes still left on the clock. It's just past 5 a.m. in the sim right now, and we're waiting for the sunlight to start to shine through the trees. Let's take a look then at some RaceBot TV replays of things that happened while we were in that RaceBot TV fan immersion, and it's a few of them to go through, so let's start then with one for Luca Becker in the low-grip racing team. Delara LMP2 car coming out of pit lane. Is this going to be an is issue on the pit lane merge? No, he's actually just going to stop. So unfortunately for Luca Becker, who's actually managed to get back up to racing speed, an unfortunate issue there as he came off the pit lane, potentially a hardware failure. Take a look at the 289 Ring Fazette Sim Racing GT3 M. David Kemper sticking to the right-hand side of the track and going very, very slowly. The last car running on the track as it stands. In fact, down on pit lane right now, getting some damage repaired. Then, an incident for Kevin Volk in your race leading number 66 car. What's happened this time through Malmody? The curse continues and... Well, fortunately for the 66 car, not off into the tire barrier. Just about nine seconds was the total time lost. But as a result, that gap now back to the number eight car, chasing them down one minute, 36 seconds. It continues to come down as the number of mistakes continues to rack up for Phoenix Racing Esport Green. So we watch Kevin Volk going through Malmody once again. Let's take a look then for the final time in this third portion of the broadcast at the top eight standings in each class. Let's start once again with GT3 and Weihan. You're standing by with them. Over in the GT3 charge of affairs, Familiar Bomber still leads this field. They have been for most of uh, this stint and they are still up there, up top and kind of undisturbed really because the second place GT3 car is the absolute motorsport ace lift design three laps behind so it is going to be relatively safe at this point Rufus Z Sim Racing G3 Pro is four laps behind they are in third and Team RaceGator.de in fourth German Performance Sim Racing in fifth Simsa Esports GT3 are in sixth position uh, Milner Motorsport Sim Racing Black in seventh and Albrecht Motorsports in eighth. These guys are eight laps behind. So that's the GT3 state of affairs. Lorenzo, run us through the GTEs. So GTE still have uh, Bentley Gods in first place. HM Engineering about a lap down is in P2. Prism Sim Racing Alpha is in P3. Online Sim Racing.de is in fourth. Austrian Sim Races Rot is in fifth. Ringfit uh, Sim Racing GTE is in sixth. Mulna Motorsport Sim Racing Blue is in seventh. And Ronnie on the top eight is stage one Racing Black. So that that's the GTE state of affairs. Another class where the gaps are fairly big, and it's looking like the podium positions might already be settled. Final class then. Let's take a look at. Your overall race leader, the number 66 for Phoenix Racing, eSport Green. We just saw Kevin Volk with a slight mistake through Malmody. Not repeating it once again as he works his way through Slayfleet. Lap number 484 for the race leader. Leads by just over 97 seconds as things stands. But that number 8 machine continues to close on in as the mistakes pile up for the 66 crew. T3 eSports now one lap back from the race leader and about... 1 minute and 51 seconds behind 2nd place as Micah Rang continues to drop from the two cars in front. Once again, the strategy really not working in the favor of the 71 car. A few cars, 3 laps down. WS Racing Esports Magenta having to try and fend off the charging, recovering Simsa Esports LMP2 car. The number 6 with Timu Toika setting some of the fastest laps out on track right now in the Dallara P217 LMP2 car. Then Angry Bull racing the other car three laps down. 
The Fault Mulner Motorsport Sim Racing Pro and Prism Sim Racing Beta are going to round out the top eight runners in your LMP2 category. So 45 minutes left on the clock then. My name is Arjuna Kenkipati, joined by Lorenzo Bonder and Weihan Chan for the second, uh, sorry, third portion in the H&R 24 Hours of Spa presented by Molna Motorsports. 45 minutes to go and we'll hand you over into the hands of David Haynes, Thomas Davis and Hugo Luis to take you all the way till the checkered flag. It is looking like it might be a fairly sedentary affair till the end. All these cars still pounding around the track for the most part. We've got 36 so like 35 cars still out there on track from what I'm seeing on my timing screen. Out of the 40 that took to the green flag. So great to see the vast majority of these cars still out there on track. In true endurance racing style, many of these guys lapsed down. Significant damage. Continue trying to fight for every position they can get. And what are they fighting for, you may ask? Well, prize money in off is in offer for every single one of the classes. 330 euros per class, summing up to just under 1,000 euros in prize money for today's event. 150 euros going to go to the race winners to be split amongst the team and the drivers. Second place will net you 110 euros, while third place will net 70. So 330 euros up for grabs for the podium positions and well, right now, looking fairly set as there are big gaps separating basically all of your contenders as once again, the number 66 gets in another issue with lap traffic. Your race leader is not having an easy affair of this right now. And once again, just sticking in the nose where it doesn't need to be. And these LMP2 cars need to start calming down because I don't know what else is going to get these GT cars till the end in a clean fashion. Same again, and uh, it's that overconfidence that the, he thinks that the Z, the Z4, would be right on the outside part of the lane as he goes. We're seeing it on the replay. They go into the pit path. There is a BMW right ahead of him, and he goes trying to go for that inside part of the lane. That is a 295, I think, 285 from Muna Motorsports in Racing Black was just uh, right ahead of him he thought he would be on the outside but unfortunately he tries to keep it you know like we mentioned predictable goes back for the inside part of the lane into the exit of pit pass heading to stavolo and unfortunately kevin volk was just right over that into that uh, inside part of the mid apex yeah and once again uh, an lmp2 car quite frankly sticking their nose where it does not have any business trying to make the move there just wait one corner come on guys i mean if you're some of these gt cars uh way Han, i mean what can you do other than just getting off the track when an lmp2 Ooh, car comes Volk up behind you trouble again so vault getting in more issues then this time coming through malmody let's take another look then at a race spot tv replay but what is going on in the battle for the race lead good right now it, a one minute 40 second advantage as things stands but Number 66 car taking an increasing amount of risk, this time down into the Lacombe's chicane. And Lorenzo, what were you seeing? No, you're going to look right ahead of him. Uh, he clips that outside part of the grass on the exit of Lacombe as he goes in Malmedy. And uh, he thought the uh, the Audi might have given in that uh, outside, outside inside part of the lane heading to Malmedy. But unfortunately, he just ran way too wide, wide, had to break a little bit, lock the brakes. You can see him locking the front so he can avoid the crash into Malmedy. But fortunately, not going to get involved in a second incident in as many laps there. But the gap now down under 1 minute 40 seconds. Philip Bauer back behind the wheel for Ring Fizette. Sim racing in their LMP2 entry. And, well, work to do, but I mean... The doors are being opened just very slightly as Volk's going to dive down onto the pit lane this time around. I mean, there's no one else you can blame other than yourself in this situation, Weihan. I mean, once again, Gap was at one point larger than a lap, but as a result of mistakes inflicted by themselves, that Gap continues to fall as they're down on pit lane this time around. Well, um, I guess, you know, patience is always a virtue in also in endurance racing when it's all about, you know, uh, 
thinking about the long term instead of uh, what is going to happen immediately. And you know, I I think uh, of course with 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 regards to the racing standards, I think the the stewards do have the final say, and of course they are doing a great job in ensuring that racing standards are up to scratch. Uh, while the, in in the meantime, though, I think it's it's very much you know it's down to sometimes you know, it's it's not down to what other drivers can do for you to let you pass. It's more down to how you should approach uh, passes and how you should facilitate them uh, safely. Well, race stewards are going to be busy, I think. I mean, uh, we've seen some interesting ones. Uh, the HM engineering incident down at the Lacombe chicane with a slow Z4 was one that was interesting. I don't necessarily agree with that decision there, but I can understand very much how race control came to that decision. You'll see number 66 stationary not going for the driver change. Volk's going to stay in the car for another stint. See the pit lane time as things stand, just heading to 90 seconds as the pit stop time heads towards 30 seconds. Going to get up to speed in just a few moments time. You see the steering wheel cocking to the left as Volk gets ready to drop and head down off the lane. Back up to racing speed, not taking tires this time around. Volk back out on track in the race lead. Despite all of these issues, because the number eight car down on pit lane as well this time around. So first and second. Going to be pitting then, 6 hours and 38 minutes still to go. Not sure if there's too many cars doing an alternate strategy here. The one car that's really doing something different to their immediate competitors is the Simsa Esports LMP2 car, which is on a 10-lap run as things stand. There you can see 10 laps on this current stint. They were competing against the WS Racing Esports Magenta car, which has actually just come down to pit lane, has had a... Quick service, uh, filled up the tank. No tires as far as I can tell, but Simsa Esports up into fourth for now. They're two laps off the race leader on their fight back. So Simsa Esports talking about navigating through traffic cleanly after having some early issues and some early difficulties have been on a very strong performance over the last four and a bit hours or so as they climb their way back into podium contention potentially. All it takes is one moment, and we've seen a lot of moments amongst all the different cars. Let's take a look as well, then, at uh, your other leaders, because your GT leaders have had it pretty easy, and we haven't really talked about them too much. So let's talk about them. The 257, Familian Bomber, Michael Busch, currently driving the BMW Z4, and they're good. By currently three laps to the rest of their competitors. And, and Lorenzo, I mean, you talk about dominating drives. I mean, since we've been up here in the booth, the 257 has just done exactly what they need to do. Pound around the track. Avoid, for the most part, getting into contact with others. We, of course, did see their contact with the 66 car coming out of Pujan that spun them both around. But, you know, for the most part, that car looking factory pristine. Could have just rolled off the production lot right now. And... Get ready for another 24-hour race right after this. Yeah, that car looks clean. Even though they actually nudged the wall uh, when they had the contact with the Phoenix Racing Green car. But fortunately for both uh, Michael Basush and Fabio Basush and, and the personnel on the Familian Bomber car uh, for Connor Karnick and also Patrick Hen and Robin Stoll, uh, Robin Stoll, they've been doing really good, you know, Keeping themselves clean, putting a monster pace in comparison to anybody else in the grid. I can't see anyone else besides Simsa who's actually putting the same pace as they are putting regularly in the 220s, 219s. So that car, unless any any drastic thing happens and they lose this three lap, I was gonna say not three laps, they have four laps ahead of the uh, second place car in the in the class. They're probably uh, safe for the win in this category. Yeah, they're so far ahead, in fact, that if I try and show you that comparison between first and second in class, another class of... Uh, another competitor in a different class appears on the graphics. So, number 257 looking good as we wind our way towards the morning hours. We'll also take a look then at your GTE race leader because... Well, since the issues for the 159 in HM Engineering, Andreas Dahlstrom currently driving the Bensley Gods 167. And, and 
Weihan, I mean, this is a car that was looking good even before those issues for HM Engineering. But again, now that they've got that buffer behind them, a full lap to Cooper Murray in the 159 as things stands. It's been a very smooth drive from Dahlstrom and the rest of his team. And six hours, 30 minutes to go. As long as they can hold on to this and stay out of trouble, just like for the 257, the lap times are looking quick enough that it's looking pretty good. It's, again, just about staying out of trouble, and that's easier said than done, as we've seen with some of the lap traffic here. For sure, they have to be mindful of um, LMP2 cars that might creep up on them uh, every now and then. Um, but, yeah, of course, uh, yeah, I think ever, ever since that, um, that um, the, the penalty that the HM engineering guys have faced, it did cede the race lead to the Bentley gods, and they've been kind of holding on, on to it for pretty much ever since then and you know, they're, they're now in quite comfortable state to proceed with the rest of the night but of course right now of course challenges for Andreas would probably be yes in fact there are two LMP2 cars that will approach uh, this Bentley God's car so traffic gonna have to make their way around GTE race leader. They're going to do that safely down into Puhan. At least one of them is. The second one's going to have a nice slingshot through the double left Puhan and carrying a ton of momentum was the car in front, running a little bit wide, getting a 1x potentially there, using all the available track limit that he can find. Dahlstrom very easily letting those two LMP cars through. Makes his life nice and easy. As we work our way towards another half hour complete. Time really starting to tick by once again. As we work our way towards the sunlight. Lorenzo, you said that we get sunlight around 4 or 5 a.m. Well. I was wrong. I I'm glad you admitted and I didn't have to say that. I I'm a humble guy. I know, I know when I'm wrong. I'm, I'm going to admit it when I'm wrong. But if I am right. God help you both. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> let's ask for your educated guess then. It's now pushing what? About <laughs> 5.40 a.m. for these competitors in the virtual Spa Franco Champ. Are we looking at potentially a full hour before we get some sunlight running? I'm just trying to look at the cockpit of one of the cars over here. It's interesting. I would say there is probably one more hour, roughly. I would say either 45 minutes to an hour until we see sunlight coming in into full swing uh, on the track. Yeah. Well, we're riding on board with the 169. A great visor cam kind of view from the left hand side of the helmet using all the revs. You can't see sun poking its way just over the tree line just yet so at least 90 minutes i would think before we get some proper sunlight bathing the track we might get some rays starting to peek in within the next hour or so but for andreas dalsum the night has been very very beneficial as he gets checked up behind mulner motorsports he's gonna send it on the inside what is this lap traffic doing some really aggressive moves as the lights flash from the Mulner Motorsport BMW, I do not understand some of the risks that are being taken by race leading competitors here. We'll take a look at the Race Spot TV replay then. As they go down in towards No Name Corner, we joined the replay just a few moments before though. As they go through Bruce Sells, Weihan again, once again, uh, the risk being taken by a GTE leader that has a full lap advantage here. You see the BMWs turning in and had to get out of the corner to avoid making contact with the GTE leader. Well, uh, there's just no need for this type of moves. Yeah, you nailed you it right there. I think uh, there are plenty of opportunities, especially in the straighter sections. That's where, you know, you, that's where naturally you would allow others to pass. So yeah, you know, patience uh, is very important. I think it serves some drivers well, um, but of course, uh, the, uh, Bentley is kind of now uh, the, the Bentley God's car is kind of now out of that bit of a traffic already and he can't now continue on you know I'm just a, a little bit curious because you know iRacing is has modeled the day and night transitions is there anything you know like moonlight that might provide some nighttime lighting because you know otherwise it, it, it looks completely dark and I just don't think that it will be this dark in real life no that's one thing that uh, certain tracks do better than others is the ambient lighting and 
you know, one example, we talked about the Nordschleifer slightly earlier, and uh, some of these teams are being fans of that track. In the iRacing service, pitch black around all 22 plus kilometers. Uh, but, you know, if you go there for the 24 hours of the Nürburgring any year, except 2020 probably, where fans weren't allowed, I mean, you know, that is one of the most bustling campsites around the track and all 22 kilometers of it indeed. So, uh, ambient lighting sometimes a bit more difficult and that's one thing that iRacing uh, has acknowledged and, and hopefully is working on. Let's take a look though at a RaceBot TV replay. We're watching Timu Toika in the Simsa Esports LMP2 car diving his way through the traffic, but here comes that RaceBot TV replay. What's happened to Pascal Umhofer in the team racegitter.de BMW around the outside of Blanchemont. They tried to go Ooh. side by side with Simsa Esports GT3 and, uh, well, 235 backing up hard into the tire barrier and that is not going to help their charge as they try and close in for that third and final podium position. Yeah, we're looking over here again on the replay as he goes into that inside part, outside part of the lane. Here's the thing, you only make that outside part of the lane workable on Blanchimon if you already have some uh, leeway. But the thing is that Simsa it got in the way, and I think there might have might have been some... Don't say it. Netcode? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, I, said it. I tell you what, let's jump this one slightly further back then. Uh, jump on board with Lewis Goodway in the Simsa Esports GT3 car, because he's at... About two laps down, I think, from yeah. the racegitter.de 235 car. So what happens here? The racegitter car does not get a good run off Stavolo, and that's what initially hurts it. You can see the run from the very damaged 266 as he looks to try and squeeze it to the inside before they even get to Blanchemont. That's a tough one to call. Race control going to have a difficult decision there because... Did? I'm curious, did the race get her, uh, did Pascal actually break check? Yeah, let's watch this in slow motion, because the initial incident, you see the, the squeeze that Simsa apply, oh, Simsa has applied to them, rather, through the first part of the corner, and then I don't, uh, this might be one where, if I'm looking at this from a more impartial perspective, I have to say this is more of a racing incident than a lot of the incidents that we've seen with traffic here. Here you see the first big block from racegitter.de, but coming through Blanchemont here, the momentum from Simsa was such that potentially in the 235, more beneficial to just lay off the pace that Goodway has has also been one of the most impressive on track as well. So Goodway clearly was a faster car at that point, and for Umhofer, all he's managed to do there is rear-end that car into the tire barrier, and that's not what he would have wanted. Now 51 seconds behind third place. It's very, it's a weird incident, you know, because looking from the perspective of a good way, it sounds like there is a brake check of blocking, you know, you're not going to go through, you're not faster, just wait your turn. But a uh, good way is not getting phased anything by it and just goes for the inside part of the lane, and unfortunately, it, it happened that instant, but it's weird. I would class this as a race season, just as you probably classed it, uh, classified it. I don't know, man. It's 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 tricky. It's clearly, some frustration on the part of Simsa as they tried to work their way up past the 235, trying to just close in as much as they could in what has been a very difficult day in multiple classes for the Simsa Esports crew. Take a look quickly, by the way, at your current second place overall, the Ring Fazir number eight. Gap now 90 seconds between first and second. Gap's coming down. Take a look at the Delta, no though. No penalties. On, on track, it's not coming down. And like you say, no penalties yet. Race Control still has the ability to go back and adjudicate things, so we have to wait and see there. But the Delta on track benefits the 66. However, take a look at the pit lane time for each of our. Drivers that start with the number eight. 29.8 seconds the last time around. They came down five laps ago. So, just over 90 seconds total spent in the box. Take a look at your current race leader, the 66, who's making his way down through the Fania chicane in towards campus and now going to start his run up towards Blanchemont and the bus stop chicane. 35 seconds in the box for Vulcan. 
That's just under six seconds in terms of the Delta, and that is helping them. Some, it seems as though on a consistent basis now, the number eight car is doing a little less fuel, trying to underfuel potentially, trying to close the gap and maybe find some track position, but not, not yet paying dividends, I would say. I would say none at uh, none at all. Uh, if we if we if you want to expand this, the tricky thing is that the Bauer actually got some traffic in the previous lap. That's why he made him not get any anywhere closer to what Volk is actually doing because Volk has been trying to stay around the 203 uh, range so he can actually keep him safe from a Bauer and uh, prevent the ring fields uh, LMP2 come closer and closer. But in my opinion, it's a tricky situation because we still might have that punishment looming large for the number 66 car. And there's been a, a, been a crash. Let's go and try and take a look at this. It involves some people that we've seen earlier. And in fact, it involves the current runner second place in the GT3 class. Where is this? This appears to be midway through Bruxelles corner. So all types of drama here in this third portion. Of the 24 hours of Spa presented by H&R and Mulner Motorsports for the Absolute Motorsport 299. A big chunk of time lost. Racebot TV replay then. Let's take a look at what happened through Bruxelles. For the 299, there you can see they've got some traffic coming up behind them. But it doesn't appear as though the traffic is what causes the issue here. Loses the rear end all by itself. And that's... Uh, almost causes a traffic jam as you have to see Whoa. two cars stop there let's take a look on board i think that's the 68 phoenix racing esport yellow the sister car to the current race leader getting stuck as well as 11 9 sim sport i believe that other car that had to slow down and come to a complete stop So this is them approaching uh, the chicane and then into the right hander. So you can probably see from a distance that, alright, this is in the distance, this is now the LMP <clears throat> overtaking that GT car. So, you know, it was pretty much a matter of perhaps the Audi R8 going to the corner with a little too much speed and then locking up. You know, because we, we, we do recall that this R8 is very, very tail happy. And of course, you know, when your fuel burned, when you've got less fuel in your, in your car, it does lead to a looser rear end. And you know, sometimes if, you, if you're not on top of that uh, well enough, uh, you do get into situations like these where you send the rear end of your wheel out wide. Yeah, and I mean, he lost that rear end very early on in the corner. So four, currently running second place, the 299 car back up to racing speed then for Alessandro Vanossi, but he's lost a bit of time. Fortunately though, talk about the gaps here in this GT3 class. He's got a full lap over the third place runner as things stand. The 288, Christopher Janssen for Ring Fizet Sim Racing GT3 Pro. So two podium positions currently on the cards for the Ring Fizet team and uh, hopefully we'll get to see these uh, battles continue to develop the next six hours and 20 minutes of racing action. Getting ready to hand it over to David Haynes, Tom Davis, They'll be in the hands of our producer, Hugo Luis, and as we race into the sunshine, we're still not there yet, if you can believe that. It's, it feels like forever that we've been racing in the night, and indeed, the majority of this race is taking place in the nighttime. Running in the virtual September does mean that nighttime that much longer, and we're about to tick past 6 a.m. No sunlight has started to peek through the tree line just yet. But drivers can see the light on the end edge of the tunnel, pun intended, as uh, another issue and another RaceBot TV replay coming up on your screen right now. This time for the 10th place, Fit4 Racing. Number 99 down into the last corner. Once again, a bit of deja vu. We've seen this a lot recently on RaceBot TV. Cars carrying too much momentum into the bus stop chicane, losing the rear end of the car. Fortunately, not too much time lost there, though, for the number 99, but there has been a change further up in your field for Simsa Esports. Timu Toika out of the car. Ramez Azam 
into the car. And he's now got some work to do to try and chase down WS Racing and Esports Magenta in front of them. Gap now 1 minute and 8 seconds. But Ramez Azam, a lot of experience in the real world, has competed in endurance racing in a number of series and a number of cars as well. But you see they're splitting the traffic confident as he looks to the inside down into the Fanny chicane. He's catching, I do think that's one of the cars in front of him. That's T3 Esports potentially, I think, that he's yeah. catching. So look at the pace that Azam has already managed to build up on his outlap here. Those cold tires coming up to tempered pressure, not proving to be an issue as Azam starts to push the pace. Just under 19 minutes to go before we make the handover. Let's start wrapping up, guys, with some final thoughts. And let's talk about the Simsa car as we watch Azem make his way down through Blanchemont in towards the bus stop chicane. It's been a fantastic fight back from the Simsa crew. The number six car, when we joined the booth, they were a whole four laps down on the race leader, and they continue to try and reel back in the cars out in front. Potential, I think, here, Weihan, for that Simsa crew to potentially get up into fourth. And not only that... But to finish two laps down, which I think would be a very fine accomplishment given where they were earlier on in the race. Yes, absolutely. You know, of course, with uh, after you know the, the drivers have been swapped every now and then, we had Timo Tolika before this, and now Ramis has some extremely experienced driver in real life. We, you know, they, they've just been picking up pace so much, you know, over the last few hours, and you know, they're just kind of. You know, they're not exactly climbing positions, but they are narrowing their time difference and that is also very, very important when you're racing in such a sparse field at this time. So, you know, as, as Ramez tries to call, uh, you know, continue on you know, what, what the team has set out to do to close in on more positions, this is going to be him trying to find, uh, you know, trying to pick up on his pace and you know, as, he, as he gets his tires warmed up, he will find himself in a much better position to build on whatever the team has built up to this point. So Azam behind the wheel, pushing hard now as he tries to get into the race rhythm and tries to continue on from where Toika pushing on before him. Take a look at some other cars then as well. Phoenix Racing number 68 down onto Pit Road from 12th place in their class. So Pit Window for them has started to open up. Let's start wrapping up as well with this fight in GTE. And let's talk a little bit about HM Engineering and what a interesting hour it was for Mark McCormack. Involved in contact with the number 200. Reparix by Artel Motorsport Sim Racing down into the Lacombe chicane. Drive through penalty as a result of that contact. Drop them from the immediate battle for the race lead. And then a subsequent contact with the 68 Phoenix Racing Esport LMP2 car sent them into the tire barriers on the exit of Stavolo. It's kind of put a dent in any hopes of them making it into this fight for the race win. There you can see Cooper Murray 21 laps on this stint as things stand. So... About five laps to go before Murray comes down onto pit road, but the gap to the Bentley Gods in front there, you can see as it just refreshes there. Two minutes and nine seconds. So as soon as HM Engineering down, dive down onto the lane, they'll officially go down a full lap once again. Andreas Dahlstrom has already pitted just three laps ago. So looking good for the Bentley Gods, but Lorenzo, I mean... What can you say about HM Engineering other than what a disastrous 30-minute spell it was for them? And, you know, Mark McCormack, we've seen him in other series here on the iRacing Esports Network. Always a fierce competitor. He won't be too thrilled with how those 30 no. minutes portion of his stint went. Oh, and uh, you can see, I think that's the number 41 car, the Bull Out Racing, getting a little bit uh, frantic with the number 77 of uh, Duden uh, Motorsport Club EV. But, yeah, it's... We, we we talk about uh, we talked about this earlier about the lack of luck for HM Engineering and uh, oh it's a highly competent team you can see them fighting for wins in top threes and top fives usually in competitions they have a very professional team right behind uh, the drivers but always and I mean always something happens to them I think I've seen this more than once I caught I joke I jokingly say call a priest and bless them because they need blessing to actually get a good result 
but unfortunately, again, it has been a very bad string of laps for Mark McCormack, but uh, they're still within the top three. So they're for now getting the 300 uh, euro prize pool for them. But of course, they want the win and they wanted to battle it out for the win. Of course, anything can happen the next six hours. But for now, just the worst possible scenario for the HM engineering group. And while sim racing is a global esport, a lot of our competitors are based in Europe. There you see the drivers for HM engineering. The one odd man out there, Jack Boyd, racing from Australia, had to suffer with the physical distance between uh, his location and the server location. But more interestingly, as we start to reach 6 a.m. in the session, it is also reaching 6 a.m. in Europe for many of these competitors. So. They've driven through the night, not just virtually, but physically as well. Yes, there are some other drivers in uh, other countries, but for the most part, a very European-based entry list, Weihan. And, you know, we talked about fatigue being a thing. I have a feeling, actually, that as the sun starts to shine, it's going to be even more of a factor now, given that when you think about for a lot of these drivers who we've been seeing for the last six hours... Uh, they potentially have a few more hours to go as HM Engineering involved in another incident down into the bus stop chicane. They're going to lose a whole heap more time now as Cooper Murray has to find his way back onto the track. But another disastrous move for HM Engineering. We'll take a look at the race bot TV replay, but another mistake being made there for HM Engineering. And unfortunately, that is going to start putting them in danger of losing third place. You'll see, still serving that slowdown penalty is... Cooper Murray in the 159, but here comes the RaceBot TV replay. Let's see exactly what happened down into the bus stop chicane. It's the Mulner Motorsport BMW in front, by the way. That's the car that the contact was made. Indecision on both parts about which side of the track that lap traffic was going to go to. And as a result, door-to-door -door contact forcing that Corvette deep into the braking zone. So, so that was exactly how the incident unfolded and, you know, it what happened afterwards was it did set uh, the HM engineering car back a couple of seconds um, as well as uh, the BMW set for as well. So I think some uh, superficial damage sustained by both cars. But then again, you know, it's more down to the fact that, you know, you, you can't wait for the next corner because it is a straight that comes up right after. So this is a replay from a cockpit view. So you can see Cooper Murray trying to go along the inside. He tried to kick along the outside and then go along the inside. The BMW thought that probably thought that the Corvette would go along the outside but that did not happen and you know as a result because of you know everything happened so quickly you know you the, the drivers could not respond in time and both of them committed to the same left side and that led to the incident yeah we, we have the luxury of being able to slow this one down and analyze it in excruciating detail no such luxury at racing speed but Cooper Murray Unfortunately, they're trying to try and find his way around lap traffic. Loses a more time in the HM Engineering 159. Kind of sums up as we're wrapping up here and about to hand over into the fourth and final portion of the broadcast. The race for HM Engineering. Like we've been saying, by the way, guys, in about 10 minutes time, we'll be handing you over to David Haynes, Tom Davis for the last six hours of the race. We'll be switching from this YouTube stream to the Part 4 YouTube stream, so don't go anywhere. Coverage is going to continue. Uninterrupted coverage provided by RaceBot TV of this h and 24 Hours of Spa powered by Mulner Motorsport. Let's take a look then at some more replays and not exactly sure what we're about to witness, but something has happened to uh, one of the GTE competitors. Here you'll see through the Lacombe chicane for Stage 1 Racing Black and Heading up towards Malmody, I already know what's about to happen, and indeed, the rear end goes around the Lorenzo Deja Vu. Number five. I like that you're keeping count. <laughs> we'll take one more look at an aerial look at this one. Carl doesn't get too far onto the right-hand side. We've seen some cars lose it there, but the, the weight of direction, unfortunately, uh, forces that car to just be a bit imbalanced there on the transition and as a result number 179 goes around lorenzo you have an in a opinion rather about that incident we just watched with cooper murray and the hm engineering car you you think 
that potentially it was Cooper's responsibility there, trying to force potentially a move as you see the 169 coming up to lap the 159 out on track. It's it's an interesting thing. Uh, my perspective, I saw this back and forth about maybe several times already. Uh, I would say at least six times. Uh, the blinking of the lights made the Z4 go into that inside part of the kink and then set himself up into the turn. The thing is, as soon as the headlights got blinked and uh, the Z4 came to that inside part of the lane, the Corvette just went into the same part of the same part of the lane as well. So both were inside part of the lane. Then that what made the Z4 got confused, get confused, and and at the same time he actually went to the at outside part. So that's what caused the confusion between both of them. Like the Corvette misled the information, uh, misinformed the Z4 of where he wanted to go. Thus caused the crash. Luckily for Cooper, he had fast reactions and avoided the wall. But, you know, it's my opinion. <laughs> well, that's what you, you get paid right. for. You get paid for your opinion, Lorenzo. So it's good that you get to see it. We'll take one more look at this replay. Wei, Wei Han, we'll get your opinion on it once more as well. There you can see the tail end of it. But uh, an interesting one. And I, I know Race Control is going to have to take a look at this one once that protest gets submitted by one of these teams. Yeah, so certainly race control has the final say in this, but we, you know, with regards to opinion, I think uh, both of them should have seen this coming, or rather the Corvette should have seen this coming. I think on the Corvette's part, it would help if, you know, just back off the throttle maybe 100 meters earlier and the straight would be yours to make your passing maneuver. Um, so, you know, that that is that. And I, I think, you know, with six hours to go, of course, it, it does get a little tight. Time does seem to get a little tighter at this time. So that that kind of did mo that that could have motivated the drivers to be a little bit more hasty in uh, making their overtaking maneuvers. But you know, uh, have I think you know it, it it helps to be a little bit more patient once again. Patience, the name of the game, and six hours still to go. So lots of patience still needed for many of these cars. There has been. Another penalty, by the way, this time for the Simsa Esports 266. Lorenzo, what is this one for? As Lorenzo goes silent and quickly tries to figure oh, out what okay, happened. Okay, here we go. I'm back, I'm back. I think we know this, what happened. Uh, if we saw that correctly, that was the, uh, the incident at uh, Blanchimon. With the team race getter, uh, where he tried to force the move and made the race getter car uh, hit the tire barrier on the outside. Ah, uh, okay. I was I was wanting to make sure there because we've seen that Simsa GT3 involved in a few incidents. You also think about the incident down in Bruxelles that impacted the race for German performance sim racing, the 291 Audi. RA LMS. As we watch HM Engineering finally diving down onto the pit lane, Cooper Murray. Going to take the car down at 60 kilometers an hour. We'll see if he stays in the car, but HM Engineering... And Arjuna? Go ahead, yes. He, by the way, that car actually grazed the wall. He hit the wall at the entry. Oh, let's go and take a look at this. You know how I love watching these cars as they dive their way down onto the very tricky pit entry at Spa Franco Champ. So here you go. This is the tail end of this. And Lorenzo, you're saying he hit the wall slightly earlier. Slightly earlier, you're gonna see him going to that inside part of the lane. There he goes. The car kind of oh. gets locked up under braking. Yeah, he hits not hard. Luckily for him, it's not a hard hit, but it, that is a slight graze into the wall. Take a look at that replay. That gives you a better angle of the front bodywork as it crumples up just a little bit more. Seems like HM Engineering has been through the wars if you look at that car, and indeed, yes, they have. Cooper Murray, by the way, down on pit lane, getting that service done. Not going to hand over the car just yet, it seems like. We'll see what happens. Let's start running through, then, a few more stories before we give you one final top eight rundown before we hand you over. Gap out front. Take a look at the number eight. Gap is officially under 90 seconds, and I have to wonder... Is the pressure on for Kevin Volk and the 66 team? 
The mistakes have added up. The time lost has added up. And now, Gap continues to shrink as Philip Bauer in the number eight continues to work on setting some very consistent pace. Last time around, Delta was about 1.3 seconds that Bauer managed to cut out of Volk's time. They are going through some traffic, which is obviously ebbing and flowing and influencing the battle. But I mean, Weihan, again, talk about risk versus reward. The 66 car has been erring on the, on the riskier side of things. And I think at this point in time, it's starting to become an issue where they can't afford to get involved in too many more of these incidents to preserve this race lead. Yes, it's dropped to 1 minute 26, which is, well, look, more than 20 seconds from where we, from just a couple of moments earlier, like I think two hours ago. And, you know, if, if this kind of, if, if this rate continues, we could see both P1 and P2 coming together within, not only within the same lap, but within the tacking distance of each other. And that will drastically change, you know, the, the, the safe position that Phoenix Racing Esports Green has at the moment. And, you know, I, I, I think, uh, Again, I think it, w because it's endurance racing, naturally you should go uh, towards the side of reward. That is to go a little bit more conservative and you know, kind of wait out every now and then whenever the whenever you have the opportunity. Uh, you know, it just kind of makes things uh, a bit more manageable for everyone. So, three minutes to go until the top of the hour. We'll post a link to the stint number four where uninterrupted coverage will continue here of the 24 hours of Spa presented by H&R and Mulner Motorsport. Before we go, we're going to run down through the top eight standings once more. But once before we do that, one more RaceBot TV replay in this third portion of the broadcast to show you down in towards Bruxelles and Durenner Motorsports Club getting that very wrong, sending it deep. And Niels Badov has to back it up and get things sorted. Lost track of the braking zone hard into the wall, and that's not going to help the number 77's effort. But let's take a look then at the top eight standings in each of your class. Out front, Phoenix Racing Esport Green, the number 66, leads by just under 90 seconds, but is coming under pressure from the number eight behind. T3 Esports, number 71, is one lap behind. They've fallen back through the last six hours much closer to the number eight when we first joined the booth. WS Racing Esports Magenta, they're three laps down along with Simsa Esports LMP2 and Angry Bull Racing. Number 10, final cars in this class in the top eight. Mulner Motorsport, the number 21. And Prism Sim Racing, the number 23. Take a look then at GTE. For the Bendley Gods, the 169, a one lap buffer to HM Engineering and the 159 who have suffered the last few hours with some torrid luck. Online sim racing .de, the 152 embroiled in a battle with Prism Sim Racing Alpha for the third and final podium position. Austrian Sim Racing's rot. They're going to be in fifth with the Rings Fizet Sim Racing GTE in sixth. Mulder Motorsport, the 123 in seventh with Stage 1 Racing Black in eighth position. Last but not least, you see their current GT3 leader down on pit lane getting service. The Familian Bomber team has had it easy. Having a weekend stroll, a uh, weekend drive for the most part through the Belgian countryside. The 257 leads by two laps from Absolute Motorsport 299 with Ring Fizet Sim Racing GT3 three laps back with Team Race Gitter 235 also three laps down. Germans Performance Sim Racing, we talked about their big crash through Bruxelles. The 291 is four laps down. Simsa Esports GT3, they're six laps down. In seventh and eighth, both seven laps from the class leader. Mulder Motorsport, Sim Racing Black, and all Brecht Motorsports. So this is going to wrap it up then for this third portion of the coverage of the H&R 24 Hours of Spa by Mulner Motorsport. Don't go anywhere though, our uninterrupted coverage continues with part number four, David Haynes, Tom Davis, going to take you home. But for now, it's time to say goodbye. My name is Arjuna Kenkipati. I've been joined by the wonderful Lorenzo Bonda and the equally wonderful Wei Han Chan. As always, TV cameras provided to us by Istvan Ballo 
and track cams 22, Tyler Maxson providing additional car cameras. Reminder, live timing and scoring is available on racebot.tv slash endurance, but head on over to part number four, the last six hours of racing action from the circuit Spa-Francorchamps. Thank you for tuning in, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend.